Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Thank you for joining us today. And just a reminder, season three of the podcast is taking place during social distancing. So you might notice some changes in audio. Today, our guest is Dr. Kyle Donnelly, staff veterinarian at Brevard Zoo. Hey, Dr. Donnelly, how are you? Hi, Alex. Um, we're really excited to have you on the podcast today because so many pre-vet students want to be a zoo veterinarian. They want to work with these cool animals. So I'm excited that you can talk to us about your journey. Uh, will you tell us, you know, where did you go to undergrad? What was your major? Sure. It's great to be here. Um, I am a gator pretty much through and through. I w did my undergrad at UF and I stayed on to do my vet school at UF. I did briefly leave for a couple of years to go to the Animal Medical Center in New York City to do my internships. The first one was a small animal rotating internship, which is basically rotating through all the different specialties within small animal, uh, as well as spending a good chunk of time on emergency medicine. And then I stayed on an additional year to work with the exotic pets there. So mostly um, parrots, small pocket pets, plenty of reptiles. Um, and then after those two years were over, I came back to UF for a third time to do my zoo residency, which is a three-year program that works in the College of Vet Med, um, several small zoos in the state, and the final year at White Oak Conservation. Yeah, I, I always wanted to work in conservation and my initial thought going into college was that I wanted to do the PhD route, go more into like field work and really research driven work. Um, so my goal was to get involved in a lab early on in college and then eventually make my way into a PhD program. Um, and so the lab that I found um, a really good fit in was actually within the vet school working with Dr. Iska Larkin in the aquatic animal health department. And um, she put me out on a kayak in the middle of Crystal River and I did a lot of field work with manatees there and a lot of um, lab work within the vet school itself. And I had a great time. I really loved the, my, my time there and I could, you know, that was definitely a career option. But being in the vet school surrounded by a lot of these um, wildlife and aquatic and zoo veterinarians who were doing like a much broader scope than what I was doing was really um, that that was probably what's kind of switched me over to more of the vet med role than um, more of like a research driven one question focused role. So you mentioned conservation and I get students in my office every day who are like, I want to do wildlife conservation. And I yes. don't know that they know what that means, especially related to veterinary medicine. So can you break down how a veterinarian could play a role in wildlife conservation and, and maybe your take on what you think they think they want to do? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's another good one. So it, conservation medicine, I feel like is one of those keywords that sounds a lot cooler and is like kind of this like vague idea of like being out in the savannah doing something really awesome which is yeah. it, there's a there's a, a like kind of a looser definition of what that could be and that could be anything from just being a zoo vet and helping the animals in a zoo thrive and have great wellness and then you can extrapolate that into you know you're teaching the public about these endangered species and you're making them happy and healthy um but then there can be more kind of like niche definitions of that as well. So for instance, like some of the fun things that I get to do at my job is be part of um, the care of animals who are being studied for conservation efforts. So we have, for instance, like a Perdido Key, Perdido Key Beach Mice conservation program at the zoo. And there's a few around the state. And so we breed these uh, mice. They're an endangered mice that are really critical to sand dune health on the beaches. And so part of my job is making sure that they're healthy, um, taking genetic samples so that we can continue to learn about them, and then learning as much as we can during their entire life history. Um, we also are heavily involved in the scrub jays in the area. So sometimes I get to go out and collect blood for the, concert, the biologists who are studying them. 
Um, and then we have a sea turtle hospital, so I get to do lots of day-to-day -day care of the sea turtles at the zoo as well. So that could be one aspect. So if you're in an area locally where there are populations of animals that um, are being heavily studied or need some sort of health care, then a zoo vet could be involved in that sense. And then, of course, there's a lot of bigger uh, organizations and local on the ground um, organizations who actually go to other places to do their research and help out in a veterinary capacity there. Um, I think it's important not to focus only on like the like the fun field work aspect of things where you fly in a plane, you get dropped in some exotic jungle, you collect field samples and then you leave. Um, I think we, what we should be doing and really striving for in the zoo community is getting away from some of that colonial medicine idea and actually like working and building better relationships with the infrastructure of the people who live there and building those partnerships like transcontinentally instead of just like popping in doing fun stuff and leaving. Wow, I I love that you just said um, like colonization and colonization <laughs> and that's deep. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on what that means? Yeah, so I think um, this is kind of getting away a little bit of how to be a zoo vet, but it's important to know like if you're going into this thinking like I want to be a conservation vet and I want to go fun places and do fun things and then go back to my suburban house in, you know, somewhere in Florida, then um, it kind of gets away from the idea that we are an entire globe of people who all are working for the same thing, but we need to keep the a lot of the power and the decision making on the stakeholders of the people who live in these areas. So indigenous peoples are making like they are, they are in charge of the stewardship of like 35% of the world's coastline, which is one of like a heavy area that people study is on the coastlines of places. And if we keep the power with those people, then they're going to be the best stewards of that place because they live there, they've grown up there. And because of our colonial past and our people's ability to just pop in and out of places because of the way that the power has been um, ununiformly distributed, then you can go into a place and you can kind of take advantage of the science behind it and then take it back without really helping out the people who live there every day and who are actually in charge of those animals. Wow. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> that is, I, so I, I hear you that like this could be off topic, but I think it's very important. The message that students you take home right now is you have a responsibility as a veterinarian and as a professional to do your research and know that whatever you do has a consequence. And mm -hmm. while some things maybe sound really good, like I'm going to go on this plane and get dropped into the Serengeti and help these animals. Yes. But if you're not actively involved in that community, one, mm -hmm. the things that you're doing and putting into practice there might fall away the second you leave. Yes. Two, you might disrupt tradition or you might disrupt like a power balance that's there. So yeah. anything that's, that we do, we should think it through a few steps and see um, how, our, how our behavior can affect not only the animals, but the people that live there. Exactly. You really have to go back to the people and make sure they're being taken care of because they're the biggest resource in that area as well. And I think even to put it even into more current times within the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. a lot of long-term like longitudinal data of wildlife populations who have been monitored for years and years, there's going to be a big gap in some of these researchers who can't get to these isolated field areas because oh. there's not, they're not there to, to collect the data. And so it's taken a pandemic, I think, in some cases to realize that a lot of these labs and PIs should have been maybe training on the ground people who live there this whole time and yeah. put the power and investment back into those communities and then their data would be secure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot that we could learn, can learn yeah. from the pandemic. And um, I mean, I feel like what we're talking about is conservation. Like yeah. we are talking about making steps to make sure that whatever you do as a veterinarian, whether it's in your practice or abroad, can be long term and can be sustained. Mm -hmm. So you got to think about those things. And I love the idea of not focusing just on the quote unquote fun stuff. Yes. Thinking about how can that fun stuff really help the population that you're looking at? Let's talk about your job. Yeah. What does your job look like on the day to day? So tell me about the zoo. Okay, so the Brevard Zoo is a probably a medium sized zoo if you look at 
at the scale of all the zoos across America. Um, so we have a big collection of birds, we have some fish and some rays, a variety of hoofstock, rhino, zebra, um, a whole kangaroo mob, and a, a lot of diversity um, for, for people to come in and really get a fun immersive experience. So you can kayak around the zoo, you can walk in amongst all of our kangaroos, you can feed the lorries. Um, and so my job is taking care of those animals. It's mostly um, we strive to work more towards preventative health. So keeping the animals as healthy as we can and try to avoid as many issues. Um, but because we care for these animals for the duration of their lives, you know, you have the, the normal um, kind of lifespan of an animal as they get older, we, we're dealing with end of life care and things like that. Um, we also have a busy sea turtle hospital right on grounds at the zoo. So I divide my time between the zoo animals and the sea turtles. Um, we have sea turtles that come in year round um, and a dedicated sea turtle staff to help care for them on a day to day basis. So my kind of my typical day would be getting to work in the morning. We go through our um, procedures. We try to get through all of our procedures in the morning and that's for a few different reasons. One is a lot of zoo animals need to be fully anesthetized to do a safe exam on them. And so if we're gonna do a big procedure where it involves immobilizing and anesthetizing an animal, we wanna have as much of the rest of the day there to just make sure that they recover okay and they're doing fine and we can go home and sleep well that night. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, littler things that don't require anesthesia we'll do later on in the day. So if we can get a blood draw with just um, manually restraining an animal, or we can do a vaccine under voluntary restraint, which means the animal is trained to accept injections or some sort of like non-invasive medical procedure, we can do that later on in the day. Um, I'll walk around and do visual rechecks on things of, of issues that I've been managing for a while. Um, and then, of course, the, the part that nobody likes to talk about is writing a lot of medical records at the end of the day every day. Um, so that's kind of a typical day for us. How many veterinarians are on staff? Um, we have two full-time vets and a veterinary intern. So there's three um, certified vets there. And um, the intern is there for two years. So, and they've already gone, typically gone through a small animal internship. So they're a fully competent vet, but they're just there to learn even more. Um, so yeah, so there's, so some kind of sums it up to three vets. Okay. And so you said that your particular zoo has zoo animals and aquatics, right? So we have sea turtle. Mm -hmm. um, tell is that that's normal right I think Dr. Alexander told me that too that like a lot of zoo vets are trained in like all of these animals yeah what, yes like, how how can you know how to work with a rhino and a sea turtle like, about that yeah I mean well the thing is it's kind of like a, li a little bit is like the the saying jack of all trades expert in none but we are we are trained to learn as much as we can about all these different animals and the the big part of it is that so much of it is translational so when you're going through vet school and you're learning as much as you can in the main species that they teach you in vet school you then use those skills and that knowledge base to apply it in an internship setting which is typically also small or large animal medicine with one of the traditional species. And that's where you can learn as much as you possibly can inside and out of those animals and practice the highest quality of medicine possible. And once you internalize all of that, you can really start to use the lessons that you have there and apply it to all these crazy zoo animals that you thought you might ne never have seen before. Um, and the truth is, there is still a lot we don't know. In fact, most of us don't know that much about anything. And it sounds kind of crazy because there's all these textbooks that you have to stuff into your brain. You sit through hundreds of hours of lectures and you read the best and most upcoming research that's published every month. But we still don't know a lot about a lot. And we, tr we basically use the lessons that we can from species that are most similarly related to those animals um, and, and do the best medicine based on what, we're, what we've learned already. Now I get a lot, so you, you said that we don't know a lot about it. I hear that a lot from like zoo vets. They're like, we don't know, we're figuring it out. Yeah. Um, and then, so like you went to vet school at UF, we don't have a ton of classes on exotics. Like we no. really have a very small number. And 
I think a lot of students come to UF because they know we have a Zoom Ed team and they, but they want to learn more. What would you tell a student who wants to go into Zoom Ed, who goes to UF or not, but they're not getting all that classroom experience? What do we tell those students? Yeah, there, so a lot of it has to be on you as the student to go out and find those experiences because you're absolutely right. There's not a huge chunk of vet school dedicated to zoo and exotic animals. Once you get past all of your first and your second year where you're learning all the basics of anatomy and physiology, you kind of hit the clinic floor. You may or may not get a zoo med rotation first time out. And then you go back at UF. It's a little bit different. You go back to the classroom after clinics. And then you have some advanced courses in zoo animals, but it's really going to be like one class in avian medicine or one class in rodents. And that is it's kind of the same theme where a lot of the lessons, even within those lectures, are built upon knowing the ins and outs of nutrition and every other species that we know a lot. And then you can apply it to the weird digestive tract of whatever weird species of bird you're looking at. But then from there, it's really a lot of digging on your own time. So getting the, the experience in a clinic setting, whether that be a zoo or an exotic pet practice, the, just the pattern recognition of handling all those animals over and over again and seeing common diseases and then going into the literature and learning more about them on what is being published is how you really get a grip on it. Yeah. Okay. That sounds... I, I feel like the benefit of that is every student can kind of take ownership of their education. You can get the experience that you want. And it's kind of, it relates to Zoom Ed because it will be a unique experience and these are unique animals. So I think that's helpful for students to know when they're picking a vet school, as long as you get that DVM degree, you can still pursue what you want. It's not, it doesn't necessarily matter where you get the DVM degree. Correct. Because you mold your education. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of students come into my office and they're like, I only want to work on dolphins or I only want to work on elephants. Yeah. Let's talk about that. What are your <laughs> So I would say that there's probably one job I can think of where the vet is only working on elephants in the world. <laughs> right. It's right. It's very specific. Yes. So I would say that is probably not a realistic career goal. Mm -hmm. And I would also advise those students to really think about why they're getting into the career mm -hmm. of, e of either medicine or with that specific species. Because if your heart is set on working only with elephants, then veterinary medicine may not be the best way to do that. Um, there are other careers in which you can work only with elephants, and that may be like in a zoo setting, it could be in a research setting, but veterinary medicine, you're probably not ever going to be seeing just one species. Um, and part of that is just the nature of the jobs that are available, some things that are kind of like out of our hands as veterinarians, because we, you know, this is still a profession, so there is money exchanging hands. We have to do this for a living. And the nature of what jobs are out there is typically relating to zoos. Um, some research settings, like lab animal settings, can have some interesting species that people might be interested in. Um, some of the field work type things are not even usually it, the only part of a zoo veterinarian's career, but there just aren't really jobs out there for one species at a time. So um, some people might be not excited about that, but I think it's really exciting to be able to have so much diversity on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, exactly. And I always think about Dr. Larkin, you know, who you were in her lab, and I feel like she's queen of the manatees, but she did a PhD. So Correct. Yeah. So able to focus on one animal and, study yes. and get to know them. So if that really does end up being someone's lifelong goal, then maybe approach the PhD program where you can be very specific. What are your thoughts on Tiger King? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Tiger King was, I mean, I... I really enjoy the memes associated with Tiger Me. Sure, yes. <laughs> but um, I think it raised a lot of problematic issues in the world of exotic pet trade. Mm -hmm. um, and it was probably more leaning towards the entertainment side of things than um, really blowing the lid off of exotic pet trade. Yeah. Um, so I kind of just take it as face value for what it was trying to accomplish, which was 
uniting the world in COVID world against Carol Baskin and all of the <laughs> the craziness around that. Right. We needed it. We needed it. At this time. <laughs> That's right. Something to joke about. But yeah. you know, it is a serious problem for a lot of those big cats and um there, there is work, good work being done by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums to try to limit those types of roadside attractions and really kind of uh, put on a put to a higher standard what zoos and aquariums should be, yes. and really promoting the idea that um, people and institutions within the AZA are what we should be striving for. Sure, perfect. Um, is your job dangerous? Can uh, it be dangerous? I mean, I think any job within veterinary medicine can be dangerous. I think that there is a strong argument to be made that we are working with the most dangerous animals, and yet we probably are one of the more safer professions in that we have to anesthetize all these animals to work with them. Sure. So instead of just kind of like powering through an aggressive dog exam, yeah. we don't even start, we don't even do that ever. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, most of our animals are totally anesthetized. Um, there's always, you know, small risks associated with the induction and the waking up process. But I would say, all things considered, we you could probably make a strong argument that we're even safer than large animal medicine and, and shelter medicine and some of the things. Yeah. There. <laughs> wow, I think that is a great, um, like, mindset to adopt for everybody what might you know don't judge a book by its cover you know these yeah. folks are working with yeah dangerous animals but they're not walking right up to them and trimming their their hooves you know right they're, they're gonna put them under anesthesia and it can end up being safer and yeah like a general practitioner might end up coming home with a lot more wounds than you guys do that's exactly right that's interesting <laughs> okay now i Let's talk about job outlook and how competitive the field is. And I'll quote Dr. Alexander, who was on season one, and we talked about Zoom Med. Um, she didn't say this on the podcast, but she said it to my undergrad class. She had the whole class. She asked them, how much do you think a vet gets paid to like go out into the wild and work with elephants who are just like out in the wild? And so students were throwing out random numbers and she ends up saying zero, because that's not a real job. <laughs> um, and she was basically saying that like folks might do that as like a passion profession and they might go do some volunteer work, but in general, like those wild animals aren't owned by anybody. They're owned by the wild. So who's going to pay the veterinarian to go out and do that? So talk yes. to me about the competitiveness and the niche quality that is ZooMed. Yeah. So there, as a person who is trying to get into ZooMed, you are not in a position of power. And that is for a couple of reasons. One is that there are way more people interested in being a zoo vet than there are zoo vet jobs. And so what that does to you as a candidate for that position is it makes it really difficult to even get in the door. And then once you're in, you don't have a lot of power in your salary because there's so many people who will take that job right behind you if you don't. Yeah. So what ends up happening is either you don't get into the field or you do and zoo vets are paid on average less or the same as a starting graduate. So somebody who hasn't done an internship walks out after the day after graduation and works at a general practice, you get about the same as a board certified zoo vet. Right. So uh, some of that has to do with the fact that most zoos are nonprofit and there's just not a lot of money to be had there. But I think a lot of it too comes down to just being in that poor position of power when it comes to what's out there and what's available to you. So sort of like what you're saying with Dr. Alexander, this is really a career for passion. And so you can make a living wage, but it is nowhere near what is what your colleagues will be will be making. So um, yeah, it's very, it's very tough to get into, especially with there not just not being very many positions available. So then tell the students who are dying to be a zoo vet, like this is all they want. Like how, how did you get here? Like what made you different? What's the secret sauce that they need to know? Or is it just all the stars have to align? Like what can they do to make them competitive? Yeah, so there, I would say to, there's not a cookie cutter way to get into ZooMed. And I think that's unique in ZooMed compared to a lot of the other specialties. Like, for instance, if you want to be a surgeon, you need to do a small animal rotating internship, you basically need to do a surgery internship. 
and sometimes two, and then you can do a residency and be a surgeon. You, you basically have to do that formula to be a surgeon or any of the other ones. ZooMed is not that way. We, you don't need to be a board certified zoo vet to practice zoo medicine. So if you are lucky enough to be in an area where there is a zoo that needs an extra set of hands, then you can do both small animal and zoo med, or you can just get involved maybe directly after an internship and never go the board certified direction. And you can still practice high quality medicine that way. Um, and then as far as internships go, you don't necessarily need to follow that rule either. So I did what's considered probably more of a traditional route where I did the internships and then that led into a residency and which led into um, getting my board certification and starting a zoo job. Um, and that is probably the most direct and straightforward way, but there are little things that can lead you off of that path for various reasons. Let's say you don't match for an internship or um, your residency applications don't pan out, again, just because there are so few of them available on a year-to-year -year basis. You don't have to give up if that doesn't happen. And if you want to practice in that field, there are ways to get involved. Even if it's not a full-time zoo position, you can maybe reach out to your local zoo and see if there's any research projects you can help with or even come in on a volunteer basis or like an on-call basis some zoos will do that so there's definitely ways to get involved once you're past that area I would say to make yourself the absolute strongest candidate you can be in vet school and after um, I would I would advise you to do as well as you can in school a lot of it does come down to if you're looking through a pile of residency applications you're gonna want the ones who stand out a little bit more. So do well in school. That's kind of a very basic <laughs> recommendation. Um, and then make yourself as well-rounded as you can. And so a lot of the fun thing, going back to like staying away from things that are just superficially very fun, is that getting experience at a big zoo or an aquarium as an extern in vet school is super fun. But it's kind of like the icing on the cake. Like, yes, you want that and it's going to be really fun, but that's not necessarily what's going to make you stand apart once you're putting in those residency applications. So what will make you above and beyond is if you have your own research project, if you publish your own research project, that's like chef's kiss stuff. You want that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and then while you're at rotating through those different type institutions, building relationships with the veterinarians there will help you down the road. It's a very small community. You want strong letters of recommendation for your residency application. So, um, you know, just building relationships within the field, getting involved in research, doing well in vet school. Um, those are those are good. And of course, going to the conferences also helps meet people within the field, build relationships, network, that'll open doors to other rotating positions you could do. Um, so yeah. Yeah, awesome. I like that what students should be doing to prepare to get into vet school is similar to what you should be doing to prepare to become you know, a zoo, like get that residency if that's what you want. So the research, the extracurricular activities, the leadership, the great grades, all those things, like it's not stopping guys. So stick with this plan. Yeah. What resources, what are your top resources that you would say, you know, first day zoo med vet, they need to have this. In um, so I would say starting out with some core textbooks is a good it's kind of like the Wikipedia of that specific taxonomy would be um, the Fowler series. So okay. um, F-O-W-L-E-R? Yes. So there are, we're up to the ninth edition of that book. Um, the eighth edition is the one that goes through each taxa by chapter. So, you know, it starts at fish and it goes to, actually it doesn't have fish in that book, but it has, it has most of the terrestrial, like more traditional zoo taxonomy. And then, um, then there's special topics in the ones that come after that. So that's a nice um, intro to a lot of zoo medicine. Um, I would also highly recommend having journal access because that's where the most up-to-date and current research is going to be published on either a quarterly or sometimes a monthly basis. 
So things like the Journal of Zoo and Wildlife Medicine, um, JAFMA, the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, um, uh, the Journal of Avian Medicine and Surgery. Those are just a few of the main ones that we read on a regular basis. You know, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a couple lightning round questions. Ooh. So we're going to do lightning round and we'll do okay. this repeatedly. What comes to mind when I say coolest animal you've ever worked with? Penguin. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why were they the coolest? Well, they're kind of just like the holy grail of wild animals. Yeah. They're, they're so absurd on face value and they're also have all this mystique about them because they're the most highly trafficked animal in the world and they're you know, under heavy threat from traditional medicine uses and all kinds of illegal hunting practices so um yeah and they're just like a crazy awesome animal yeah good answer uh animal that you're like i hate working with this animal Oh, God. I mean, probably our petting zoo goats don't tell the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and why don't we love the goats? Well, they're just very needy. <laughs> yeah, okay. I feel like the thing is that domestic animals don't have that wildlife um, urge to live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're so, a genetic piece. Yeah. Like rabbits when I was in private practice were also a huge pain for me. <laughs> They're, they just don't want to live. They have a death wish, do they? Yes. Dream animal that you haven't worked with yet, but you're dying to work with. Oh, um, I really wanted to work with tapers and then I got this job. So that was awesome. Um, and I got to work with the manta rays like a little bit as a vet student at the Georgia Aquarium, but it would be awesome to do manta ray medicine more intensively. If you were a ZooMed animal, who are you and why? Mm, I am a bowhead whale because they, they are just like a crazy animal that lives under the ice in the North Pole. Not that I necessarily identify with being cold, but people thought that there was like two of them left. And then all the people who actually live in the North Pole were like, no, dude, there's like a million of them. And they just live under the ice. And when they need to take a breath of air, they just smash their giant head through the ice and then take a breath and then exist on. And they just do their own thing. And nobody even knows that they're, that they're there. Oh, I've never even heard of them. Finally, if you could describe your job slash career in one word, it is chaos <laughs> and why is it chaos uh it's just different all the time um no i i've very rarely gotten into a, a routine where i feel like okay this is just how it is now and then something happens to totally change that um but for the most part it's organized chaos and i like that um i don't like getting into a routine but yeah things always are changing in zoom in oh it sounds fun I always like to ask guests, what advice do you have for pre-vet students who are trying to get into vet school? What's your biggest piece of advice for them? I would say stay open-minded. Don't pigeonhole yourself into saying zoom ed or bust because there's so much more. You, you have to really be the best doctor possible. And to do that, it's to be good at all animals. And the most animals that we know about are the ones that you learn about in vet school. So be a veterinarian for the love of medicine and science and not for the thrill of working with crazy animals um, and do it for them because that's how you're gonna be the best for them. Wow, great advice, Dr. Donnelly. Thanks so much for being on the podcast today. We loved hearing about the organized chaos of ZooMed and knowing <laughs> that it's possible, that students really can get involved with these animals. It just might not look like the path that they thought it was going to. Exactly. If you if you want to do it, there's a way to do it. Awesome. I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Prevet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school.
Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. A reminder to our audience that season three is recorded while social distancing out of the studio, so the audio may sound a little different. Today's guest is Dr. Heather Walden, who's an assistant professor in parasitology at the USCVM. Dr. Walden, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Alex. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to have you because I feel like you can talk to our students about a lot of different things without a DVM degree because you don't have a DVM, you have a PhD, correct? Correct. I have a, a bachelor's in science, a master's in science, and a PhD. And that, but you still work at the vet school. You're in my building. You work with vet students. I assume you work with veterinarians. So I think it's great that students can find out you don't have to have a DVM to work in the veterinary field. Absolutely. And, um, you know, actually my PhD, I was trained um, at a a vet school. So Auburn University College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, I trained there, um, took some classes with the vet students, ended up teaching some of those vet students and so you know you kind of you really get um, put into that the veterinary culture. Talk walk me through step by step so where did you get your bachelor's degree? So I'm from Kentucky and so I got my bachelor's in science in biology at the University of Kentucky. Thought I wanted to be a veterinarian and but I I still wanted to to see what else was out there and so I went and got a master's in science and genetics at Appalachian State University in North Carolina. And um, actually while I was there, you know, I, 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 I wasn't really into parasites at all, but when I was there, I had to take my last semester two elective courses to finish out my, my coursework for my master's. And one of the courses was entomology The second course was parasitology. And, you know, until that point, I was um, preparing my vet school applications. I was doing, I was was checking all the boxes and and getting ready to do all that. And then I took those courses and it was a complete turnaround. I I didn't want to be a vet anymore, but I still wanted to work with animals. And, but I was just fascinated by these these organisms and so I started to look for PhD programs and I found one with um, Dr. Byron Blackburn at Auburn University and and, you know ended up at Florida. I um, give support and advice to veterinarians. Um, I work with veterinarians on a daily basis. I work with researchers. I work with government. Um, It's 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 amazing Um, you know, how everything just melts together. I feel like that's a common theme I hear from a lot of our guests, whether they're veterinarians or not, that they didn't find their true passion until right at the very end, when all of a sudden they took one class or they met one mentor. Parasitology is the study of parasites. Yes, it is. It's the study of parasites. And it looks like based on some of your background, are there certain parasitologists and maybe yourself that study certain parasites more than others based on their location or can you do a lot of like teleparasitology where you're getting samples from Ecuador or Belize what is that the location piece look like so it, it's it's across the board so you definitely have parasitologists who study some study one particular parasite um, and then you know kind of across the gamut as far as that parasite goes um, and then you have parasitologists who, you know, are, study a wide variety. Um, you know, and, and it's hard to say, especially in the world we live now, where you can put something in the mail and just ship it very easily. Um, you know, the, what I've been fortunate enough to work with, um, you know, includes parasites from all over the world. And so I've been able to, you know, have things sent to me here in Florida but I've also been able to travel. And so we've gone to Af- I've gone to Africa and we've um, studied parasites there. And I've worked with people in Africa who've sent stuff to me. Um, I've gone to the Galapagos and studied parasites there. Um, we studied parasites in Mexico. Um, you know, so there's um, different things. And then in the United States, you know, I've done collections for um, people looking at parasites in marine mammals, seals and sea lions, dolphins, um, different whales, 
And so along the Pacific coast, Alaska, Oregon, Washington, and so they'll send hundreds of samples. And then here in Florida, you know, we have plenty of parasites in Florida. It's like the parasite capital of the United States. Uh, we so, are off sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's tons of parasites that are coming into the state that we didn't know were in the state. We didn't know were in the country. Um, we're finding new hosts. I mean, so it, it's kind of a, across the board. What are the components of your job when you get a parasite? Are you identifying the parasite? Are you looking for changes in the parasite? Like they send you all these parasites. What are you, what are they asking you to do with them? So it depends. So if I'm doing research, then I'm answering, answering the question. If I'm doing diagnostics, um, then I'm either looking through feces, blood, urine, vomitus for signs of parasitism, whether it's an egg coming out of a parasite, a larva, um, a cyst, or something like that. Or they send uh, the actual parasite. So if um, dogs or cats vomit something up or something's defecated um, during necropsy, if, then those get sent to me and then those are identified. Um, and we, we do a variety. So, uh, you know, I do, I'm cl a classical parasitologist. And so I'm going to do um, morphological identification. Um, and then I also work with um, some people here at UF. And then we like to take that morphological ID with that parasite and then back that up with PCR. And so we, we do that because there are, um, there are not a lot of sequences out there for all these parasites. And so when we have something, we know what it is, then we can um, um, you know, put that sequence out there for the rest of the world to compare it to and kind of build this kind of parasitology database. And what departments would you say you work with the most? Like, is it primary care? Do you work with oncology? Oh who, gosh. Who do you work with? It's all over the place. So primary care, farms and large animal, dermatology, internal medicine, marine mammals, um, shelter medicine. I mean, it's, it's, it's across the board. What would you say are the top three parasites we see the most in our general area? Um, for what animal? Ooh, big question. <laughs> the dog. A dog. Probably the, the top three would be heartworms, hookworms. So Dirflaria embidus for heartworms, hookworms, Ancelostoma. Um, and then let's see another dog one. Probably tapeworms, Dipylene caninum. So that's the tapeworm you get from fleas. And so those three are very, very common um, in dogs in Florida, unfortunately. We've talked about research a little bit. So I, I feel like research is, a, is an abstract, abstract topic for some students. So maybe what we could do to help them understand it a little bit more is could you walk us through a research paper that you've done and kind of like from start to finish, how did you guys decide to do the paper? What was the topic? What did you have to do to get the data? And then how did you publish it? Sure. Um, so one of the parasites that I um, am really interested in and have been doing um, work with probably for the past five years or so is um, a zoonotic parasite, a parasite that's not uh, necessarily, um, I guess, native to Florida or the United States. So that's Angiostrongylus cantonensis. So this is the rat lungworm. And, you know, a lot of research, you know, sometimes you plan it out. Um, you know, you, you have something in mind that you want to investigate and you, you kind of stepwise go through that. And then sometimes research projects just show up. And so this was one that just kind of showed up. Um, this was, it started off in the zoo med ward. And so Dr. Wellahan and his group over there, um, an orangutan, was presented to the, the ZooMed ward and she was very sick. She was from Miami and she was privately owned. You know, one of the first thoughts was, well, it could be rat lungworm because this particular parasite had been um, reported in the Miami Metro Zoo a few years earlier in a given. They did a, a necropsy and they found um, some lesions in her brainstem and 
working with the CDC, at that point we were able to get those, um, they were larval parasites that they were finding in histological section. And so working with the CDC, we were able to get those ID'd as androstrongulus uh, larvae. So um, I actually asked the owners for permission to come down to their property because in order to get um, infected with this parasite, you have to ingest snails or slugs, some kind of mollusk. So they let me come on their property, went down there, spent the afternoon. I collected as many snails as I could find because they said she liked to eat snails. Collected a lot of snails and it also goes through the rat, hence the name rat lungworm. So they had an outdoor kitchen and I collected a bunch of rat fecal pellets oh, from all around the kitchen. And so we spent the day down there doing that and then everything was brought to the lab. We had to, I worked with a malacologist. A malacologist is someone who studies snails. So there's someone at the Florida Museum, um, John Subskinski. And so he works with me and he I did identified all the snails. We um, uh, unfortunately had to kill the snails and smash them up and see what was in them. And then I also did fecal analysis on the rat feces. And so we found the parasite. You know, that paper, we published that, that, that paper, um, you know, because it was, we found a new species of snail that had not been described for this parasite, um, and then reporting it again in Miami. And then we also published the paper on the orangutan as a case report. And that went through and the CDC's um, Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal um, with Dr. Mullahan and his resident. And so from that, just that little, you know, day of collection and that, um, those, uh, those things I was able to write a small grant and do a larger survey of the state. And so that I was able to involve, I think, an undergraduate and two, two different veterinary students on that project. Um, I had a resident pathologist on that project. Um, there were quite a few of us and we basically went to zoos, conservation centers, places all over the state collecting snails. We collected their dead rats that they didn't want anymore. We collected rat feces. I think it ended up being like um, just under 200 rats. Um, we collected uh, I think over 1400 snails and then over the course of uh, a year or more, I forget, it was all kind of a blur, um, to process all of that, because we had to do necropsies on all the rats, process all the feces, we had to digest all the snails, and the snails got digested with hydrochloric acid and pepsin, and so that wasn't a very pretty process, and so, you know, getting all those digested, and then pulling out all the worms we found, identifying all the stuff, and then everything had to be verified by PCR. Um, so we had to have a molecular identification to go along with it because, you know, often that's what, um, you know, journals want. They, they want the, the, the both of it together. Um, it just makes it for a stronger argument. And so it took a while to do that. And then we were able to, to publish that larger, that larger paper. What were the findings from the big paper after traveling the state? It's everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, you know, from what that from that story, my only thought is research is so cool because you had one case happen or somebody calls you on the phone and they want to work on something and then you got to travel the whole state, you got to get students involved, which is mm -hmm. awesome. I'm sure they love that experience. Yeah. And then you guys got to find out even more about this parasite. So I think it's great for students to understand that research is can be fun and exciting and very very helpful and it's also, I think, a way to give back to the profession. So I, it's great when professionals take an interest in research because you're helping future professionals when they see this snail or they see this parasite, they're like, okay, this dog maybe ate this snail. So mm -hmm. research is cool. So if we're talking about zoonotic diseases, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up COVID-19. <laughs> what are your, I don't know if you've had any involvement in this at all, but what are your thoughts on Co like when I say COVID and you think parasites, does anything click? Does anything happen there? What goes on in the conversations with other professionals? Well, I mean, you know, as far as whether or not COVID-19 is, is zoonotic, you know, if, if it 
if it is, it would not surprise me. Um, you know, there are countless, like I said, countless parasites, bacteria, viruses, um, you name it, that um, can infect or infest um, a variety of different hosts. And, and, and in those different hosts, they can, um, they can cause the same disease or they can cause different disease or they can not cause disease at all. Um, and, uh, you know, so, um, I think as, as humans, sometimes we live in a little bubble and, you know, we, we think that some of these, um, kind of outside things can't really affect us when, you know, they, they really can. Um, so, you know, I know that they found, um, COVID in what, a few cats and, um, and things like that. And so, you know, and then the, you know, the question to me was, well, did it go from human to cat or cat to human? And then right. was the disease that they saw in the cat the same as what they saw in the, in the human, you know, and at least with parasites, when parasites um, get into um, kind of an abnormal host or a host they're not supposed to be in, um, the, the disease you see is often worse. Uh, you see that with parasites, the parasite I was talking about, the rat lungworm, when it's in the rat, it didn't really do anything. Uh-huh. Um, it's in the pulmonary artery of the rat, and they can have several in there and still be alive. But when you get it into a human, and if you get a lot of these larvae in a human, um, they end up inside the human, and then they realize, well, it's not a rat. And so then you start to see the disease associated with um, the parasite, and it's, it's neurologic. And so you, know, you see that in a wide variety of, of different parasites when it gets into something else um, that's not supposed to be in then um, you see those effects yeah so since this is a podcast you know people can't see me but i'm making a lot of like freaked out faces because i'm just thinking about like the ramifications of what that means if there's a parasite you know how it behaves in one host if it gets into another host it could be worse it could be different what do you think do you in the next five to ten years what do you think is going to happen with our planet and parasites? Do you think that climate change has an effect on parasites? Do you think, you know, the changes of human life and how we do things, do those conversations ever come up? Um, yeah, they do. And, and I think that climate change absolutely has an effect on parasites. Um, you know, we've seen it in, in several, um, you know, parasites that were, Typically, I, I go back to the rat lungworm, the one that I've been talking about. So this one, um, it's traditionally a tropical parasite, Southeast Asia, um, and it uses mollusks or snails. Snails, you know, many species will estivate in the winter. They can't handle it when it's cold. They can't handle it when it's dry. And so, you know, we've kind of seen it and, and, it, and it always seems like parasites will start in South Florida, mm. South Texas, and they move northward. Um, and, you know, we've seen that here. So in my survey, we found the most parasites in South Florida up through the Orlando area. Then there were a little, you know, a little bit in kind of Gainesville, you know, around the Jacksonville area one report in the panhandle but i guarantee you in five years as i would repeat that study yeah it would be kind of moving up right yeah so it, it's it does go back to one health where how everything is playing a role climate change is affecting the weather so every things move up faster up the state up the country but then if those animals start to either pass away or change that's going to affect the ecology of that area and so we don't know how it's going to affect it at any given time that's intense that's intense yeah i always like to ask professionals what kind of personality do you think is personality and characteristics is helpful for a parasitologist a sense of humor um <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's funny that you asked that because I know all types of parasitologists. So I know some that are very serious, um, some that don't do any 
gross peristology at all. It's all molecular based. Um, you know, some who don't teach at all, who only do research. Um, and then I know some that have more of a job description like I do. Um, so they do some research, they do some diagnostics, and they do some teaching. Um, you know, there are a lot of parasitologists that don't do any diagnostics. Um, and then, you know, and as far as personality, like I said, some are, are very, um, you know, they're, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's kind of across the board. You know, you, I definitely know that are, are some that are very eccentric um, and some that have tattoos of parasites on them. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, some that if you looked at them, you would never in a million years think that they uh, liked to get their hands dirty and look at worms. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of across the board. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think definitely having um, a uh, collaborative spirit because, you know, there are some parasitologists who work alone, but I think this is definitely a field where you, 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 you get more done and you have more fun if you are willing to collaborate with other parasitologists, with other, um, um, other people. If you're going to do something other than just complete molecular parasitology, you don't want to get grossed out too much because um, it, it can be pretty gross. I yeah. mean, you're looking at some nasty stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, once you can, you can get past the, the grossness of it, they, they really are beautiful. What is advice for the students before they get into vet school from you? One would be not to take yourself so seriously and not to, not to put a ton of weight on that grade. Um, you know, and I have, I, I think that, you know, going into vet school with a, a kind of a spirit of, I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to have a wonderful experience. Um, making time for yourself. Um, not letting go of that self-care is very, very important. What's your go-to self-care method? My go-to self-care method is that um, I do not check my email on the weekends. Nice. I took it off my phone. Yes. I love that. That might be one of my most favorite self-care tips I've heard in a while. I agree with Dr. Walden. Knowing when to separate work from home life, yeah. even though it might be scary and you have to get used to it a little bit, is a great, great benefit. What haven't I asked you that you would like to share with the podcast? I'm not trying to make 124 parasitologists, um, but we are a dying breed. And so if, if you are interested in... Um, you know, still being a veterinarian and you get into vet school and you like parasites, um, you know, think about it as scary as four more years of school would be. Graduate school is completely different than vet school. So different. Night and day. Yeah. Um, consider it. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's getting that graduate degree on top of the DVM is not, not as, as scary as it sounds. Um, you know, and we definitely need more parasitologists um, because, you know, a lot of the pillars in our, um, uh, you know, in, in our, uh, our group are retiring and we definitely need more. You know, I, I think it would definitely be uh, worth a second look. There you go, students. Parasitology wants you to get pumped about parasites. I love that, you know, just getting the students' minds open to other options can really help my audience know that you're going to get a job if you have a DVM degree, but you might get a more unique and better suited job for you if you get the DVM and a graduate degree later and potentially in parasitology.
Right. Well, thanks, Dr. Walden, for being on the podcast. I really liked our chat about all these gross little things. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I'm Savlino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, and just a quick reminder for our audience that season three is being recorded during social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, I have four student guests to talk about diversity, inclusion, and leadership. It's something that we talk about a lot at the CVM, but really it's becoming a part of our daily lives and our daily conversation. And I recognize that for a lot of pre-vet students, you maybe haven't had the same leadership opportunities to discuss your diversity and why inclusion is important. So today we have our DVM students on to help us tackle the questions that you're going to get asked in essays and interviews and in life. So I would love for my guests to introduce themselves, starting with Andrea. Andrea, go ahead and tell us um, your name, your class year, and you know what else we're gonna do, uh, guests and audience? We're also gonna list our identities, some of our identities. So before I ask my guests to do that, I will go ahead and start. So when audience, when you're thinking about your identities, these are qualities, traits, characteristics that you go into every situation with, whether it's your gender, your sexual orientation, your age, your personality traits, maybe you're really, really outgoing and that's part of your identity. So I'll go ahead and name a couple of mine. I definitely identify with being a gator. I have lived in Gainesville for 15 years. I got my bachelor's and my master's degree at UF. So being a gator and being competitive is definitely an identity that I have. Another identity I associate with is being a woman. So I, um, as a woman, I recognize that leadership is really important to me. I wanna be a mentor and role model for a lot of young women. So I know that being a woman is important to me. And another identity I think that, especially in diversity and inclusion, another identity I have is being an ally. So I um, am a pretty traditional human in veterinary medicine. If I was gonna be a veterinarian, I am a woman, I'm white. I am, I'm straight, so I really identify with being an ally and um, finding opportunities for marginalized populations and students who have been underrepresented to have a voice and feel included. So those are some of my identities. So Andrea, go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience. Hi everyone, um, my name is Andrea Rodriguez. I am a second year at the college. Um, I was born and raised in South Florida. My parents immigrated to the United States from Colombia. So I identify, I'm a daughter of immigrants, um, I'm Latin. I have also, one of my other identities is being um, gay. And so that's been very interesting to navigate both in my culture and um, in the workforce. One of my other identities is that I have a very strong personality. So that definitely um, affects how I interact with the world. And I also come from a working class family. Um, my parents run a small business. So a lot of times in different situations, I notice that I can recognize how financial circumstances come into play. Um, and so coming from a working class and having that, um, that view um, has definitely been um, helpful, I would say. Hi guys, I'm Hera Bassett. I am a third year student at UF, so I'm part of the class of 2022, just starting my clinical rotations. Um, I identify as a very, very strong Pakistani American Muslim woman. Um, my parents came to America. I was born and raised in Hialeah, Florida, so I also have a little bit of, you know, Latin culture influence into my life, which is interesting to navigate. My parents came here in the 80s. I am a first generation college student. So, you know, my parents always kind of advocated for me to work hard, get what I need and really help me in terms of supporting me through everything, even though they kind of didn't know what was going on. Um, I also kind of come from a working class background where my dad was always working and my mom was staying at home taking care of my grandparents as they got older. So I've dealt with navigating that and growing up pretty fast. So 
juggling all that together. I'm also Muslim, which is definitely an underrepresented um, minority in vet med. So normally you're surrounded by the white Christian environment. So it's interesting to kind of navigate through that lens. And my culture is very South Asian. I love um, my culture, how vibrant it is and everything like that. Uh, so I kind of use that to get a better perspective of people and to help understand where they're coming from. So that is me. And again, I am a strong woman. I advocate for women to take care of themselves, handle it yourself. You got it yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Maria Grillo or Maria Grillo, depending on how you want to pronounce it. <laughs> I am from a uh, class of 2021, so fourth year student now. Um, and a little bit about me. I am originally from Caracas, Venezuela. Um, I moved here when I was really young, so I grew up in South Florida, which anyone from South Florida can probably recognize that it is a mixed bag of cultures, so that definitely had a big impact on me growing up. Um, I am also a double gator. Um, let's see, I'm a little bit older than some of my counterparts in vet med. I, instead of a gap year, I took like a gap six or seven years. Um, <laughs> so I have some real world experience uh, before school um, in the workforce. I am married. Um, I am an ally. Um, I am bilingual, an immigrant. Um, I also have a number of autoimmune dis uh, diseases. So. When I was really young, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So that definitely kind of put a filter on the way I view the world. Um, I also come from a working class background. So a lot of struggles with finances and didn't necessarily have that safety net uh, financially when I was navigating um, college or my studies or life in general. Um, so yeah, I think all of those things, I guess, would be part of my identity. Hi. I'm. Ken Wesley, I'm a rising fourth year veterinary student at UF. Well, I'm originally from Maryland, so I'm an out-of-state student coming to Florida. Um, I'm male, um, identify as gay. I would consider my family to be upper middle class. And I really want to be a stronger ally and want to learn a lot more about, you know, how to be the best ally that I can be. Well, thanks panel for sharing a little bit about yourselves and audience, the reason why it's so important to hear about folks' lived experiences and their identities, you might hear something where you're like, oh, yes, that sounds just like me. I didn't, um, I didn't know somebody was like me at the vet school. But also for, for people who don't identify with anything that we said, it's great to be exposed to the other identities and also get you thinking about your identity. Let's start talking about the essay. One of the essay questions is, what makes you diverse? And what the panel just did, audience, is they talked a lot about their identities, and some of them did mention how that makes them diverse, but just being Latina, it makes you diverse on paper, but we wanna know why does it matter that you identify as Latina, or why does it matter that you identify as an older student? Why does that bring diversity into the class, and why does it matter? So can someone go ahead and just tell me give me an example of something about you that makes you diverse and why do I care that you're coming into the veterinary classroom with that diversity? So um, after you asked, I actually started racking my brain and I think I remember what my diversity essay was <laughs> about. Um, so I talked about my experience of, you know, like I mentioned earlier, being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of seven and what that was like navigating, um, going to like doctor's offices and things like that with, uh, my, my dad worked a lot and he, he speaks more English than my mom does. So having to be the translator for all the medical terminology and speaking to medical professionals when I myself was seven. <laughs> so, um, and also like the struggles of being able to afford my medications and things like that, which adds a, an added stress, which, you know, as a seven year old, you really shouldn't be thinking about those things, but it's something that comes up, you know? Um, so I think when I wrote about my essay, it, it, it definitely put a lens on how I view the medical profession, um, why diversity is so important. Uh, I was lucky enough to finally land with a specialist, an endocrinologist that could manage my, my diabetes, um, who was Cuban. So he was able to communicate with my mother um, and explain things both in English and Spanish so that everyone understood and everyone was on the same page, but that wasn't always the case. 
So I think it's so important being a bilingual person and kind of having that background, um, I think it's so important to be that doctor. Um, if a client comes in that English may not be their first language, it's like, hey, if you do speak Spanish, I can help with that. The first time I ever met a Latinx veterinarian, I was in my late 20s. So I think it's so important to have that representation and to um, show the community that there's people like them um, in powers or in, in leadership positions. Oh, Maria, you hit on a lot of good things there. So some, there, a couple of things I'd like to point out about what Maria mentioned. One, the representation. So not seeing a Latinx veterinarian into your late 20s, Maria might have thought, maybe I can't be a veterinarian because I'm not being represented in the field. So having representation just by having the demographics and the diversity in the class is important. So there's future role models for students. So that's huge. Two, the bilingual. So if someone comes into my office at Preva and they're like, well, I'm bilingual, so I'm diverse. That's true, but I need you to follow up with, I'm diverse because I can reach more clients. I can help remove some health disparities because if no one can speak the language, then those folks are not gonna be able to get healthcare, whether it's veterinary, medical, dental, whatever it is. So being bilingual reaches more people. And then another thing that Maria mentioned was finances. So her experience of being young and seeing how expensive medicine can be, she can now be more empathetic to future clients who are maybe, you know, I really can't afford this. What can we do? She can work with them a little bit differently um, versus maybe some folks who haven't come in contact with low income families or folks who have had financial issues. So she mentioned a lot of great things there. Okay, who else? Yes, Andrea, please. Okay, so kind of piggybacking off of that, I think that question that that asks, you know, how are you diverse? Why are you diverse? Diversity to me, and and how I explain it to a lot of people, it's what makes us human, right? Like we're not robots who all come off of a of a production line. Diversity is our life story. So um, I think there has to be done, and the the um, the exercise you just did about like what lens do you see through the world, like we can take a moment and just start writing down like what what are your lenses like how do you see the world and I, I know it can be so intimidating for someone who might come from a privileged background who might be white to think that they're not diverse but that's just simply not true like you have you have a life story um and so i think it's just that self-reflection and also if you do come from a privileged background acknowledging that you do and what are you doing to make yourself uh, culturally competent like what are you doing to educate yourself what are you doing to to fix the issues that you see as a as a person and, and how how are you playing a role into that because um i i think everyone everyone has a story to tell so andrea mentioned the word privilege so privilege means that some people were either born into or were given opportunities that other people never had access to. So um, one thing that Ken mentioned earlier, and he said that you know he came from uh, like a, a financially better situation family. Other examples of privilege are if you come from a family with two, both parents. That's an example of privilege. Um, another example of privilege would be being born in the United States could be considered an example of privilege. And if you're sitting there being like, wait a second, we, you know just because I was born in the United States, like how does that give me privilege? I would challenge you to go ahead and do some research because it can be a hard topic to understand. And it doesn't mean you're bad if you come from a privileged background, it's just the way it is. And so we just have to understand that not everybody had the same opportunities and had the same rights. If you look at men versus women, there's a difference in rights there. So um, it can be a little heavy topic, but um, Andrea's right to bring up privilege and I would encourage students as you're writing down your identities, go ahead and write down, look up privilege. I totally agree with, um, you know, Alex's definition of what privilege could be and how it's kind of a dynamic thing. Um, I know myself, the example that she said about being born in the United States is in and of itself a form of privilege. And I know that firsthand because if I was born back in Pakistan, and with the current political unrest that's happening, I probably wouldn't have been able to achieve the education that I have currently. And my mom was from a family where they valued education and she actually tried to go to college in Pakistan, but then ended up having to move to America with my dad when she got married. So, you know, there's just different things and different concepts to be aware of. And 
um, kind of going off the topics of thinking about when you're writing your essay, just because you're not from a marginalized background or from a, you know, very working class family, if you think you're the most privileged person in the world, you still have something to contribute to diversity. And that's kind of important. And I feel like it's daunting for a lot of people um, when they feel like they have nothing that makes them diverse because your perspective alone and your understanding of other people and, you know, I, I don't really like the word woke, but your wokeness kind of helps you become a diverse person and contribute to a classroom and a DVM situation with that background. Kind of going off of what Maria was saying originally, where she said she had never met a Latin vet until, you know, their early 20s. I grew up in a very, very Latin place in Miami. So every single one of the veterinarians I worked for was Latin. And just from being in that environment, I ended up learning Spanish. So I actually speak three languages. Um, my Spanish has gotten a little rusty since I've been up in Gainesville. Um, but, you know, I realized how helpful it is and how comfortable clients feel when you're able to speak to them in a language that they understand. And it just makes them feel like they're valued and that even if your Spanish is super broken, which I know my grammar was not the best, I at least tried for them and it made them feel comfortable, especially if there's no one else there who could understand what they were saying. So just being open, being reflective on yourself and knowing where you came from and how you contribute to a diverse society because, you know, vet med's a little, a couple steps behind when it comes to the melting pot that is America and, you know, how we are as a society. So it's important to just keep that in mind. On the essay specifically, I just would like to say that, so when I actually filled out this essay, my dad and I got into a huge argument about this essay. I actually had done a lot of work um, in undergrad with our like LGBTQ club and things like that. And um, so I had some like leadership experience. I had done some diversity work. I wanted to share that in my essay, but my dad kind of being from a more old school perspective, didn't want me to share that information because he thought that it would influence my application and would prevent me from getting into vet school. So he didn't want me to take that risk. It wasn't that he didn't support me in my identity, but it was that he just didn't think it was worth the risk of including that information. And so I actually omitted, I didn't include that extracurricular on my, on VimCast and I didn't talk about it in the essay. Um, uh, but I think that that experience was super valuable because it was about diversity, which was relevant to the essay and relevant to me as a person, but it was also relevant to leadership experience. And that's something that I think UF, I know, and a lot of other veterinary schools are looking for strong leadership because veterinarians are leaders in our community and, they're, and that's super important. Um, so I think my biggest advice is don't feel that you can't include a part of yourself. If you don't necessarily talk about how you are diverse, you can, at least start the essay with like why you think diversity is important and then maybe like go into like different ways in which you help. Everyone has been saying, I think it's just really important. We have diversity in our pro profession. I haven't, I didn't meet a gay veterinarian until like the summer after my first year of vet school. I think that's still the only one I've met. I know that there are many that exist, but I, I still just haven't come across them. Um, and so I just think it's, it's really important to have that representation and have those discussions and have people like you in the profession. Oh, I'm just so happy to have everybody talking about this. And I should say that everyone on the panel today is a leader in diversity in some way or another. So we have students who have started clubs. We have students who have been presidents of our diversity alliance. So leadership that's why they're here and that's why they're talking about all of this. What I would say about um, Ken's point that he did not include some of his undergraduate experiences, I think, and what I tell students with their essays, is you should write whatever you can live with. So same thing with dressing for an interview. Sometimes students have a lot of tattoos or piercings or colored hair or whatever. And they're like, well, should I show them? Should I hide them? And I say, do what you can live with. If you really want to show your true self that day, do it. If you're not ready and you don't feel comfortable and you're gonna worry about it later, 
then it might not be the right time and that's okay too. And you can make those decisions and, you know, Ken, I hope you don't beat yourself up about not writing that because you got into vet school and you're doing so many things. And that's what I would tell students is, if you are not ready to write it down, don't do it. But I will say from a UF standpoint, we really do love to see that leadership. And I bet if Ken had written that essay, they would be even more enthusiastic about having him come to vet school. So I was just actually gonna uh, piggyback off what Ken said. So going back to what I wrote for, for my essay, I was very, very hesitant to talk about being diabetic because um, I was worried that the application or the admissions committee would see that as a hindrance that they'd be like, you know, we're not sure if we want to take the risk of, of taking someone who has an illness um, and put them in an environment where zoonosis is a real concern. And, you know, we don't want to put her health at risk or how is that going to, she would be able to keep up with other students. It's a very physical career that we have. Um, so it's something that I struggled with for a very long time and I've not been very open in the past about um, my illnesses just because I don't want that lens, right? So it's something that is considered an invisible illness. So I am able to not talk about it. And people won't know just by looking at me. Um, but after talking to people who are close to me and speaking with my husband, he's like, that's absolutely something that is a part of you. And going back to what I wrote about, um, it has definitely influenced how I view the world. So why wouldn't I, I talk about something like that? That's such a big part of me. You know what it reminds me of, Maria? It reminds me of mental illness. I have a lot of pre-vet students who are like, I suffer from anxiety, I suffer from depression. This has happened, that has happened. And they're like, I don't think I should write about it in the essay, or I don't think I should bring it up in the interview because they're afraid that there will be negative consequences. There will be some kind of retribution where they won't get into vet school or people will think they can't hack it, kind of everything you're saying. And I tell the student, if you're comfortable writing about your journey and your resilience and your ability to recognize an area of improvement in your life and you've taken steps to help yourself, that is something totally worthy of an essay. Because one, a lot of people can relate to it. So many of us have anxiety and so many of us have suffered from depression that it actually becomes a, a bit of an equalizer. I would say the one time you would maybe caution yourself from writing about it is if you have not explored getting it under control or you have not explored ways to help yourself and if you're currently still in a very if you're still in the well and you haven't worked on climbing out of the well yet it might not be the right time to write about it and it might not be the right time to approach professional school because professional school is going to be intense so you want to make sure that you do have some strong self-help skills, some strong coping skills before, before coming to vet school. But if you do suffer from any kind of, I'll just call it a life issue, and you are working on getting it under control, I think it's great to talk about it and talk about how you overcome it and what you've learned from it. I know mental illness is kind of still seen as like a dirty word, I guess. Some people feel like they should hide it, that they feel like their professors will judge them or, you know, a, a clinician will judge them or anything like that. But if you're able to conquer that mental illness and it contributed to making you stronger as a person. So I personally, I was in an abusive relationship um, all throughout undergrad and it was not a fun time, clearly, um, but it definitely made me stronger, made me a strong woman, an advocate for other women. And it actually kind of helped me connect with a lot of people in vet school. And when I first moved up here, uh, we had an amazing counselor. We still have an amazing counselor, Dr. Stahl, um, but she kind of helped me and I would go see her right before class started and I would just kind of talk about how I was feeling. And it's mental illness is such a common thing that I feel like it's important for people to talk about how they deal with it, to build those skills of dealing with it yourself, but also knowing when it is the appropriate time to go out and seek help. So I was dealing with the stress of first year add that on to the PTSD I had from my abusive relationship and my generalized anxiety disorder, which I'm on medication for, which, you know, that's also something that makes you diverse, that you're, you know, taking control of that. So be confident in who you are, realize what makes you who you are and how it makes you stronger and just an awesome person and kind of go off of that, you know, just 
nothing's off limits as long as you're okay with it not being off limits. Thank you for sharing that, Hira. I think that the more stories that we share, the more we hear from others, the more um, courageous conversations that we all have, the more we can learn. We can learn empathy. We can learn to relate with others. Uh, it's great to know, especially when, when you meet somebody, you have no idea what their background is typically. And knowing the strong leaders that we have in vet school, but also knowing that these strong leaders have a past, have lived experiences and are still here doing what they're doing. I think that's very encouraging for all the pre-vet students that wherever you're at right now, I mean, COVID is going on, things are crazy. And all of these things that you all have worked through and are dealing with are making you stronger people, stronger leaders and stronger veterinarians. The word leadership keeps coming up and I really wanted to talk about that. Um, it was something that definitely um, haunted me when I was applying for vet school because um, leadership is awesome. Like getting extracurricular activities, getting involved in your community and involved in your college is so amazing, but it's also so time consuming. And the majority of the time it's not paid, right? So you have to take time out of your day to go to these meetings, to, to organize events. Um, and unfortunately you can't use that, right? To, to pay your utility. So I, um, I really was so, I, the only leadership experience I had was like two semesters, right? Where I had a very minimal officer role or I had an officer role in my, in a professional fraternity because the majority of the time I was just working. So I think it was also really, what helped me a lot was that I explained my truth. I explained my story and I, and I talked about, you know, what it was like to, to work my way through undergrad. And I think that the admissions committee really takes value in that. So um, for sure, like my advice to any pre-vet, like if you have the opportunity to get involved, by all means, like follow your passions, like, you know, like what Ken said, like get involved with the LGBT club, like get involved with your horse judging team. But if, if you can't, like if financially, if, if that, if it, there's a financial burden, like that's okay. Like recognize that, like do what you have to do. And that's what the essays are for. That's what the interviews are for. Like you can explain your truth. And um, at the end of the day, like it, it definitely is a form of leadership. Thank you for bringing that up. That is so true that leadership takes many different roles. So I have had a lot of students who are like, I could not get in a club. I had to work full time to pay for school. That is a form of leadership. So if you're ever feeling, and we use imposter syndrome a lot um, in vet school and on the podcast, if you're ever feeling like an imposter because you don't have quote unquote, everything else that everybody else has, look at why you don't have it. Do you not have it because you were working? Guess what? Now you have something great to write about. Do you not have it because you're a full-time mom? Guess what? You now have something great to write about. Diversity is a really broad topic. There's a lot of great trainings on lynda.com. The internet is a treasure trove. Do you guys have any strong resources or clubs or web pages where you're like, this is a really good site to talk about diversity and inclusion? I definitely signed up for the Google news alerts that would come like once a week. So I would get that for like general vet med topics, but there's a lot of organizations in vet med that are focused around diversity and inclusion. And this is kind of my little shameless plug here. Um, I co-founded the Association of Asian Veterinary Medical Professionals. And through that organization, um, we're at Asians in Vet Med, by the way, on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook. But we um, met so many amazing people. Latinx VMA is incredible. Juancho and Yvette, incredible. Um, Black DVM Network was one of the first, so that is incredible too with Tierra, and they're just an amazing organization. Pride VMC, Multicultural VMA, um, just allyship VMA organizations. There's so, so many. Okay, so before I also do my shameless plug, um, I just wanted to say if you are a, a person of color, if you are a member of, the, of a minority community, um, don't be intimidated. Um, everyone on this panel has taken some sort of, you know, like Kira just said, like she co-founded the Asian um, Association. So the best thing you can do if you're a pre-vet student and you're volunteering and getting experience and you're working for a vet is just be good at what you do. Like that is the best thing you can do for your community is to just be good in the space that you're in. Um, because one, that will get you, you will get opportunities by being a good volunteer and um, 
people who might have had who might think differently having a good experience with you is so important and you're going to play such a huge role in representation so by all means we are not saying like you have to create you know the new organization like oh my god props to you here but like also for all those type b people out there like just be good just be a good worker be a team player so my shameless plug right so um, i'm the incoming president for if you are if you're a pre-vet student listening in and you're interested in going to uf um so i'm the incoming president for the veterinary alliance for leadership inclusion and diversity so we're a student organization here at the college so we're a student organization that celebrates all facets of diversity and we really just want to educate others and uplift every um others so you can follow us on instagram at at uf dot dvms for diversity um we have been doing social media campaigns highlighting people at our college we are also on the ufcvm website if you go to about us under diversity we will be there um and yeah if you guys ever have any questions um on that instagram and on that website you can see what we do um specifically as dvm students um at the university of florida um, one resource that I'll share is Underrepresented No More, which is a website that is housed with the University of Florida, a lot of work with the AAVMC. So that is urnm.org. There's a ton of resources for all pre-vet students and a very um, intentional focus with diversity and inclusion. I want to thank our panel for coming on today. Let's go around one time and say one word that diversity, inclusion, and leadership means to you. What is one word that you think of? I want to hear from everybody. I'm going to say my word is robust. Community. Representation. Understanding. Equality. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. Quick reminder for our audience, now that we are doing podcasts for social distancing, the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is Dr. Carl Southern. He is a resident in emergency and critical care at the University of Florida College of Vet Med. Dr. Southern, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to have you on. You're my first emergency veterinarian on the podcast. Wow. Yeah, we like to expose the students to all different paths and specialties. So I'm really excited to hear more about emergency. Can right. you start off by telling me where did you get your undergrad degree and what was your major? Sure. So I went to undergrad at Tuskegee University, and I actually majored in the pre-vet option after my junior year in undergrad, got accepted, and so I didn't finish the degree. I just, I went just straight through. So you don't have a bachelor's degree? I do now. Okay. Do, but yeah, I got it at the same time. While I was in vet school, I finished up some other classes to get my bachelor's, but I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't have a bachelor's at all starting in school. So it was always a joke that the last time I had graduated was high school when I was in vet school. <laughs> was well, that's a, funny. And which vet school did you go to? Tuskegee. So I stayed there for undergrad and vet school. So I was there for a good while. Okay. So you went to vet school and then during vet school, did you think you'd end up in emergency medicine? Oh, no way. No, no, no. So in, in school, I actually shied away from emergency. I wanted nothing to do with it. Oh. didn't like it. I had no interest in it. didn't even take the elective. It was an elective course. I didn't even take it. Why were you shying away from it? Uh, the, the real true answer is because we didn't have much exposure to emergency medicine in Tuskegee. It was, an, it was an elective course. Like We had an emergency service, but it really wasn't much of anything, to be honest. Not, we didn't see a lot of cases. Nothing came in after midnight. So it really wasn't a, a, a service, to be honest with you. So you did undergrad and vet school at Tuskegee, shied away from emergency. So then after Tuskegee, what was your next move? Did you do an internship? 
I did not actually. So I, I took a very non-traditional path to get to where I am now. So I finished school and I went to work right, right out of vet school. I went to work in just general practice. So straight from school, no internship, no formal training, straight to work and stayed there for a little over a year and some change in general practice. And then that was in 2011. Then in 2013 is when I decided I'm going to just try emergency. So I applied for an emergency job just because wait, I... Wait, wait, wait. So crazy. explain this to me. If you were crazy. shying away from it, yep. and then now all of a sudden, you, like how did that moment happen where all of a sudden you're like, I want to try it now? Yep, exactly. And, and to be honest with you, Alex, I don't even know if I have the answer to it. I was... <laughs> I was looking for something else to do. And this is the honest truth. I was like, man, this is, you know, I, I, I enjoyed my time in general practice, but it got very routine for me. Mm -hmm. And I know we have some great general practitioners and we need more general practitioners. So it's not a bad thing at all. Just talking about me personally here. I just it got routine. So I was looking for job applications, honestly. And I saw that there was a, an opening for an emergency clinician. And I applied for it, and they honestly told me when I applied that typically we don't hire clinicians without an internship, but they were desperate for for some help. <laughs> it's the honest truth. And I was like, I'll try it. You know, I can, I feel like I can probably make this work. And that's how I fell into emergency medicine in 2013. Just, wow. Just trying it out. And was that, were you in Alabama? I know that at some point you guys lived in Texas. When, where was this emergency clinic? That was in Houston, yep. Was, okay. My first job was in Houston, so general practice was in Houston, and then I switched to emergency medicine in Houston. Uh, how did you end up in Houston? Like, how my did first you? First job, yeah. So Just my first job. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So you were open to opportunity. Oh, yeah. All yep. right, so students, we like students who are open to opportunities. And if you've listened to the podcast at all, you've heard every single veterinarian say that they ended up somewhere they didn't expect. And the reason that probably happened is because they were open to it. Yeah. Uh, I like that Dr. Southern found a position because they were desperate. Like when, you know, take the opportunity, people yeah. take it. Okay. So you end up doing emergency. Mm -hmm. When did you, in that job, were you like, this is for me? Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's exactly what happened. When I started it, it was like, a steep learning curve because you, you can only imagine like I, I didn't have much of an emergency background in school had no training on emergency anything I just went from general practice to emergency so it was a steep learning curve and that actually is what I enjoyed was I was constantly learning something new different procedures new ways of doing things different medications and drugs and everything it was just constantly seeing something new and I stayed there in Houston for we left in 2016 so um, that was 2013 to 2016 yeah the three years mm -hmm. of learning without right. the, the formal internship training right correct okay. yep and and it was mainly all nights weekends holidays and that's oh, that's God. just the way yeah that's just the way it is as as in emergency you, you, you get some daytime but majority of your shifts are going to be overnights going to be holidays and you're going to be weekends. You mentioned nights, weekends, and holidays and I tell pre-vet students a lot when they're like I need to find pre-vet volunteer experience. I'm always like why don't you call an emergency clinic because they're open all the time. Do you think that's good advice? Yeah yeah I, I honestly do and even if they're not you know interested don't know anything about emergency just to get some hours and shadow and experience. Okay so now when did you end up at an internship? Yeah, so when we we end up moving from Houston to North Carolina because my wife got a residency, I felt myself like not practicing the type of medicine I wanted to. Okay. So coupled that with knowing that if I were to specialize, I wouldn't necessarily work as many nights, holidays, and weekends. Could have more of a daytime schedule because we my wife and I wanted to have a family with children. So all those things put together is what made me entertain the idea of, you know, specializing. And I initially just applied for residencies. So I, I without an internship. Without an internship. Because the way the match reads is, you know, they have equivalent on there. So if right. you have an equivalence of, of you know years in practice will equate to an internship. 
So because you had done general practice and you'd worked in an emergency facility for mm -hmm. four plus years, you mm -hmm. kind of did the equivalent of the one year internship. Right. Okay. Yep. So I, I applied through MAPS the first time for a residency and I did not match. And everywhere I applied, honestly gave me positive feedback. So like, we do have a great background. We like, you know, your personality, everything, your, all your reference letters are great. You just don't have any formal internship training. That was what the one comment that everybody had. Interesting. So, yeah. So when I didn't match, I actually got offered a position outside of the match here at University of Florida for their specialty internship in just emergency and critical care. And, and that's how I accept, that's how I got into my internship. I'm sure you're going to tell me in a second that doing the year internship was great and you learned a lot. I, I, I assume you're going to tell me that, but I do want to, say for students like the fact that you did have you know four plus years of other experience and you kept getting that no we want the internship students sometimes you just have to play the game and yep. sometimes people have these these I don't want to say barriers set up or obstacles but there are like checkpoints that some people want you to yeah some people are going to want you to make and it might not make sense and you might be sitting back and be like no I know I can do this but if you want a position and other people are in charge of it, you kind of have to do what they say you have to do. My understanding of internships is that's a tough year in general. Like intern life is hard. So it describe is. an internship in emergency and critical care. Describe it for me in like one sentence. What was it like? Uh, so it was a very long, intense, tough but enjoyable year i say enjoyable because that's the way i made it okay okay it is what you make it yeah for sure i'm all about if you can't get out of it get into it yep. so like if and students i would just love it if all of you would adopt this mentality you know especially during things like covid and everything that's going on in the country like we can't get out of some of this so let's get into it let's be enthusiastic yep. let's try to make yep. things work it was it was fun though like it was it, at times it got overwhelming, I'm not going to say that, I'm not going to lie about that, it was definitely overwhelming at times, but the amount of things that I learned that I didn't ever, I was like, I, I can do this, you know, I've already learned all these things, mm. I learned so much <laughs> week one. Yeah, right. I didn't even know I was going to learn, week one. Can you break down for me, how does emergency interact with ICU and PCW? Can you yeah. tell us what those departments are and how those three function together? Sure. Yep. So we'll, we'll just start with the emergency service. So all the anything that comes in through the door, let's say it just it's a walk-in emergency. Uh -huh. It's gonna come in and it's gonna stay in that you know our little triage area. This is how it's set up here at the University of Florida. There's different setups for different places. Okay. But they'll come in. They'll be in our triage area, and let's say it it gets admitted. So we're gonna keep this animal now. Mm -hmm. Then it decides, okay, is it critical or unstable enough, or does it need that level of monitoring and care where it needs to be moved to ICU? Mm -hmm. You're going to have an extra set of eyes on it. It has a little bit more involved, a little, needs a little bit more of the attention and care. Okay. That's how they'll get moved to ICU versus PCW, where it's more stable. You're not going to be checking on it as often. It's a patient where, you know, eight hours can go by and, and you haven't really looked at it or done much with it. It's getting, you know, just some basic care, uh -huh. um, things like a fracture or, you know, things that are just kind of not really critical or urgent. Okay. And in the ICU, they're going to get a little bit more attention. So they get checked on more frequently. They might, they might have vitals that are changing every so often. They might need a recheck exam like three or four times a night, things like that. Okay. That's how we break them down. Okay, so what I hear you saying is emergency, you could be acting right then if it's an actual, like, we must attack this right now. Mm -hmm. ICU, intensive care unit, that's for animals who need to be checked on more consistently. Things are not quite right. PCW, progressive care ward, is for animals who are a little more stable and they can have more time in between checks. Right. Can you describe emergency and critical care in three words? Ooh. <laughs> um, so I hate to say fast paced, but it, it, so three words would be 
um, efficient, mm. fast paced, and continuous. And the reason I say continuous is things are always changing. Yeah, yeah. I like efficient because we always, I always ask the veterinarians, like, tell me about a personality type that would do well in this specialty. Mm. So I feel like there's a certain kind of human that needs to be an emergency. Like it, to me, it's not integrative where it's like, well, let's <laughs> try this, yeah. this, this. And we kind of have, they might have time on their side a little bit, like an emergency. It's literally an, I mean, I have to assume that some people bring their animals in that it's not an emergency. Oh, for like, sure. For right? sure. <laughs> You, I'm sure you see, and I, I'm going to want to ask you about some clients, but I'm sure you see some things come <laughs> in and you're like, I don't need to touch this animal right now. Let's talk about the typical cases we might see in emergency. I have to imagine that you do see some things often. Yeah. What are those, tell me the three cases you see the most in emergency. Vomiting and diarrhea is number one. Okay. You're going to see, you're bound to every single shift get some form of vomiting or diarrhea. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. probably your number one thing you're going to see. Okay. Um, the next thing you probably see is, um, like they'll call it lethargy or not acting right, just being off. So something mm -hmm. just seems, something is wrong. They can't even pinpoint what it is. They're just, my dog's not acting right. They call it ADR or, you know, ain't doing right. Oh, okay. Okay. Acronym. Yeah. yeah. So that would be your, your, your two off the, off the top, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, not acting like himself. And then I would say the third one would probably be a true emergency, whether it's, you know, something that, you know, it's a, they, they ate something toxic okay. or, or they're, um, they're what about like hit by a car. Yeah. You, you see hit by a car. You will, you, they, they, they come very frequently and okay. it's a frequent emergency. They're not all ones that are like unstable and critical, but we do see a good number of hit by cars. Okay. I could, that could be a good, easily could be a third, a third one for sure. What are your favorite cases to see walk in the door? Which ones are you like, yes, it's going to be a good day? Oh man, it's changed so much now. Um, I really like things that I can fix and, and send away. Okay. So like uh, toxicities, toxicities that I can like make them throw it up and get them out of here. Yeah foreign like a foreign body in the stomach make him throw it up and get him out or scope it out uh -huh. i i like i love being in the icu but when i'm on er i like to keep things moving i don't like doing long workups and diagnostics and drawing things i like to keep keep the pace moving treat yes. what they're there for yes and get them out yes so I, I like those type cases where they come in yeah, he he you know he's he's throwing up we do some diagnostics figure out he's got a foreign body yeah. It out. Right. And surgery and like just move them on. I don't want to make this about me, but I feel like that's what I would like about emergency. I don't like long term projects. I no. like something is wrong. Let me fix it. Let me consult yes. on it and never talk to you again. And I you think never that's see you again. Never see you again. Like be the cool aunt or the fairy godmother, <laughs> save the day, and then say goodbye. Yeah. And For sure. that is different than let's say I'll mention integrative again because you might have a patient for years that oh, you're yeah. trying to help rehab so yeah. would we say that that's something that's specific to emergency like you're not necessarily becoming close with these clients and these patients mm -hmm. right a lot of us that get into emergency are for that reason we don't want clients like I yeah. want to see you today and I don't want to see you again yes okay yes. so that's a good thing for students to recognize and students you will not know this until you've been in practice long enough to experience it. But if you know you're the kind of person who doesn't really want to make strong relationships with clients and patients, emergency might be a great fit for them, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. That's really, so the student who loves relationships, GP. Oh, yeah. You see a puppy from, you give him, start a puppy all the way until he's, you know, an old, old dog. Yeah. The client communication for emergency is different. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you handle a client coming in, whether it's good news, bad news. I have to imagine it can get very expensive in emergency. Yeah. How do you handle client communications? So I, I honestly keep it on what they're there for. So, and I, I make sure to stay focused. So if they come in for being hit by a car, 
And I make sure to focus on that from beginning to end. Yes, they might have other issues, but if they're not relevant or life-threatening or pertinent to this visit, I don't bring them up. I don't talk about their diet. I don't right. talk about their vaccines. Yeah. Like, I don't go through any of those things. I focus on why they're there and I and I make sure I'm being as concise and accurate with them, yeah. especially if it's an unstable patient. So I, I, I lead with it. I, I lead with, hey, we know he was hit by a car. Right now, I'm concerned that he's unstable. I give him the reason why. Uh-huh. Whether he's where he's having difficulty breathing, whether he's bleeding somewhere, whether he has a broken leg or whatever it might be, I lead with that. And I stay focused on that with the client because you have to reel them back in. They're going to get lost. They're going to start right. going on about different things. And it's, it's your job to make sure you keep them on task and and on point with what's going on because they're going to... Things are going to change quickly. Uh-huh. Brought up the estimate. So you have to make sure that you give them a pretty accurate estimate early on because mm-hmm. you don't want to make a big bill for them and then say, oh, wait, we're at you know, $1,500 and we only talked about an, an exam fee of one thirty. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you have to stay tunnel visioned with what is going on, but you also have to be broad with that estimate so they're not shocked with a huge bill at the end of the day. Right. right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, let's talk about crazy clients. So what are some of the things that you see for fun anecdotal stories of like, yeah, this happens. Like what are, what are some things that come to mind in the ER with the clients? Probably the funniest thing is how people come in. So, you know, it's emergency to them, whether it's emergency or not, it's emergency to them. So they drop everything and they come, they come with no shoes, (laughs) no shirt. They, they come in their pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny. This is what the people come in. You get a good laugh of how they come in. And they'll tell you, I, I, we get this all the time. I left home and didn't even grab my wallet or my purse. Like they can't uh-huh. even pay for anything. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's funny. Like that's probably one of the biggest thing is how they come in. And then you'll get the people who, who come in and they don't know anything about the animal. Oh, um, yes. Yep, they're like, oh, I just, I just brought, my wife told me to bring him. I don't even know this dog. It's my oh. wife's dog. Yes. <laughs> and we're like, well, why did you come? Like, who can we right. talk to? Can we talk right. to your wife, please? It's, like, it's, it's funny. Now, however, the opposite of that is, like you said, the client who comes in with no shoes, no shirt, and they want service. But to me, that means they really love that animal. And right. they're like, I have to do this. So that you probably see both sides. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And you do have to have a sense of humor, I have to imagine, in all that, Ed. But talk to me about keeping things light. I have to imagine y'all do a lot, see a lot of euthanasia. For sure. Talk me through how how students should start thinking about euthanasia, how it becomes maybe like it is the normal, but maybe it never quite feels right. Like, talk to me about euthanasia. Yeah. So in in the emergency setting, you, you get euthanasias for a couple of reasons. You might get something that we call a walk-in euthanasia. Someone literally comes to you just to euthanize their animal. It could be in the middle of the night because uh-huh. their regular vet is closed and they had a, this is what happens a lot. They have a scheduled appointment to go to their regular vet for euthanasia. Their animal declines in the middle of the night. It's worse uh-huh. and they don't want it to suffer and die throughout the night. So they'll bring yeah. it in us literally just to euthanize the animal. We'll see okay. a lot of that. Okay. And you'll and do that, that, right? Yeah, for sure. Like that's, that's a, that's an excellent client service thing to offer. Okay. You know, we, we don't, we really don't, Tim, we don't ask them many questions. We okay. don't, we don't, uh, and you'll try and talk them out of it. Okay. We don't really, we just grant their wish. Like most times I'll ask them, I'll tell the client is I'll say, just briefly tell me what's going on with them just for, you know, a record standpoint, just so I can have something to document. Sure. And, and they'll tell me in, in two or three words, and I say that's more than enough. And, and I proceed. Like, I don't even have them like break down everything that's going on. Yeah. Just grant their wish. It's a, it's a great client service thing to do. Okay. We'll all see euthanasias for, um, for cases that end up needing to euthanize. So, that hit by car or that really bad dog fight or mm. other bad trauma. Yeah. And whether it's for lack of finances, you know, a, a case that needs, you know, has a, $3,500 bill and they don't have that amount of money yeah. or they have all the money in the world and the animal is just has a very poor prognosis and it's not going to make it for whatever the reason might be. Right. Asia, again, that's what we 
That's what we're here for. We recommend it when we know the prognosis is poor, when we know the outcome is not going to favor the animal. Yeah. We have that option to euthanize them. So it's definitely something that we do a lot of in emergency medicine. You do a lot of euthanasias and you don't get used to it. Okay. It just becomes something that you, you know is going to be a part of your day. And it, it happens that frequently. Does it help to get used to it or get make it part of your day knowing that you really are doing what's best for that animal in that yeah. moment? Yeah, for sure. Like if, if the, the last thing you want to do is, is watch an animal literally suffer and die because some clients just won't euthanize, which that's their, their right, you know, prerogative. Right. And it could, the, the worst case is like a respiratory case where they're like struggling to breathe. You're oh, doing gosh. everything you can for them. And the clients are like, I don't want to euthanize. I, I don't want to do it. And we don't recommend like ventilation and things like that. They're just kind of doing the best we can with oxygen and other things. And they literally die that way. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that we hate to see. And we talk to them about euthanasia. But when they tell you, like, look, I, I don't want to euthanize my animal. Right. I, I don't believe in it or I don't want to do it. Right. I mean, we don't bring it back up. We just do our best to make sure that animal is comfortable and it's, yeah. and it's well taken care of. But that's something that you can definitely say if you offer euthanasia or you're comfortable euthanizing an animal, it's a benefit to that animal to not watch them suffer. You did your one year internship. Now you're in your residency. Tell me the differences for you Mm -hmm. from an internship and a residency what are the main differences um so the main differences are i'm expected to know a lot more i have a lot more responsibilities okay i i've um been expected to like take that level of knowledge and learning and also reading and training myself to the, the next level to think about being on a specialist level okay a lot of that and then responsibilities too so you have you know interns other interns that you're responsible for residents yeah. and um, depending on what service you're on you might be on with other residents you might be on with other faculty members and students and, right and always students yeah always students and students are the ones that will give you the most questions and give you the most challenging things you like well i don't know but let's go find it because students have the questions that nobody else thinks of Right. Yeah. Now you said that you wanted to stay in academia. Is the reason to want to stay in academia because you love teaching and you love students? Is that your reason? Yep. That's exactly right. So I always think about how my, like when I was in vet school, how we didn't have emergency and critical care. We had, we had a search, but it was just, it just wasn't there. It wasn't, wasn't thriving and big and productive. So I, I definitely want to wherever I end up in an academic setting, I want to make sure that I'm able to teach the students and give back to them in that aspect. Dr. Southern, break down for me, a student should consider emergency if they blank, if they're, talk to me about personality and talk to me about activities that they like. Um, so personality is one that, and there's a, there's a ton of different personalities, but literally your personality type, the people who do with it are ones that kind of have a short-term memory. So ones that don't get too invested and involved. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you don't provide great patient care. Mm -hmm. You're saying that you're not like literally attached to your patient because you're going to see it for a minute and then it's going to be gone. Right. The, the opposite side of that, when you're, on, when you're in the ICU, you might have them for a few days in ICU, yeah. but mm -hmm. really once they discharge or they go to a different service, they're gone. They're no longer your patient. So kind of not, not getting too attached. Mm -hmm. um, and it's their personality type. So we do a lot of procedures, whether it's laceration repairs for dog fights. Mm -hmm. There's plenty, plenty of emergency doctors, not even just criticalists, but people who haven't specialized that do a lot of surgery. Right. When I was, when I was doing my emergency, not, not specializing, I did a lot of surgery, soft tissue surgeries from, you know, GDV surgery, so bloat, foreign body removals, cystotomies for bladder stones, C-sections, C-sections, and C-sections. <laughs> you always get C-sections. In the middle of the night, there's some puppy that ends up, some dog ends up not being able to pass its puppies, and you yeah. end up doing C-sections. So an emergency doctor and or a criticalist, they definitely should have some, some level of comfort and some enjoyability of being in surgery. 
Okay. Whether it's in a, a simple procedure like a laceration or a more involved, like one of those things I just described. Yeah. And I think that they also should um, want to know about like pathophysiology of how things work from drug medications. You know, okay. Which, yeah. which, which drugs to use and why. Right. Isn't and, pain management probably huge in emergency? Huge. Huge, huge. That's so that analgesia, that 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 proper pain management is major. So knowing what to mix and how and when and and why, and it comes with time. You, you're not going to get it out of the gate in school. It just comes with time. But right. that that proper pain management is huge, 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 huge. So the students then who should not consider, well, obviously students keep open-minded, right? But in general, they should not consider emergency. What I'm hearing is if they really want to connect with patients and clients. That's probably not their specialty <laughs> choice. If long they, term, at least, yes. Long term. If they hate surgery, oh, probably yeah. not going to love it. <laughs> yep. What about personality? Like, what kind of student is it like, mm, this is not your fit? A student who, who's, like, they're so detailed. Like, they literally, they're, they're, when they come with a history, and their history, like, we're still talking about history 10 minutes later. I'm like, right. I thought we were just here for vomiting. And I literally asked them, so what are they here for again yeah again, I, I literally forgot what they're there for the ones that are going so detailed wow. like, an, like an intern is um, internists like go back for the entire history yeah. of the puppy until now and they break all that down and the diet yeah. what they're eating which is, which is all pertinent info we on emergency simply don't care right it's it's what they came in for yeah exactly so wow. things that want to like are very very detailed in that aspect because you got to be detailed for emergency but detailed as far as going past why they're here for this visit. Do you think part of that is just this training that they get as students to get a very thorough history? And it's like, wait a second, every specialty, every area can approach history in a different way. Yes, that's 100% it. Like they just have to retrain themselves that when I'm on the emergency and critical care service, right. we need this long convoluted history. And, and the there's an intern that's somewhere listening to this, like, yeah, that's the way I have to go back and do all your history for you. I'm sure they do. Like, I'm, I'm sure they do, but we literally just do not. We don't go that far back because we just, yeah. it's just too much. It's not enough time for it. Right, right. And that should be the, the other thing that someone who enjoys doing emergency is they should be good with time management. Yes. We thought about that earlier, but time management because yeah. you're going to have to balance and juggle and do multiple things at at the same time. Dr. Southern, I have really enjoyed learning more about emergency medicine from you. Yeah. We always ask our veterinarian, what advice do you have for pre-vet students? What mm -hmm. do they need to hear from you as they approach this journey? So students who are trying to get into vet school, this is the advice I always give. I say the same thing over and over and over and over because it's, it's, it's the best advice is find a great mentor. You just got to get a mentor who is willing to take you under their wing and help you get to where you want to be. And that's going to be the biggest thing. Like for, I always tell students this, like you doesn't, it doesn't have to be someone who who is like currently in vet med. It can be an older veterinarian. But right. just someone who's willing to help you matriculate through that process. Mentorship is, is major before you even get in school, in, in, into vet school. And if there's students listening to this podcast and you want a mentor, you need a mentor, look me up. <laughs> more than happy. More than happy. I have hundreds of students. That's <laughs> fine. Yes. It's, it's, it's easier now with Zoom and phones. And like you said, it doesn't have to be email. Like we can, right. we can communicate a million different ways. Dr. Southern, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Of course, thanks for having me. Do you have a shift tonight? Like when is your next shift? Uh, so I worked last night. I got off at six this morning. Oh. And I'm back on tonight at 6 p.m. again. Well, thanks for taking time out of that crazy <laughs> schedule. Emergency schedule sounds crazy, but like we talked about, for some people, they'll thrive and they'll really enjoy it. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon.
Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Just a reminder to our audience that season three is all taking place during social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. I'd like to welcome to our podcast, Dr. Andrea Gentry Apple, who is the coordinator for veterinary education and a clinical associate veterinarian at North Carolina A&T University, which is also a relief veterinarian. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, everybody, Alex, thanks for having me. So happy to have you. You know, guys, my audience who's listening, sometimes I just like to ask people on the show because they're great and I know the conversation's going to be great. And that's what's going to happen today with Dr. Gentry Apple. So there's so many things we could start with, but I I guess the first thing we usually start with with guests are how did you become a veterinarian? Starting with, start with undergrad. Okay. So... I'm gonna start a little bit before that just because it kind of leads into undergrad. Sure. Um, so unlike most people, I was not that run of the mill. I've wanted to be a veterinarian since I was three. Um, however, when I got into high school, I realized that I really, really liked science. My mother is a nurse. I thought people, and I still think people are gross. And I wanted to do something in health. And I went to North Carolina a and I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. So I said, I got to get out of the snow. And so I came further south, started majoring in animal science. And a and animal science program has always been very hands-on. And I got there, I got on the farm, and I loved it. I didn't want to leave. <laughs> I liked every bit of it. I was exhausted. I was tired. However, it was a challenge. And I loved it. And since then, I knew I wanted to go into something with animals, and that just kind of confirmed it. And so I went and did a couple different internships. Like the first summer after freshman year, I worked at my local humane society in Ohio, um, doing intake of animals into the facility. Um, And then the summer after my sophomore year, I actually did a program that no longer exists, which is so sad because it's such a great program called Vetward Bound at Michigan State. Pat Lowry. Oh, yes. Pat Lowry. Oh, my gosh. That woman is a genius. Yes. Um, But it was an awesome program that really shaped the way I looked at veterinary medicine um, and kind of propelled me from there. So in undergrad, of course, I was your generic pre-vet student. I was part of the pre-vet club. I was in manners. And for those that don't know what manners is, minorities in agriculture, natural resources, and related sciences to ours, not to ends. Ours, not to ends. <laughs> Um, so I was in manners. Uh, we had FFA at the time. I got involved in other organizations across campus. I was that run of the mill, very active undergraduate student that was aiming to have as high grades as she possibly could because I was told getting into that school was darn near impossible. Yeah. And I had to have a 4.0 in order to get it. We had a program with NC State called Food Animal Scholars, which was awesome, that I applied to and got in my junior year, and that sort of like kind of saved my seat. Um, I didn't go anywhere. I finished my undergraduate degree, (laughs) but I knew I was in vet school before I applied, as long as I met the qualifications. Yeah. So let's, I get a lot of students ask me about that. Mm -hmm. Explain to me how they know that when you're a junior in college, how do they know that a student's ready to come to vet school? So this program, one focuses, well, the Food Animal Scholars program focused on one students that are interested in food animal medicine. So if you wanted to do small animal or horses, this is not the program for you. So you clearly had to show a dedication to food animal with your experience, your background and essays and grades. So you pretty much had to show your academic prowess um, prior to the application. And I had that. I mean, I graduated from undergrad with a 3.8 GPA. You know, I was I was there academically. Um, the hardest part about those type of programs, especially this one, is your seat, although is guaranteed, so to speak, it can be revoked at any time. Ooh. So if you if I had a bad semester. Yeah gone. 
Well, I guess that's great because it makes a student accountable. Like just because they get the yes does not mean it's guaranteed. I like that. Definitely. So it makes you know that you ha you're still working for something. It's not, although they say, oh yeah, you're in, you haven't gotten an acceptance letter. You haven't gotten, you haven't received your seat with your deposit. Like you haven't done any of that. Okay. So it's kind of like, yes, you're in, but you're not really in. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> so you still have to, like, we had to do summer experiences. Like you had to have an internship related in food animal medicine and all of the programs that I've seen similar to this one are almost the exact same. It's okay. set up to say, yes, you're in, congratulations. However, you still have to submit grades to us every semester. You still have to meet with your mentor and advisor. And if you don't meet the qualifications, we're sorry. sorry yeah. But you knew what you were getting into when you signed up for the program. And then went to NC State for vet school. And I went to the home of the Wolf Pack <laughs> in Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> Um, and was a food, uh, we have focus areas at NC State, so I was a food animal scholar, and I was already a food animal track. Super active um, in diversity and inclusion efforts there, um, voice president for a time, did loved internal medicine, hated surgery. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I did well, I enjoyed it, then I graduated. It's pretty crazy. We could talk about imposter syndrome now, you know, once you oh. graduate. What do you, do you remember when you felt like a veterinarian? Was there a moment? Was there a time when you're like, okay, I feel confident in my skills? I had a moment. I did my large animal internship at Tuskegee um, College of Veterinary Medicine. And I remember I had a moment in my internship, which was weird, where I was like, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a case that I was really fighting with. Like it was, it was tearing up my brain. It was complicated. And all of a sudden I fell upon what it was. And I remember telling the clinician, I'm like, this is what it is. Like, this is the blood work. This is the test results. Like if you put all of these together, like it's a weird looking puzzle, but this is it. And they were like, no, it can't be it. Oh, and they came back. They came back the next day and he was like, I don't want to tell you that you're right when you're right. <laughs> and I'm like, that's fine. Because I actually, it, it felt like, okay, I actually can do this. Because imposter syndrome, a lot of times we talk about it once you get the veterinary degree. However, imposter syndrome starts so much earlier than that. Okay. I had it in vet school, not so much in undergrad, but in vet school, it definitely reared its ugly head when I was there. And then, you know, just being a veterinarian in general, it rears its head. And then once you finally get comfortable and then you have to switch, you know, in careers, because my careers are a little bit different than most. Like when I have the switch in careers, you know, it yeah. rears its head every time you move. Yeah, for sure. And that would be, that would be challenging because when do you ever feel settled? You don't. <laughs> you can. So I'm not saying that you can't feel settled in the profession. However, when I feel settled, I get bored mm -hmm. because it's no longer a challenge. And that's why I went into large animal medicine because I felt, you know, mostly just doing small animal medicine by itself, I would get complacent and I would get bored. And then I would end up getting bit. And I just, I just, that me being bit is not, I mean, no one wants to get bit. However, I learned very early on, I'd rather get kicked than bit any day out of the week. And I knew if I got bored with large animal, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to get bit. I could die, which is very drastic. Right. Very drastic. Yeah. However, if I'm working on a bull that could be, you know, 1,800 pounds, I can't get bored, no. <laughs> you know, with 1800 pounds, no. you know, I have to be mindful of where I am and you know what I'm doing and, or I could lose, you know, I could break my finger, you know, there's some serious bodily injury that can be ensued. And so that was a challenge for me, particularly being a female and large animal was a challenge because all of my large animal mentors are all males. Yeah. That's a whole nother culture in large animal. 
whole nother culture. And it's still, it's crazy. Although it's changing, it's still crazy. Since we're talking about culture, yeah. uh, can you talk about, so you did a full year internship at Tuskegee? Yep, full year. Okay, yeah. so then let's break this down. So undergrad was at A&T, which is an HBCU. Yep. It Med is. school was at North Carolina State, which is a PWI, so a predominantly it is. institution. And then your internship was at, was at Tuskegee, which is an HBCU. Yep. Talk to me about differences that you saw in culture. So students, just to, again to clarify if you're listening, so um, a, pred a predominantly white institution means a school where most of the students are white. That's the majority. And then there's HBCUs, which is a historically black college and university. So, so you have minority serving institutions that get you. thrown in there too. Yeah. Yep. So talk to me about the differences that you noticed in culture, your experience. What was that like going from different schools and <laughs> settings? So I grew up, like I said, in Columbus, Ohio. And when I went to North Carolina a and it was a culture shock because the high school that I went to was majorly white. And it was fine. Like we didn't have anything major, no major issues. But I went to an HBCU and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I had actually never been around that many, you know, people of color at one time. And I was I, imposter syndrome of, am I black enough to be here? Which is crazy to think and say out loud. Yes. However, was was very real. Um, got comfortable in that setting, found my niche, joined a sorority, all that great stuff. And then I went to NC State. Culture shock. <laughs> because I went from being around, you know, hundreds of people that look like me and or other, you know, persons of color to going into a vet school where there were four African-American female in the class I was one of them. Uh -huh. And so in vet school, it was difficult because I stuck out more than I wanted to. Mm. And I was, you know, a food animal person. So I was the only person of color in the food animal side of things. Right. Um, and, and I was working on diversity issues at, you know, North Carolina State. So I was already, oh, this is the diversity chick who's kind of yeah. like, I don't want to be forcing diversity down everybody's throats. But, you know, constantly talking about, you know, why it's important. I was diversity chair for my class. Like, it was all of the stereotypical roles that I was supposed to play. Um, and then, to be honest, I went back to when I went to Tuskegee. I had some professors that asked, why are you going to Tuskegee? I was culturally exhausted. What culturally exhausted looked like? So I made that word up. I don't think that word I up. I'm into it actually. though. I know what you mean when you say it, but I want to hear what it means to you. Uh, I don't think that, you know, that, that phrase actually exists, but we're going to coin it here, yeah. here and now. Culturally exhausted. Yeah. Um, I was tired of being the only one. I was tired of proving that I knew what I knew. And I was just tired of being the, like, I mean, to be honest, the only one. Mm -hmm. You know, I was food animal focused. Out of the group of us, I was the only minority. And not to say that the group wasn't welcoming, they were, but there was always, it was always something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just some of it was my own fault, I will admit, because it was some of it was some of the biases that I was bringing on myself. Mm -hmm imposter syndromes and everything else uh however it just i was i was tired of talking about diversity i was tired of having to be you know the one to answer questions to make sure that my professors realized that i was still there that you know i knew the answer too that i was smarter than what you thought i was uh i just got tired yeah it sounds like part of it. I wanted to take off the cultural responsibility and just focus on my education. Say, I mean, education by itself is is exhausting. Yeah, and so when, especially for a person of color in veterinary medicine and going into vet schools, it's not just the educational piece. And some of it is what we bring upon ourselves. Like for me, I felt the cultural responsibility to talk about diversity and to make sure everyone knew it was important and to be that outward voice. And that was a responsibility that I took on to myself because there were other students in my class that said, you know what, I'm here for an education, that's it. Yes, it's important and I'll support you, but I'm not going to, you know, be the leader in this effort. And yeah. I just couldn't sit there and do that. And yeah. that's, you know, part of the reason why I got burnout and Tuskegee is a giant family. 
you know, everyone knows everybody who's graduated from Tuskegee, it seems like, yeah. and it reminded me of my undergrad experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about the cultural aspects, the diversity aspects. I could just focus on the educational piece sure. and, not, and nothing else. Yeah. Let's shift into one of your roles, which is mentoring, advising, and teaching students. You teach students. Both you and I mentor students, right? And mm -hmm. we get the students who are like, I want to go to this school because they're a top five school. Okay, so y'all can't see it because we're on a podcast, but Dr. Yeah, Ben Castle, rolling. we're rolling our eyes. A school being top, and I don't want to disparage top 10 schools because like UF and NC State are both top 10 schools. Yeah, so oh, definitely. obviously great, but y'all don't we don't really focus on why they're ranked in that way. And it's based on like peer review. It's based on research dollars. So it's really important that you find the school where you're going to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm, definitely. 120%. And every time I hear a student say, well, I want to go to, you know, the number one vet school in the country. I, I laugh to myself and laugh to myself, not in front of the students because they're very serious normally when they say sure. this. Yes. However, I'm laughing to myself because it doesn't matter if you get a degree from the number one school no. or I think or 30 schools, 32 schools. I don't even know how many schools we have at this point because they keep popping up. Right. However, right. or the 32nd school or the 30th. It doesn't school, matter. It's the exact same degree. Same degree. Except for if you go to U of Penn and you get a VMD and not a DVM, that is the only difference. Right. <laughs> right. A lot of times there's a meme and I'll have to share it with you. It's this cat inside of this cat carrier, but they've taken the box off of top, mm -hmm. taking the top off yeah. and the cat's just still sitting there, but like the cage door is still in front of it. Uh -huh. And it's like, sometimes the solution just is, is uh -huh. not in front of you. It's it maybe above you or to the oh, side. And so, so many times we get stuck yes. in a tunnel vision of, I have to go here or I have to do this or right. I have to have that. Yeah. And I say, well, there's, you know, there's more than one way to get into vet school. There is a, there's not a gold standard for no. veterinary application. Like that doesn't, that doesn't exist. Right. Exactly. It's how you highlight yourself and how you talk about yourself that really is going to make that stand out to that admissions committee. Yep. And so many students were saying, well, I got to go to the top school because that's going to look better on future applications or they just want the name. Right. Like you just want to be able to say, you know, I'm Dr. Gentry Apple and I graduated from NC State. Nobody cares. No, not a single one. Nobody cares. And not a single one. It's, I, I don't think I really understood that until my late 20s and now I'm in my 30s. But if you had told me when I was 19 years old that name brands, those kinds of things don't matter, I couldn't have heard you say it. But now I know it's true. And I'll tell you guys, I, I advise literally thousands of students and I've never had a student come back to me after they go to another vet school and they're like, I hated it. I should have gone to my favorite school. The ones, they're just glad they got the degree. Mm -hmm. So just okay. get the degree. Don't worry about all of the bells and whistles. Those things don't matter. You know what's the only thing I would look at if I was a vet student? Mm -hmm. Tuition. That's the only thing I would be looking at because that does make a difference. So if oh. you're paying some of the different, the differences between the least expensive schools and the most expensive school is more than $200,000 difference. It's insane. It's insane. So that's something, I, if it were me and I were a vet student, I would put off going to vet school two or three years until I got a better tuition and maybe location. Like you could not pay me to go to some of the Northern schools cause I don't do snow anymore. So <laughs> like, I was, I would have been like you done with the snow. Those are the only two things because even culture, like you said, culture depends on the students that are there. Yep. And yes, leadership makes a huge difference. But if you find a nice group of friends, if the rest of your class is a hot mess, that's okay. Yep. As long as you have some people. Oh yeah, definitely. So you mentioned your love of large animals and food animals specifically. Yeah. I hear mostly from small, like, so being a food animal and a, and a woman, uh, a female <laughs> food animal veterinarian makes me a minority. And I, so I often hear from small animal people, why do you love the food animals? Like, what is it about food animal medicine that you love? 
for me, it's a challenge. Um, and also it's the relationships I'm able to build with farmers. So when I was down in Tuskegee, there was a project called the West Alabama Herd Health Project, which I loved. So West, the Western part of Alabama um, is lacking in veterinary services for particularly a lot of minority farmers. And so, but through this project, we would go out to the Western part of the state, because it's about three hours from the East to the West. Um, and we would go out and spend two days and just hit pretty much farms that extension agents would find for us. And we'd vaccinate, deworm, preg check, castrate, and they were very long days. However, it was fun. I enjoyed the challenge. Um, I'm all, my head is about as hard as concrete. So being told that I can't do something tells me that I can do something. I hear, I, I hear the opposite in my head. So having the challenge of an animal that is larger than me really just, you know, challenged me to want to learn how to be able to safely manipulate these animals for their overall health and my overall well-being. Um, but I love the relationship with the farmers. I love the fact that I'm helping with a livelihood because a lot of these farmers get a bad rap a lot of times because they have animals and how could you raise animals for food production? Like that's so cruel and so mean. But these farmers actually put a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of passion into raising quality products mm -hmm. for us to be able to eat. Because I mean, as we know, the United States, we're not just raising food for the United States, we're raising food for the world. Yeah. <laughs> so being able to impact that is something that always drove home for me, um, as well as ruminants in general, particularly, you know, sheep, goats, and cattle, are their medicine's just different. And I liked it. Um, and I still love it and still enjoy it. And I, like I said, the farmers are pretty much the, the strongest piece to that. Um, I do, I still do large or small animal stuff now more so than anything else, because I ended up messing up my rotator cuff palpating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, ow. So, they don't talk about the injuries in large animal, but I messed up a rotator cuff while palpating. Nothing serious or major, however, and I still can palpate and I still do palpate. However, I kind of said, hmm, let me think about this longevity wise. Yeah. Let me you know, go back and make sure I can still brush up and vaccinate some cats and dogs every once in a while because that's going to be a little bit more long term. And do those vet clinics just call you up and say, hey, we need you this weekend? Like, what does that look like? So in relief practice is what I do. I actually do relief pretty much is for a corporate practice. And so I pretty much pick my schedule, which I absolutely love. Yeah. <laughs> And tell them, hey, I'm available on these days. Could you use me? And they're like, yeah, definitely. We'll use you for all of these days. So it's it's one of those things where I get the best of both worlds. So everyone's like, well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I beg to differ when it comes to my career, because I definitely feel as though I have my cake and I can eat it at the same time. Yeah. Let's break that down for yeah. pre vets, vet students. So how do you like, how do you manage your time? How do you wear different hats? How do you feel settled or comfortable in each role from being an administrator for mentoring vet students, pre-vet mm -hmm. students, for being the lecturer and teacher, the professor, the, you know, veterinarian? Like, how, how does that work in your life? And what advice do you have for students who are also trying to manage a lot of hats? So with managing hats, we have to understand there's no such thing as giving 120%. Like everyone's like, oh, I can get, I'm getting over 100%. There's no such thing. <laughs> there's, you only can give 100% at any given time. I've also had to realize that multitasking isn't effective. Yeah. And I learned that the hard way. Oh. <laughs> so. I've learned to recognize what I need to do to be happy. I hear so many veterinarians and I have classmates that are burnt out because they've been in practice for the past five years. And I've heard vets discourage vet students and pre-vet students from going into the profession, which to me is insane, but it's just because they've gotten stuck. And yeah. so for me, I found a niche. So I'm like, okay, I enjoy teaching, although I will say that my students can drive me absolutely insane sometimes. And I'm yep. sure, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's definitely reciprocated. I'm sure I absolutely. drive them crazy. Yep, absolutely. Just, just as much. Um, however, 
I found this niche of I can teach and mentor pre-vet students and help them with their career paths. However, when I'm feeling overwhelmed in that scenario, I'm not being as effective as I'd like to be, which means I need to take a step back. Yes. <laughs> because I'm no longer understanding where the student is coming from. And that's yes. when I'm able to go into practice. Yes. So I manage my time effectively. I make sure that, you know, my main job is at North Carolina a &T. They are the ones that are, you know, paying me to be that professor and mentor, you know, 12 months a year, five days a week, you know, and I make sure those responsibilities are all taken care of. And so a lot of my relief and practice work may come on the weekends. However, I'm also a wife <laughs> and I also have a family. And so I have to be able to balance that as well. And so that comes with communication. Mm. You know, we also have friends, like my friends want to see me. Yes. So I'm not necessarily going in to burn myself out. I'm going in just to say, all right, this is a break from it all. I'm really good at finding a balance. Like I have no problem saying I can't and I have to take a break. So I'm, I build that into my schedule. I know if I'm doing five, if I'm meeting with five students in a row, I'm going to need a break after that. And I build it in. I meet a lot of veterinary students and veterinarians and pre-vet students who aren't, who feel like they can't say no and aren't comfortable building in that break. And like mm -hmm. you said, everybody's different. So I'm wondering and you meet with a lot of students too, like what can we tell those students? Of course we can tell them till we're blue in the face, like you have to do this if you wanna be successful. Yeah. But what, what are some things we, some actual strategies we could give them to do it? So one that I had in vet school is I always had a day off. So my, I was, and that's a Tibet student is like, wait, what? a day right. off. Right. Um, so as we know, vet school is Monday through Friday, classes, labs, etc. But Friday afternoon and Friday night was mine. Okay. I didn't pick up a book, note, lecture. <laughs> um, I didn't pick up anything Friday at all. So when I came home from school, it was drop my book bag in my room or drop my bag in my room. I'd go to dinner, hang out with friends. If we wanted to go out and have a good time, we'd go do that. Or if I just wanted to lay in my bed with popcorn and M&Ms, I was going to do that. And that was just kind of like my break period. And for a lot of times with weeks where I was extremely overwhelmed, in my mind is I just have to get to Friday. Right. Something to look forward to. Because if you think that trying to push through, now pushing through does come in and is helpful in certain situations. Sure. Okay. Um, however, if you have an opportunity to take a break, take it. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling outrageous stressed, if you feel like you're on a break of a nervous breakdown, you are not doing yourself a, fa a favor. You are not doing anyone else a favor. You are not doing your grades a favor by pushing through. Right. Many times we've been taught to cram, 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 cram. It doesn't work long term. I won't say it doesn't work because we've all crammed for that test. We've all right. crammed for the quiz. We've all, you know, crammed a paper in one night. We've all done it and we've gotten good grades. However, long term, it does not work. Mm -hmm. And if you can find a strategy now as a veterinary student or as a pre-vet student for a schedule that works for you, that you can take into veterinary program or into your professional program now, mm -hmm. you will be a thousand times better than so many veterinarians that are dealing with burnout because right. they can't say no. Right. And so, and learning how to say no will set you free. I, I admit I have an issue with saying no, particularly when it comes to students. However, I manage that time to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to do this. However, where is it going to fit? Yeah. When can I take the time? But you've got to learn how to handle all of that now. And then have your days. Have, whether I used to have like an hour after school, after vet school, you know, every day where either I would cook or I would go to the grocery store, I would go work out, I may go to the pool for an hour. You know, it just, it was a time for him. We come down off of classes before I go into study mode. <laughs> Absolutely. Working and waiting. Yes. You have to. You have to. 
I actually used to use gummy bears like on my notes. So like if I would go and read stuff and then I get to a gummy bear, that was a break. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's so fun. But then there was also those times during finals where it was like, screw the gummy bear method. I'm just going to eat all of the gummy bears because <laughs> I just have to get to the end of this week for finals because vet school finals are not for the lighthearted. Right. Sometimes it's about survival. And mm -hmm. anytime we can build in that thriving gummy bear no time, we should. I think that's so fun that you did gummy bears. That's really fun. Um, okay. Well, pre-vet students, I feel like we've talked about a lot about understanding different pathways to veterinary medicine, how to manage those pathways once you take on like three of them, like Dr. Gentry Apple has. We've talked about culture, imposter syndrome. We've talked about, you know, small animals, large animals. We've talked about a lot of things. I'm really glad you gave them that tip about, you know, working in waves, taking breaks, um, not pushing, 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 because it's not sustainable. So thank you for your wisdom and advice and time today, Dr. Gentry Apple. Of course. I, I mean, the thing is, like, especially in this profession, you know, we all have to understand that we're a lifelong learner. I'm still learning. <laughs> Just like I know, Alex, you're still learning. Like we're all still learning how to navigate this crazy thing we call life and whatever profession you decide to go into, but how we have to figure out how to survive it. Like we, we, it's unfortunate that you get into a profession and then almost dread the profession. And that's what I'm really trying to get students to understand is you don't have to dread the profession. Like you have to set your boundaries, find your niche, figure out what works for you. And what works for you isn't gonna work for me. What works for me is not gonna work for you. And you just have to find that ground and be able to make it your own. Veterinary medicine is way too broad and too diverse in order for you to feel stuck. There's always another avenue. There's always another opportunity that we all can take advantage of. Amen. 100% agree. <laughs> well, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder for our listeners that during season three, we are recording these during social distancing, so the audio might be a little bit different. Today, my guest is Dr. Kelly Harrison. She is a clinical assistant professor of shelter med and surgery, and she works in VCOP. And we're gonna let everyone know what VCOP is today, but before we get started, Dr. Harrison, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to be here with you today. I am excited too, because I feel like shelter med has blown up in the past couple of years, and we could probably talk about shelter med for an entire series of podcasts. But before we get into that, can you tell us where did you get your bachelor's degree? Sure. Uh, well, I got my bachelor's degree right here at the University of Florida. And what was your major? I did a bachelor's in animal science, and then I actually went on to do a master's of science. Um, right here at the College of Veterinary Medicine as well. Tell me why you, I, do, am I correct in assuming you wanted to be a veterinarian while you were getting your undergrad? That's correct, yes. So then why the master's before vet school? Great question. Well, um, as you probably know, and in, in many of the, the students listening, if they're pre-vet, um, vet school's competitive. And um, I applied after undergrad and I didn't have quite the undergrad grades that were considered competitive. And so I wanted to, um, you know, improve my application and, and be more competitive. What was your master's concentration? I did a master's of science in veterinary medical science, and I did a two and a half year research project working with the Operation Catnip program and trying to develop a new anesthetic protocol to be used specifically in that clinic. Oh, that's awesome. I like that it, you stuck with our college and vet med and got to make your master's around that. A lot of students think that they you know, should get a master's to help boost their GPA and they never know what to do their master's in. Some students are anti-masters because they don't really know what it means, but knowing that you could do a master's in something that you're fascinated with and your future career is a great option for pre-vet students. 
Absolutely. It was, I felt a tremendous advantage for me my first year in vet school. Um, one, I had been kind of affiliated at the vet school for, again, two to two and a half years. So I met a lot of people. I had great mentorship going into my very first day of vet school. And a lot of the coursework that I took as a graduate student paralleled really nicely with the veterinary curriculum. So it was, I felt a little bit ahead in that um, while undergrad certainly prepares you for vet school, this master's for me was a really nice transition. Yeah, so I hear you saying that there were a lot of benefits to getting the master's. Can you speak to the students who are like, no, I have to get in right away. I don't wanna take time off. Two and a half years sounds like a lifetime. What would you tell those students? Yep, I was that way too. And, um, you know, it's everyone sort of has their tunnel vision on how this should go, right? We finish our, our undergraduate degree and then we got to get into vet school. And then after vet school, we got to do X, Y, and Z, right? We all have it mapped out. And the reality is, and that's, you know, that's kind of life. You map it out one way and it never goes exactly to plan. But I think in the end for me, this was, if I had to do it again, I would choose this way because my transition to vet school was so much easier and I adjusted so much easier. Okay, so everyone heard that right here, <laughs> taking time to get a master's degree or even work. Time off is not a bad thing, can help with your transition. You can meet a lot of great peers, mentors. It's a good move. It doesn't have to be your move, but it's a great option. Okay. So Dr. Harrison, tell me what does VCOP stand for? Sure. So VCOP, as we are affectionately known as, actually stands for the Veterinary Community Outreach Program. Your concentration is shelter medicine, correct? Correct. All of the clients and all of our patients come from local animal shelters or local rescue organizations. So how is VCOP different than working in a shelter? Great question. So VCOP is a unique entity here at the College of Veterinary Medicine, and we have a lot of moving parts as a program. So as I mentioned, our clients are local shelters, and we're often partnering with county organizations. And then we also work with local rescue organizations, which are a little bit different and that they're not run by the county, but they're typ typically private organizations or nonprofits that um, you might have seen at PetSmart on the weekends pre-COVID. Those are most of our groups that do our, their adoptions there. And so we have two profiles of patients. We serve um, mostly dogs and cats in those shelters. And part of our, our program, probably our most popular part of our program is, is getting hands-on training for students and spay-neuter um, surgical training. We also actually take students and we visit these shelters and we visit our partners and we help them provide better care for animals in their shelter or under their care. And so that can be everything from helping them choose which vaccines would be most appropriate or if they're having trouble with um, specific disease outbreaks, we can help them kind of identify root causes and come up with a, an action plan. So it's all sort of one big group that works together on many different levels to get animals out of a shelter system, get them um, healthy and ready for adoption, including spay neuter surgery that are performed all by the, the students on our rotation, and then ultimately get them adopted and into a, into a loving home for forever, hopefully. So before we talk about more like what is shelter medicine, we've talked about VCOP. It's a two week rotation. My understanding is that there are certain things the students do on each day. So can you walk me through the week of a VCOP student on rotation? Typically what our first day looks like is a welcome to VCOP and some surgery demos. So we kind of start planning on day one that we're gonna throw our students into surgery on day two. And so many of the students that come to us have never had any type of surgical training and they've, they've done a very minimal training. Um, there is some training in the sophomore year. We have videos um, that are instructional that we have our students watch. We talk about those things and then we actually go into surgery and we do a full day of our doctors doing surgeries 
right in front of the students, asking questions, teaching techniques, showing different ways of doing things. So that's day one. So for us, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are gonna be surgery days, both weeks. And then um, our first Friday and our second Monday of the rotation, we actually take our students on site to our shelter partners. And so what students are able to see are different challenges and also some similarities between shelters that are in different parts of Florida. And they're all surrounding counties. We also have a working relationship with Alachua County, which is our, our home shelter. And there are some significant differences between the partners that we have in BCOP and our county shelter, and also um, some, some big similarities. And so we talk about that and we try to compare and contrast. And depending on where you are, um, you might have to approach things a little bit differently. We first go and see them in their shelter setting. And that's really valuable because if you, if you compare being in general practice, um, sometimes it can be difficult to work through why an animal is sick or doesn't feel well or is not thriving if you're not in their environment. And so we take students to their environment and we identify those, those um, problems and we try to fix them. So many great opportunities for students because right, we said surgery, so they are doing surgeries. I've heard, I heard one student say, I mean, Dr. Cynthia Kathir, who's been on our podcast, who is like surgery queen, um, yes. <laughs> we got a ton of surgeries in BCOP. Um, Y'all do allow that you allow the students to, to do a lot, so they get that surgical experience. They also get I, I kind of want to call it an opportunity to see health disparities. So if we're taking them physically to mm -hmm. the shelters, Dr. Kyle Donnelly was on the podcast, and we were talking about ZooMed and how there's kind of like this colonization issue where veterinarians or doctors kind of drop into an area they do something and then they leave, but they don't really learn what that area is like. And so for y'all to take the students to the shelters to mm -hmm. see what those animals experience, that's mm -hmm. a great opportunity for the students to approach that case differently. Absolutely, and that's a big focus of us in VCOP and that we wanna make this a comprehensive experience. We're certainly known for um, the hands-on training and our, our surgery training and the students involvement. Our students, when they're on our rotation, they are the only surgeon. They are, they are scrubbed in on their patient and we are there to help them. But we also try to tie in, why is there such a need for spay neuter and what's happening in our community? And we try to expose them and you know kind of open their eyes to some real world challenges that are happening right here in Alachua County or in our neighboring counties. It can be a very eye-opening experience to go to a shelter that's 30 minutes away from one of the biggest shelter medicine programs in the country and see significant challenges. And um, without taking them there, it's hard to describe that. Can you go ahead and tell me maybe top three to five issues that we see in shelters that you don't see with an animal that you've just owned from like start to finish? So what are the things that really are hard for shelters? What are their specific issues? Sure. I mean, I think one that can be very overwhelming for students on their first visit that if they haven't stepped foot in a shelter before, they don't know a lot about shelter medicine. The one thing that can kind of hit you right when you walk in the door is the sheer number of animals that are in shelters, right? So we have as a country significant issue with overpopulation. So there's too many animals and not enough homes. Shelters are innately a stressful place. There's lots of animals, there are lots of scary noises, there are lots of scary smells, and there are lots of people that these animals aren't accustomed to. And so we see um, a fair amount of um, common diseases. We walk our students through in many of our visits, we never know what we're gonna see in our shelters. So we can, we can make some guesses and there's certainly things that we see routinely. Um, we have, most of our shelters have, they struggle with upper respiratory infections in cats. And so we spend a lot of time on that. And we know that there's a relationship between stress and upper respiratory infections in cats. And so cats and shelters are super stressed. And often, you know, shelters have high turnover of staff and they don't have enough staff and they have a ton of animals. And so it's really, um, it's really a challenge for them to tackle some of these big ticket items that we see commonly. We see a lot of behavior issues in shelters as well. And so that's also multifactorial. I 
I like to ask veterinarians, what kind of personality do you think makes a shelter med vet? You have to be compassionate. And I think anybody wants to be a veterinarian. That's, that's kind of innate. But I think you have to have compassion and you have to, you have to be sort of creative and almost an out of the box kind of thinker. Um, one of the things I really like to do on our rotation is challenge students to come up with plans for animals when we're in our shelters and or I show them our budget. So in contrast to being in general practice or maybe even being at our teaching hospital, you have client owned animals coming in and they're gonna have variability when it comes to finances, but there's usually some degree of finances attached um, that you can make, there's some room to make some decisions and you're gonna prioritize that. Often when we're in shelters, we don't have very many dollars attached to what we're trying to do. And so we have to kind of cater our plan and cater our choices to, to the animal in front of us and to our situation around. And so one of my favorite things to do, and I'm gonna give this away if you guys are ever on clinics with me, but we'll go into our shelters and I'll say, here we have a sick animal, what do you wanna do? And most students will respond with, I wanna do a CBC chem, which is full blood work. I wanna do chest x-rays. I wanna do abdominal ultrasound. I want an MRI. And I say, look around. I say, do you see any of those here? So what can we do right now for this patient with our tackle box full of, you know, kind of basic supplies? And our goal is to provide high quality care in a very resource limited environment. Wow, such a good experience for veterinary students and pre-vets what I would challenge you to do before you get to vet school and have opportunities like this. Maybe volunteer or get paid experience in different types of clinics so you can already start to have different training experiences, different opportunities to think about cases differently because if you spend all of your time in one location, you're really only learning how that location does things. And when our students get to go into these different shelters experience different levels of income for every situation. They get to think differently. And that's, that's, that's exactly what you want to put in your toolbox is different options. Dr. Harrison, we always ask our guests to provide some advice for pre-vet students. So what advice do you have for our audience? If you are determined to become a veterinarian, to never lose sight of that, regardless of how your first application goes or your first interview goes, or maybe even the second, or maybe even the third, because we've all been there. <laughs> Don't get discouraged, stay on track, have a positive attitude. And if your path changes, like it probably will, mine certainly did. And looking back, I realized I am where I am today because of those changes in my path. And I know how valuable those changes were. And was it my preferred plan? No. Did I want to get into vet school in the first try? Yeah, but I didn't. And so my, my plan changed, but I maintained a good attitude and I felt like there was a purpose for that. And there definitely was. I just encourage you to not get discouraged if your, your pathway changes and that's okay. And I would um, welcome it if I were you. <laughs> Ooh, great, great advice. Keep a positive attitude, everybody. Keep an open mind. Be willing to move with the change because it might end up landing you your dream job. I want to thank Dr. Harrison for being on the podcast today. And I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Prevet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Just a reminder to our audience that for season three, we are recording everything during social distance time, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is Dr. Brittany Southern. She is a lab animal veterinarian. And Dr. Southern, we're so excited to have you because we need to talk about what lab animal medicine is. Welcome to the show. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So we always like to start with how did your path to vet med go? So usually I like to start with undergrad. So can you tell me where you got your undergraduate degree? What was it in? And then what were the next steps in your training? 
Yeah, so I went, I'm from North Carolina. So for undergrad, I went to the University of North Carolina. Um, and UNC actually did not have a pre-veterinary track. Um, so I ended up picking a topic that I liked. So I picked psychology because I loved psychology in high school. I knew I wanted to be a vet and I knew I was gonna have to get those pre-vet courses in. Um, so I picked psychology as my major um, and I made sure to get all of those sciences in on the side. Um, and then when I finished undergrad, I ended up still having a few sciences that I needed to do. Um, and so I kind of was given the opportunity to finish those sciences and do some veterinary work. And so I ended up staying at UNC and I worked there um, for almost a year. And I actually worked with their lab animal department. Um, and it was one of those scenarios where you just Google animal work um, on campus and that's what popped up and I just wanted to find an animal job um, and it worked out well. So I was able to work with veterinarians and at the time I had no idea what lab animal was. Um, and so when I got there, I learned a lot. Um, I ended up falling in love with it. I was working with a resident and, and she took me under her wing um, she got me involved with her research project and I made some great connections with the lab animal vets that were there. Um, and then at the time, after I finished my sciences, I went ahead and applied to vet schools. Um, and that process was interesting. Um, applying to vet school definitely takes a lot of work and dedication and it's important to visit schools, I would say, um, to figure out where you want to go, where you're going to fit in well. And for me, I visited a few schools. And when I visited Tuskegee, I fell in love and I knew that's the only place I wanted to go. Um, but I had a great four years. I loved it. I made some amazing friends. I met my husband. Um, and so we, I had a great time in vet school. I learned a lot. Um, and I knew that I wanted to learn more about lab animal medicine while I was in school. And thankfully, Tuskegee does a great job at um, exposing students to different fields in veterinary medicine and so I got a lot of um, feedback about lab animal medicine and I met a lot of lab animal vets and I did a lot on my own to learn more um, and so I spent my summers in lab animal facilities um, I even did a research project one summer and so I, I you know I, I knew I wanted to do lab animal um, I didn't completely close myself in a box. You know, I was still open to hearing about the other fields in veterinary medicine, um, but I knew that that was my interest. And so I, I did try to spend my free time focused in um, and getting opportunities in that specialty. And then when I got to my fourth year of vet school, I said, yes, this is what I want to do. I want to specialize. Let me apply for, you know, lab animal training. Um, and I was heartbroken because I didn't get a position. Um, and so then I kind of had to go to plan B and figure out what to do next. And thankfully, I, one of my experiences during fourth year was at a specialty hospital in Houston, Texas. Um, and they actually reached out to me and said, hey, do you wanna do a small animal rotating internship? Um, and so I said, absolutely, I wanna do more training and you know, know it's not in lab animal but I want to get more experience and this will be a great next step in my career. And so I did that. So I, I did a rotating small animal internship um, and then surprise surprise during my internship I ended up falling in love with emergency medicine. And so you know in the back of my head I said I, I still want to do lab animal but at the time you know I I really enjoyed working in emergency. I enjoyed working with sick animals and making them better and working with the clients. Um, and so that's what I did. I spent the next two years actually working in small animal emergency. Um, and I did a little bit of side gigs as well. And so I worked in a general practice for a little bit. And then I got to a point where I was tired. Uh, working in emergencies requires a lot of hours or you work a lot of holidays and nights. Um, and so I started to get burnt out. Um, and so then I was ready. I was really ready to go back to lab animal. Um, and so at that point, I applied. Um, 
And lab animal is special because it is one of those specialties in veterinary medicine that does not require you to have an internship. So in veterinary medicine, there's lots of different fields, just like in human medicine, you have medicine, surgery, dermatology, a lot of those clinical fields, you have to have an internship before you do a residency. Lab animal, you don't. Um, I did, you know, I had that clinical experience. And so I think that helped me a little bit because it, it gave me an edge up. Um, and so I was able to secure a residency um, and I went, ended up going back to North Carolina. I'm here in Florida because of my husband. Um, and so coming out here, I've tried to, of course, tried to find a job in my field within lab animal medicine. Um, and at the time I was able to secure a job that it's not a clinical job, but it's a job where I'm helping with the regulatory oversight. So I'm still getting to work with researchers and people that are involved with lab animal. And so that's what I'm doing now. Did you feel like it's ironic that you were a psych <laughs> major, but you also love lab animal medicine? Because to me, when I think psych majors, I think lab animals because we yeah. do a lot of behavior analysis on animals and uh, we, we're just always involved with, with lab animals. So I think that's interesting that those two ended up coming together full circle. I agree. It is really interesting because there are a ton of researchers who do behavioral studies and they, you know, they study how the brain works and how um, people think about things and depression and addiction and things like that. So it is interesting. I've never thought about it that way, but it absolutely is. Okay, so go ahead and break down what does lab animal medicine even mean? How is it different from general practice? Yeah, that's a great question. So lab animal medicine is very different than general practice. So when I tell people I'm a veterinarian, I tell them that my responsibility is to take care of animals that are used in research. Uh, because we know that animal research occurs and people have differing opinions about it. You know, some people support it, some people do not. Um, but at this moment in time, we still need animals in research and my job as a lab animal vet is to protect those animals. So while they are used in research, while they're used on studies, my job is to make sure they have the best life possible. Um, and in addition to that, I get to help educate people on why it's important to protect these animals. You know, scientists, they, they're worried about their science, which is what they should do. You know, they are changing the world. They're making new medications and um, solving different mysteries. And so that's what they're focused on. And so my job is to remind them that, hey, this is an animal, we still have to take care of it. And it's important for this animal to remain healthy because if it's unhealthy, that could affect your science and it could actually affect your, your study and the results that you're looking for. Um, and so there are national regulations when it comes to protecting animals. And so my job is to be familiar with those regulations and know when what rule applies to what. Um, you know, we don't expect the researchers to know that. And so that's something that's really key for us. And so that is kind of one hat that I'll put on throughout the day. Um, you know, my regulatory hat where I have to know, you know, okay, you're working with a rabbit, what pertains to a rabbit, you know, what national rules apply. Um, and then I also get to take off my regulatory hat and I can just be a clinician. So I can be that veterinarian that you think of. And so if I have a sick dog or a sick cat or a sick mouse or pig, um, I get to take care of that animal. Obviously, as I explained with my background, I enjoy clinical medicine. Um, and so I'm still able to do that with working with mice and rabbits and birds and horses and cows and every species. <laughs> um, so I still get to do that. And then I get to work with a ton of species because literally any animal you could think of people are using them for research. Um, and so I love that part about it. You know, every day is different. Um, I love working with mice and rodents and, you know, we get attached to our animals just like people get attached to their pets. And so the people that I work with are amazing. Um, you know, the technicians, they love their animals and my colleagues love, love the animals that we work with and we get attached to them as well. And so our job is to provide them the best life that they can every day. 
I was going to ask you, but you, you kind of told us what kind of animals you work with. And unfortunately, I'm embarrassed to say that when I think lab animal, I often think rats and rodents. So that's so cool that lab animal means you can work with all kinds of species and you have to know a lot about everything. Do we feel like students who are interested in lab animal can go anywhere and get the exposure in some way through research or externships? I would say absolutely. I think you should go wherever, you should go to the vet school that's going to make you feel comfortable. And it is always good to think about exposure. And I would hope that most veterinary schools are teaching students and able to expose them to a variety of fields. Um, I know that a lot of people think veterinary medicine is just dog and cat medicine or horse and cow and goats and sheep medicine and it but it's not there's so much more that you can do i mean you don't even have to touch an animal to be a veterinarian so there's a, a lot of things that you can do in vet med and i think if you're a student who says you know i like exotics you know where can i go to do exotics i mean you can go anywhere um, and you'll have somebody in exotics there and that person you know can be your mentor and you can ask them where should I go to get more exotic experience? Or, you know, if I can't do that here, what are some good places to go? Um, and so really making connections and finding a mentor, finding somebody that you can hold on to is so, so important and so key. We've alluded to lab animal medicine is important, right? Because we need animals to answer some scientific problems. Can you give me a couple of broad examples of when using animals have helped using animals in research have helped humans? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that probably most people know someone that has diabetes or they have diabetes themselves and animals were absolutely used to help treat diabetes. So come up with some of the diagnostics, come up with some of the treatments, you know, people, a lot of people take insulin. Those were tested on animals. The FDA actually requires that any sort of new medication or um, tool that's going to be used on a human. It has to be tested in an animal first um, for many reasons. You know, it's not ethical for us to test a new drug in a, in a person because who knows what could happen. Um, and so we use animals in order to protect people. And, and again, you know, we love animals and we know that we need to take care of the animals when we're doing it. Um, and it, there are very thin lines. And again, that's why we have these national rules that we have to abide by. Um, but in order to protect people, it is important. You know, the FDA, they say, you know, we need to start with, you know, if you have a new drug you wanna produce, let's start with a mouse or a rat, see how it works in that species. And then, you know, we could step it up to a higher order species, you know, a larger species that might be a little bit more similar to humans. So we would assume that animals will be involved in COVID research, right? Absolutely. So we, yeah, COVID research is going crazy around the country right now. So people are, have been doing lots of COVID research over the past couple of months and they're using a variety of species. Um, and so absolutely, if you see on the news, people talk about a vaccine that they're working on, they're absolutely using animals. Um, and that's a great example because this is, you know, it's happening live to us now. And so we're experiencing, experiencing it. And yes, animals are absolutely being used um, and they're being cared for appropriately. Again, you know, that's the job of the lab animal vet. For folks who are very much, and you've been, you've been alluding to this, but for people who are like, no research should be done on animals, their number one priority is animal health and welfare and animal rights, right? So how do we market research on animals for even the people who are like, I don't really care if people do well, I care more about the animals. What do we say to help people really understand why we have to do this? Yeah, it's a very hard question and it, you know, I try really hard to respect everyone's ideas and there are groups of people who believe that animals should not be used in research and I, I totally understand that. Um, and there are people who, who just don't agree with it and that's fine, um, but I try to give examples to those people. So, 
you know, I have had conversations with individuals who are not on board and, and the big thing is to keep it positive and to and remember to respect each other's opinions. But I think primarily giving examples of saying, hey, have you ever taken aspirin? Have you ever taken, you know, do you have someone in your family that's sick? Or do you know someone that, have you ever had to go to the hospital? <laughs> you know, just kind of basic examples. Um, and I think that people can take that and say, yes, there is a benefit from it. And so it, it's just kind of the balance because you can't change everybody's mind. And, and I think trying to find middle ground um, and again, respecting everyone's opinion. This is just good life advice in general to not, I mean, there's so many things we can take away from professional development, leadership and communication from that example. So one, empathizing with things that people can really relate to. So have you used aspirin? Have you been to the hospital? Like getting on, getting on a similar level, a similar playing field with your audience. Two, being respectful of everybody's opinion. Three, being realistic that we can't, we can't change some people's minds. And that's not our job. Um, our job is client education and communication. So if you guys are going to go be a general practitioner and you offer best case scenario for this pet and it's very, very expensive, and the client is saying, what, why is it that expensive, da, 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 da. Then it's your guys' job to calm down, be respectful, get on their level, explain it to them in a way they can understand, and then allow them to make their choice and not try to, not get upset if you can't sway their opinion. So we can use that in all of our professional lives, for sure. it sounds like, and it sounds like in all veterinary medicine, there's no such thing as a typical day, but what could a student expect if they become a lab animal veterinarian? What could their day look like? Every day will be so very, very different. Um, you'll probably start your day with your staff doing some sort of rounds in the morning. Um, and rounds just means that you, you know, review any sick cases that you might have from the day before or any procedures that you might have. Um, and you'll work very closely with your team and your team might be yourself as the vet, um, your veterinary technicians. They might include your animal care technicians so the husbandry technicians. Um, you might have other staff, your administrative staff be involved in that as well. Um, but again, it comes back to communication. So you'll have some sort of rounds in the morning where you communicate and kind of make your plan for the day. Um, and then after that, you might go throughout the day with any cases that pop up. So let's say you work in a facility with mice and rats and rabbits and dogs, you know, you might have a husbandry technician come to you and say, hey, I have this rabbit and, it, you know, and he's squinting a little bit with its, with its eye. Can you take a look at it? And so you might go to that room and look at your rabbit and do your physical exam. You might have one of your veterinary technicians help you. You may decide you want to do some diagnostics on that rabbit size and um, and again as a veterinarian you're expected to play so many different roles so you're an ophthalmologist as well and so you do an eye exam um, and then you'll need to contact that rabbit's client or owner and so as a lab animal vet your clients are not the pet owners you know as like you're comparing it to a general practitioner our clients are the scientists and these investigators doing their research um, and so i would call that rabbit's investigator the scientist is working with that rabbit and i'd say hey you know this rabbit looks to be a little bit uncomfortable you know is it okay if we do some diagnostics um, let's chat about your plan for this rabbit you know what are you you know we would talk about, you know, what they're using the rabbit for, and if I think that it needs some pain medications, is that going to affect your research? Um, so let's chat about that. So again, constant communications with the client, figuring out what's best for the rabbit, wanting, you know, to keep the rabbit out of pain or discomfort, and then again, working with the research researcher to say, hey, is it okay for me to give these medications? Um, so you might have something like that pop up, um, and then. If you're working in academia, you might be working with students. So you might have some students with you. You might have some residents with you. And so you have opportunity to teach them. You might have some didactic courses where you're, you know, doing active teaching and listening. Um, and then, if, again, if you're in academia, you might be doing research yourself. You know, some lab animal vets do do their own research and have their own projects, or they might be helping a resident with a project. 
Um, so you might spend part of your day working on that. Um, and then of course we have the regulatory side of lab animal medicine. So we have an animal care and use committee. So there's a committee that provides oversight for the institution. Um, and so we do a lot with that committee. And so we'll actually be a part of the process for reviewing new ideas. So if, a, if a, an investigator has a new idea for doing COVID research, for example, they'll submit what we call a protocol. And that protocol has to be reviewed by a group of people. Um, and so we'll be involved with that. Um, we also visit different animal facilities. So every single facility on campus that uses animals for research, we visit twice a year and we go there in person um, just to check on everybody and see how things are going. And, and that's also another opportunity for us to connect with the investigators, talk to them, see how things are going, if they have any concerns. Um, and we get to see their facilities. And so we're able to check and make sure things are up to par. Job sounds awesome. There's like a lot of really great opportunities for professional development, varying your day. You have a, like a lot of variety. Um, I think it sounds like it takes a very, I don't want to say a specific personality, but it, it takes a, a student who, and a veterinarian who really understands a lot about not only clinical medicine, but like you said, like regulation, policy, procedure, your clients aren't rare human scientists. So that has to be a whole nother level of communication. So Dr. Southern, could you describe in three words, personality characteristics that would be very helpful to have to be a lab animal veterinarian? Ooh, that's a good question. Excellent communication skills. I mean, that is key for sure. That's crazy because I think a lot of people probably hear lab animal vet and they think you're just in a lab like with a microscope because people still don't understand what research is. So that is crazy. Yeah. I mean, everything we do comes down to communication. It really does. And it's, it's a great field to develop that skill because not everybody knows how to you know, have effective communication skills. And you might learn some of it in vet school, um, but really it's when you go out and, and practice and that's how you learn to communicate with your clients and your team, because as a veterinarian, you're immediately a leader. So you have to know how to communicate with your staff. You have to be able to, you have to be able to give instructions, but in a respectful, positive way. You know, in order to be a leader, you have to be a servant at the same time. So I think you absolutely have to be able to communicate effectively. Being a servant leader would be one phrase. Um, the second phrase I think would be being flexible because things change. Um, and, you know, you might have good days, you might have bad days, but I think being able to, uh, you know, if an emergency happens, you have to be able to say, okay, let me put this down and go handle this emergency. So it's key. It's very important to be flexible. I think being able to work as a team, um, and that kind of goes back with leadership and having good communication. But again, it's key because you need a team in order to function as a veterinarian and especially a lab animal veterinarian because there, you know, you might have hundreds of animals and as a, a vet you're only one person you know you rely on other people to be your eyes and ears and of course you do go in you get to go in there and see the animals as well but you're nothing without your team wow you know what's so crazy so you said communication flexibility and teamwork which literally could go for any field of veterinary medicine but those qualities look different in every field of veterinary medicine. They do. So like when students approach the essay questions and the essay questions ask like, talk about your strengths and your areas of improvement. Every student in a, in a class of 124 could choose the same words, but could describe them so differently based on their experiences in the field. Wow, Dr. Southern, I'm so pumped about lab animal medicine. We always ask our guests to provide the pre-vets with advice. So what advice do you have for pre-vet students who are either, 
you know, freshmen in college or getting ready to apply, or maybe they're 45 years old and switching their career, what's your advice? I would say don't get discouraged. Um, I think it's very easy to get discouraged. You know, veterinary medicine, there's only so many vet schools in the country, and there's a ton of people that want to be a veterinarian. Um, so I would say work hard, be well-rounded. So find things that interest you um, and then find an outlet, you know, find something that's going to keep you sane because vet school is really hard and you're going to need some sort of outlet, something that you enjoy doing. If you enjoy reading, if you enjoy, you know, working out, find something um, and keep yourself balanced because on days that, you know, you might feel like, hey, I can't do this. You can just, you need someone, you know, to encourage you. So if you, if you can find somebody, you know, a family member or a spouse or a friend um, that can remind you on those bad days that it will get better, you can do this. That's super, super important. I am very excited about the future of lab animal medicine, and especially because of One Health, Zoonoses, where we are in the country right now. So Dr. Southern, thank you so much for introducing the podcast to this field of vet med. This is our first time we've talked about it. So I really have enjoyed our discussion today. I've enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm, I'm here if you have other questions or if your students have questions. I, I'm so passionate about this field. I love what I do. I can't imagine myself doing anything else. And so I get super pumped when I hear that students are interested because I want to just bring them in and show them what we do and help get them you know, to the door so they can be introduced to it and see what we do and enjoy it. You heard it here first, students. One more amazing part of this amazing field. <laughs> I'm Alex Avelina and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder for season three that we are recording this podcast during social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is a dear friend. Morgan Papworth. Morgan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, I'm happy to be here. Today we are talking about wellness. And Morgan, I feel like we use the word wellness a lot and it can mean different things to different people. So today I think our goal is to get all types of folks feeling excited about caring for themselves. Would you agree? Yeah, and I think caring for themselves is gonna look different for everyone. Right. So it doesn't have to be, I think a lot of times when people think about wellness, they think about uh, exercise and nutrition. Um, so I think it's sort of expanding that and, and helping people realize that it's so much more than just those two things. And those two things may, you know, not be for you, or maybe you're already doing those things, but maybe you're still not achieving your desired state of wellness. So sort of expanding upon that definition today. Speaking of expanding, go ahead and tell us what your title is. How have you in your career and education wise expanded your understanding of wellness. So who is Morgan? How did Morgan get here today? Yeah, so my background is in health education and behavior. I have a master's from UF, go Gators. Um, so I am the current wellness manager for Gator Care and we provide wellness opportunities for employees at UF and UF Health. Our kind of wellness focus um, is holistic or comprehensive. So we touch on eight different dimensions of wellness and try and provide programming um, or education around each of those eight dimensions. So Morgan is not a veterinarian. She is an expert in wellness. And like she said, employee, specifically employee wellness, because students, you're eventually gonna become veterinarians. That's going to be your career. And it's important for you to have a handle on your wellness, know your different options for staying well, being well, evaluating your wellness. So Morgan can come in with a great outsider perspective because sometimes, you know, in our careers, we get so caught up in the job and we forget about ourselves. And I find that a lot with veterinarians, Morgan, a lot of veterinarians focus so much and student, vet students 
on taking care of everybody else but themselves. So hopefully today we can provide everybody with some great tips and tricks for caring for themselves, right? Yes, yeah, they always tell you, you know, when you board an airplane, which probably not many of us are doing that right now, but um, <laughs> you put on your oxygen mask first. So um, if we can start building that habit of putting our own oxygen mask on first now, um, it will serve us really well in the future. Agreed. So Morgan, something I do with um, veterinarians is I always ask them, what personality of a vet student would fit this career? So today, we're going to be looking at two types of personalities, wouldn't you say? Yes. So we, you know, people, you've heard type A and type B folks a lot, but say we're going to use our own terms. Uh, we're going to call them to-do listers and go with the flowers. So yeah. students, identify for yourself right now. Are you a to-do lister or a go with the flower? Morgan, what are you? Oh, you know. <laughs> Morgan and I are both to-do listers, but we wanted to make sure that we were providing options for both types of people. So as we go through the eight dimensions of wellness today, we are going to give you tips for both types. Okay, and, and you should know, listeners, both Morgan and I are at our standing desks right now. We are recording the podcast trying to stay well uh, in our own offices. So if you are listening to the podcast, maybe you want to get up and move around as you listen right now, but maybe you're in the car. Okay. So which dimension should we start with first? Uh, I guess let's hit the low hanging fruit of physical. Okay. So physical wellness, what I think of is exercise. Maybe I'm thinking sleep. Maybe I'm thinking nutrition. Are we hitting on those things? Yes. Yeah. Water. Okay. All of those. Water. Right. Let's mention that people typically think about when they think about wellness. Yeah. Okay. So like you said, low hanging fruit. So the first yeah. thing first. So what does, what's a great tip for either maintaining or increasing our physical wellness for a to-do lister? So I think for our to-do listers, uh, these are probably the folks who are very, or more so goal oriented. Mm -hmm. um, so I think setting goals and then tracking and seeing that progress would probably be meaningful for them. Um, so it could be, you know, figuring out your current average steps throughout yeah. the day. Yes. And then saying, okay, next week I'm gonna increase that number by 2000. Yes. So I think for these folks, it's really like seeing the progress and tracking the progress. So we're going to first observe, we're gonna track, we're gonna notice, right? We're gonna say, wait a second, I take steps every day. How many steps am I taking? So maybe, you know, we like to talk about also buying happiness. So this person probably already owns some type of Fitbit or a tracker, but if you don't, maybe you want to go and get one. This group too, like the planning, the intention is important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this might be a group that um, prefers to meal prep at the beginning of the week. So yes. they have some healthy stuff to eat throughout the week. Yes. Okay. So it sounds like the to-do listers, they kind of already know what they want. And now for them, maybe it's elevating to the next step of making change when they're ready to make change. So let's mm -hmm. talk about the go with the flowers. Okay. How are we helping the folks who are maybe a little more, uh, maybe potentially a little less intentional, they go where the wind blows them, maybe they're not as um, obviously invested in wellness. So how can they help their physical wellness? So I think the thing that we're gonna come back to with this group over and over is sort of um, returning to like, what do I need in this moment? Or, oh. Um, you know, and I think that's going to fit a lot of the different dimensions. So I don't think that this group necessarily wants to say, oh, I always work out after class. Like, that's my thing. That's what I do. Yeah. Um, or I always go to the gym. Maybe they are moving after class every time, every day, but it's not as like regimented. Okay. Yeah. And so maybe instead of saying like, oh, I go to the gym after class every day, it's like, oh, I like to get together with my friends and do something active every day. Yes. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then I usually go for a walk or something. You know, so it's kind of like, what do I want to do in this moment? What do I need in this moment? Wonderful. Okay, so that is physical wellness. So everyone take a quick mental inventory right now. How are you feeling about your physical wellness? How are you feeling about how much you're moving, what you're eating, how much sleep you're getting, whether or not that's working for you? And then you can adjust as needed. Or for our to-do or our go with the flowers, maybe adjust nothing and just feel good in the moment. <laughs> What's our next area, Morgan? Uh, let's hit emotional next. Ooh, okay. So emotional wellness, what are we talking about there? 
So we're talking about stress management, building resilience. We're talking about uh, confidence, self-esteem. Ooh. Um, so that's kind of what we see in our emotional wellness. Okay, so all good stuff for future veterinarians, especially the confidence piece. So walking into a room, letting that client know that you know what's going on. Even if you don't know yet, you know you're going to go and figure it out. You're mm -hmm. going to call on some folks to help you. So what are some things that the to-do lister can do for their emotional wellness? So I think for a to-do lister, I guess my, my recommendations on this one are kind of across the board between both personality types. It's sort of, and I think the stress piece is probably the most relevant for yeah. students as you're being pulled in a million different directions. Um, so I think really starting to hone in on how you manage stress and okay. be proactive about it instead of reactive. Yeah. So not waiting to do things until you're so overwhelmed that you don't know what to do, right? So yeah. I think this is a really good time to start trying on different strategies for size and seeing what fits and what works for you. Yes. So it could be exercises, your stress reliever, it could be journaling, it could be cooking, it could be spending time with friends or disconnecting from technology or reading. Um, so I think trying all of these things and figuring out what works for you and then doing them. So, so perhaps for our to-do lister, they're scheduling in time for that, yeah. right? And then back to our other personality, the sort of go with the flow. Um, maybe it's like check-in points throughout the day, sort of more informal or, yeah. um, you know, maybe after your afternoon class, before you transition to your next one, you're kind of taking a deep breath and saying, okay, but what can I do for myself today? Or what would yes. you do today? I love this, this idea that, okay, all of the personality types and all of the dimensions of wellness, they're going to have a lot of um, crossover and overlap and it kind of just depends on what strategy works best for each person mm -hmm. and that's what might be the difference so mm -hmm. if we know that we are a to-do lister like you said building in the time recognizing that if this person's a little bit more regimented they need to do this ahead of time versus mm -hmm. the go with the flower who might be more able to say in a moment you know what I need to step back and do something for myself mm -hmm. and that might be harder for the mm -hmm. to-do lister so everyone wherever you're at do a quick check-in. How are you feeling with your emotional wellness? Are you feeling stressed? What has been stressful today? What has worked in the past when you felt stressed? So today we're gonna to tackle the emotion of stress. We can do this for all of our emotions. Okay, what's our next area? Let's hit social. Yeah, talk to me. It's a, we're, it's, we're in a weird time to talk about social <laughs> wellness right now. So talk about that. Yeah, um, so having a network and having um, support is so important always, but probably more so right now. Um, I think a part of this too is, you know, we've been hearing so much about the coronavirus spiking because folks are going out to bars or parties. So uh, I think in this dimension, there's kind of that like, yes, we need to maintain social connections, but yeah. we have to be mindful and safe about how we do that. So for the to-do lister, how do they need to evaluate their social wellness? You know, do you feel like you are supported in the different dimensions of your life? Do you feel like you have people you can turn to, whether that be family members or friends or, you know, fellow students? Um, so I think, you know, it's kind of similar across both personality types for this one too. So, um, you know, kind of taking inventory of do I have a social support system um, and then relying on that support system. Um, and I think, you know, this is such a prime time to start developing that support system. These people that you're going through classes with, these are your colleagues now, your peers, like your professional network. Um, so taking the time to invest in that and get to know people and you know, have those shared experiences, I think is going to be really important. So it's finding ways to do that given our limitations right now. I think a difference too between the two personalities, especially with vet school, is the to-do lister might be, again, more intentional about keeping up with their social groups versus the go with the flower who will maybe like wait to the moment occur somewhere like, oh, I want to connect with so-and-so, or I feel like going out with so-and-so, 
And in vet school, your social relationships can become a little constrained for the people who aren't in vet school with you. Mm. So your family back home, or if you have a long distance relationship, the to-do lister might be a little bit more ready to schedule that time in. And so they might have a little less strain on their long distance family relationships okay. versus the go with the flower who maybe will forget that they need to do be doing those check-ins to keep that strong relationship with their family. Now, hopefully their family and significant others or friends who aren't at the vet school know that personality type, but it can become so much more, um, so much more aware once they're in vet school because they're so, so busy. Yeah. So I would challenge the to-do lister to make sure you build in the time to connect with your family members and the go with the flower to kind of let your family, friends back home know, hey, I'm going into vet school. You might not hear from me as much as you once did because I'm going to be really busy. Please, can you connect to me? Because right. I'm going to be so busy because I, I just might forget. So that's something that they should keep in mind. Yeah, for sure. And I could see the to-do listers too, you know, being so um, goal oriented and sort of zero yeah. down on school that um, they may forget to build in the social wellness piece. True. Right? be so focused on grades and studying and exams that the social piece kind of falls off a little bit or doesn't feel like a priority. So for those yes. people, I encourage them that this is so important and should be, you know, up there with the studying and the exams in the school. Like this is a huge component. Okay, wonderful. So everyone take a quick second, do a little social wellness inventory. Who have you connected with? Who do you feel good connecting with? And who do you maybe not feel so good connecting with? And you keep Maybe reevaluate those relationships too. It's a good time. Let's hit spiritual wellness next. Spiritual wellness. What does, I feel like this might be one where folks have maybe a preconceived idea uh -huh. of what it looks like. How would you define it for employees? So this, I think, can be misconstrued as something tied to religion or spiritual practice, but it's so much more than that. And so for spiritual wellness, I like to come back to sort of purpose. Like what is my purpose? What are my beliefs and guiding values and how can I connect with those on a more regular basis? Yeah. So a to-do lister, what would we, what is our tip for them to keep their spiritual wellness going up, keeping them, their cup full during vet school? So I think for them, probably specifically, they would enjoy an activity like this, but I think it would be beneficial for everybody is uh -huh. to really check in. So what is my purpose? You yeah. know, most people probably went into vet school because they really care about animals. Yeah. Right? So right. I think probably too in the early, and I don't know how your curriculum goes, but I imagine that it could be a lot of studying and not so much like playing with puppies, you know? Right. Right. Um, so how can you connect with that sort of animal, enjoying animals? This is what I'm here for, like on a more regular basis when you get sort of entrenched in the textbooks and reading yeah. and studying and all of that. Okay. Um, so everybody should think about what is, what is my purpose? Mm -hmm. What are my values? What's important to me? And how can I connect with that on a regular basis? Okay. So I hear you. I hear the words purpose and values. So again, taken in an inventory. So the to-do lister maybe has already thought about this. The mm -hmm. go with the flower maybe hasn't taken time to think about this per se. They might know it, but they haven't taken a second to evaluate. So everyone just take a second, think about, okay, what is my purpose? What are my values? What can I do to make sure that I still feel purpose and valuable? In the big picture scheme of things, sometimes just naming stuff or identifying things can be helpful. So if we're out in nature or you're going for a walk, um, taking a moment to be like, oh, I'm going to work on my spiritual wellness. Like this means something to me. Look at the world around me. Like I'm a small part in this huge ecosystem, right? So kind of saying like, this is my spiritual wellness for today. Like I'm going to, I'm going to be here for just a moment. Yeah. So I think as they go about their day, sort of finding those little key points to say like, man, the weather is really nice today. I'm grateful for this. So everyone do a little spiritual inventory. Do you know what your purpose is? Do you feel like you have a purpose? Do you know what your values are? I do want to add before we move from spiritual. Yeah. You know, 
part of spiritual could be your religion or reconnecting to a higher power. So if that is something that's important to you that you value, that gives you purpose, definitely do keep that, you know, at the forefront. So we talked a little bit about spending time in nature. So I think we can kick it over to environmental wellness next. Environmental wellness, what does that mean? So this is really um, kind of connecting with the world around you. So it could be being more environmentally conscious or environmentally friendly or making choices that help the, the environment. But I think it's also to sort of kind of tying in with that spiritual wellness piece of um, your community, like feeling a connectedness to your community or the society that supports you or the vet school as a whole, um, the University of Florida, you know, so that kind of what is your environment? Um, how do you fit in and how do you feel supported and how do you then go and support it? Yeah, so bit something bigger than ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay, so my thoughts would be, okay, so maybe the to-do lister schedules time to go and volunteer at different organizations and maybe the go with the flower is cognizant a little more cognizant of just moving through their day and just making those helpful choices whether it's to recycle to you know not that the to-do lister doesn't recycle but just that they're gonna go with the flow in their environment versus the to-do lister who maybe has intentional things they're gonna do for mm -hmm. the and then I think too, coming back to that naming um, or that sort of recognizing, stopping and pausing. So when you make connections or you're on a Zoom study group with other students, like, ah, this is cool. Like, these are my people. Like, this is my my environment now. Yeah. Like, about that, you know? Do we feel like environment is also like, I feel like decor of your of Oh, yeah. Your yeah. 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 So sure feeling good in your environment. So taking that inventory. So the to-do lister, uh, if they're like, you know, that my space isn't functional, maybe they want to get up right now and move some furniture around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe the go with the flower hasn't taken that step back to look at their environment. They're like, actually, you know what? I could really go for um, a diffuser in my space. Mm -hmm. so I could go for moving my laundry basket closer to the laundry room so things get a little bit more functional. So like you said, like taking that inventory of your immediate environment and then the larger environment. And I think they go with the flower too. Um, so maybe they you know they have to study that day, you know, waking up and like, okay, what environment would support this? Yeah. Like, do I want to study at my house? Do I maybe want to go to a park and study? Sure. You know, thinking about like what would support me or what feels good in this moment. It sounds like a lot of what we're doing is just kind of identifying these areas of wellness and then just questioning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what's working best in each area right and what's working best for what works for me specifically. correct there's no one formula that works for everybody so it's really kind of that exploration yeah solve those questions trying different things to figure out what works for you and then doing those things financial wellness so let's do that yeah. one. okay um so this we hear all the time is one of the biggest sources of stress for people. And so if we're stressed about something, obviously that's impacting our wellness. So finances, we feel like it fits within wellness because of that. Um, so it's really, um, do you feel on top of your finances? Do you feel in control of your finances? Um, do you have sort of short and long-term strategies to manage your finances? Uh -huh. um, I think that's really important for students as you start moving into a world where you are the sole manager of your own finances, um, starting to adopt some of those, you know, budgeting principles and, and knowing where your finances are is going to be super important. Finances is a huge pain point for vet students and a lot of professional students because of the debt they accrue from going to school. Mm -hmm. And this is going to come up in y'all's interview is like how, you know, what's one of the biggest factors affecting vet students and it's the debt load and how do you plan to handle your debt? They're going to ask you those questions. So how, like Morgan said, having a handle on it, understanding it, making choices to help benefit you in the future is huge. So what can a to-do lister do to help their financial wellness? I think a to-do lister maybe would enjoy tracking, right? I think either, either, personality uh, starts at, like many of the others, sort of taking an inventory. 
where am I at today? And I know it can be terrifying to explore how much debt do I have, you know, or like, what are my car payments? Are like really tracking your expenses? Unfortunately, most of banks now will provide that for you, right? So right. you're spending X amount on groceries, X amount eating out. Um, so I think kind of going into that uncomfortable place and exploring that. So for the financial um, piece for our to-do listers, they may want to set really specific parameters around that, right? So maybe yeah. it's this week I am tracking and figuring out where my expenses are. Next week I'm trying this strategy. Yeah. Um, What's the go with the flow we're doing for financial wellness? That's a great question. What is the go with the flow we're doing? My thought is I feel like the go with the flower really benefits from having a support person. So maybe the go with the flower makes an appointment with a professional. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. at the school, we have a financial aid counselor. So maybe they make sure that every quarter or every semester they meet with that person. Whereas the to-do lister maybe is a little bit more, like you said, like tracking, managing, setting goals, you know, they've kind of got all of this stuff set out, whereas the go with the flower would maybe really benefit from having more one-on-one -on -one time mm -hmm. with the financial aid person to get them to feel comfortable in their particular situation. Yeah. And maybe too, with the go with the flower, it's not, I don't, I think this personality type sort of shies away from like specific rules or parameters. Yes. So maybe right. it's not saying this is how much I'm going to spend on groceries. This is how much I can spend eating out. Maybe it's, this is my chunk of cash for the next two weeks. It's like, yeah. this is all I'm going to spend for the next two weeks. Right. Just and then spend on whatever you want, but that's what you got. Yeah. So there's some flexibility in there, but ultimately you're giving yourself that kind of bigger structure or parameter that this is all you have. Yeah. Okay, what's our next area? So let's hit occupational next. Oh, okay. So I'm thinking uh, that means jobs. It means jobs. And I think for students, that means their schoolwork. Right. Um, so when we're thinking about employees, occupational wellness would be um, having a job that leaves you fulfilled where you feel like your values align, that you get to work on your purpose or connect with your purpose through your work. Um, likely that you have some sort of autonomy or um, independence in the decisions that matter for you, um, that you feel supported at work. What are some tips for folks to feel that occupational wellness? So I think when we're talking about occupational wellness, you know, we are at work or at school or working on school for the majority of our hours each week, right? right. Um, so I think, you know, it's important for us to take ownership of that and say, you know, how can I make this the best? How can I take care of myself during this time? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, while school or work may be your priority and those 40 hours or whatever it may be, um, you still have to find a way to enjoy it and to bring fun and your own personality and take care of yourself while doing all of that. So that could mean, you know, building in intentional study breaks. It could be being smart about scheduling your day so you're not stuck pulling an all-nighter. Right. Um, scheduling your week, you know. Yeah. Um, it could be building in time throughout your day to connect with people via Zoom or after a class, stay a little bit later and chat with your professor or um, you know, a couple students trying to get to know people. So I think the occupational wellness sort of, um, a lot of those other wellness pieces fall into this. It's sort of like how can I focus on my wellness while I'm at work. But I think part of it too is just taking ownership of it and taking responsibility, which the go with the flowers may not um, be so inclined to do, right? They're sort of um, in classes, maybe enjoying it, but how can you make the most of that, right? right. How can you make the most connections or learn as much or get the most hands-on experience? Um, and I think part of that is just where a huge core component is ownership. Okay, so everybody take quick inventory. What do you love about your work situation? What can you change? If there are some things that you can change, can you add in more time for your, your wellness? Can you make some adjustments? Can you work with whoever 
your leadership is to, to do a little bit, you know, maybe change your, your hours. You probably can if you're in vet school, like those things are set in stone. So what can you control? That's a great part is always asking, what can I control in this moment? Are we on our last area of wellness? I think we are. And what is it? So this one you and I both love is, is intellectual wellness. Tell me about it. So this is really being that lifetime learner. Mm -hmm. It is being open to new ideas, to new ways of seeing things or doing things, to be curious, to question, um, to seek new skills and new learning opportunities. We, so cool. at the vet school, we do the strengths quest and mm -hmm. it comes up with your top five strengths. Mm -hmm. I will tell you the majority of the vet students do get learner as one of their five strengths because they love to learn. You know, they want to, you guys want to go to school. You love science. You love medicine. You want to figure out what, what's going on with this animal, what's going on with this zoonotic disease. So I think intellectual is a great area of wellness that some of our students might lose while in vet school because their intellectual piece is what's given to them every day and they have less time to seek outside intellectual, like continued education. Right. So I think expanding what intellectual wellness is, right? It doesn't mean like we've got to read self-help books or watch the History Channel all the time. Um, yeah. Intellectual could be, you know, when you meet someone new, asking them questions to try and learn more about that person, right? Sure. Could be like, hmm, Gainesville is a new place to me. I want to explore this area or I want to learn about the history of this area or Camping always sounded really cool. Like, I want to do that. You know, intellectual wellness could just be trying new things. It doesn't have to be reading yet another book. Yeah. So finding out more, staying curious, staying fascinated is the to-do lister building in time for that versus the go with the flower who, when it comes to them, they're just in it in that moment and they accept what's going on. Do we, is that the difference, do we think, between these two? Um, I mean, I think building a time for that for the to-do lister, but I think keeping an open mind about what that looks like, right? So I think the to-do listers could potentially fall into the, like, oh, I'm going to read this book. Like, I should yeah. read this book. Yeah. Versus kind of having the more wider perspective of, like, I'm going to try this new hobby. Yeah. Or, like, pick up knitting or something, you know? Right. Um, so maybe for the to-do lister, it's really sort of exploring, okay, what things, starting with that inventory, what things am I interested in trying? Right. Right. And maybe kind of adapting more of the go with the flow personality on this one. Yeah. Uh -huh. and sort of be open to whatever. Yeah. Do something different. Yeah. And so the go with the flower, are we saying what can help them increase that intellectual wellness? Because I think that the go with the flowers could be like, oh, okay, this is the information I got in class today. Like, yep. take it, I'll accept it, I'll process it. I know this information now. But maybe adapting more of like a, but why? Or like oh. a, how? Like, tell me more, sort of. Yes. You know, like, which kind of goes against their green because they sort of, they just, that information. Like, it's time right. to on and get the next thing. Yeah. Maybe, again, coming back to that curiosity, like, trying to take it a step further. Okay, so everyone take an inventory of your intellectual wellness. What has made you feel stimulated in the past? What people maybe enhance your intellectual wellness? Spend more time with those folks. Morgan, you know, to sum up, I always ask the guests, what advice do they have for pre-vet students? So these are very you know, high functioning go-getter students who have a purpose, have a drive, want to become a veterinarian. What is your advice for them to stay well? The first is to sort of slow down and enjoy it and remember to take that step back every now and then. Um, you know, you guys have done incredible things to make it this far. Um, so, so take that in, you know, this experience only happens once, um, you know, the, it, it's going to go by so fast. So building in time to really celebrate those successes and make memories, 
Um, school is obviously a huge component of this, but this is really the start of your career. And a career isn't just about the knowledge you have, but the people you know and the experiences you've had. So try and make the most of that time, even though this is a year time to do it. Um, right. You know, try and make the most of that. And, and my second suggestion, um, building new habits, you know, can be difficult, um, but it, it's sort of easier to do when we have these big life transitions. So this is a really good opportunity to start building new habits. So, you know, you guys are the architects of your future. What do you want your future to look like and how do you get there? Um, you know, do you want to be the frazzled, you know, working until the hours of the night, um, not having the social interactions that you crave, or do you want that balance? Um, how can you start creating those habits now that will see you into the future. So use this as a, an opportunity to start getting curious and exploring those different ways to manage stress or to connect with your social support system. Great advice yeah. for everyone, not just previous students, but yeah. everybody. I agree. Slowing down, enjoying these moments, celebrating the moment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you really do get a clean slate, guys. Like mm -hmm. anytime you start something new. So technically a Sunday could be a clean slate. Mm -hmm. You can start that new week. But going to vet school is a huge opportunity to start fresh, develop new habits, kind of like rebrand yourself if that's what you want to do, or keep doing what works for you, making sure you find time to keep those things in place with the new crazy schedule of vet school. I want to thank Morgan for being on our podcast today. Morgan, it's always a pleasure when we chat, especially about things like wellness and what we enjoy. So thanks for taking the time to help our future veterinarians today. Yeah, of course. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me, Alex. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Avellino. And just a reminder to our audience that we are recording these podcasts from our home via Zoom. So audio might sound a little bit different. Today, our guest is Dr. Chris Aiden, who is the chair of the Department for the Small Animal Clinical Sciences at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Aiden, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alex. Dr. Aiden is going to talk to us a little bit about his journey to veterinary medicine. You know, Dr. Aiden, our students really like to hear how did our guests get to where they are today? We're all talking a lot of development and leadership. So before we get into those heavier topics, can you walk us through where you got your degrees from and how you knew you wanted to be a veterinarian? Well, um, I went to college at Duke University. And at that time, I was interested in being a veterinarian. I was also interested in being a scientist. And I had to decide between the two. So what I decided to do is my uh, senior year, I did a senior thesis that was a research project. And I also worked at a vet hospital over the summer and tried to decide between the two. And that was predetermined by God, I think. And when I was in uh, my, my research experience, what it really involved is me sitting in a lab by myself. And I, I was lonely. I struggled to find the meaning in what I was doing. And then in contrast, I went to this veterinary hospital, which had uh, veterinary specialists at it. And that was a pretty unique thing for the 1980s to 90s. It was a private practice. They had a surgeon and an oncologist. And I worked with them. And it was the exact opposite. It was exciting. We were saving lives. We were interacting with tens of people a day, you know, all, all kinds of clients, staff, other doctors. And I got to do stuff with my hands. And I actually, at that time, not only decided I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I decided I wanted to be a surgeon because I saw a lot of uh, what I enjoyed doing. Fixing things is what I like to do. And so where did you go to vet school? I went to vet school at Cornell. And your did you, how many internships did you do? I did an internship at VCA South Shore Animal Hospital. That was a large private practice internship 
after your internship, where did you do your residency? Uh, I did my residency at UC Davis, which had a great surgery program at that time. And was that the end of your educational journey? Well, never the end of my educational journey, but I have not received any degrees since. Continued education is really important in the veterinary field. Would you say that's a part of their, a, like a part of professional development? I would for sure. And it's interesting that you use the word professional development because uh, just a story about how I became interested in leadership training and skills. When I was a faculty member for about seven or eight years, I started to get opportunities for leadership positions. And one of them was I was invited to apply for a position at the Animal Medical Center, a large private practice in Manhattan. And it was when I went to interview for the job, my, my understanding of leadership was that there were certain people that had leadership qualities, that they were good communicators, that they were respected. And when I spoke to, there was a private portion of the interview where I spoke to the, the leader at the AMC at the time. And uh, this was a person who was very educated in leadership skills and in fact had m many, many years of experience in leadership. So a very, very experienced person in comparison to myself at the time. And he asked me what I thought about leadership training. And I told him my naive answer, which is that I think that some people have leadership qualities and others uh, struggle with that and that, that I hope that I you know, had some of those qualities, and I didn't get that job. Um, and I look back at that as a really big learning experience. Later on in my life, I was fortunate to get asked to take some leadership training at Ohio State University. One of the department chairs there and the deans uh, identified uh, younger faculty members and decided to get them some leadership training to grow them up. And I, I got that opportunity and then my eyes were open to how I had been wrong. So I have a fun game I'd like for us to play because as you've been talking, I'm like, okay, I'm thinking this is, you know, Dr. Aiden has a lot of leadership experience. He's been through a lot. What if you and I come up with right now on the spot for our listeners, potential leadership life curriculum ideas. So let we could start with baseline, Step one, what should somebody be thinking about doing to get more leadership skills? Yes, that's a great question, Alex. So I, uh, I think that most leadership training experiences begin with an analysis of your uh, personal tendencies. Some of them, um, an example would be a DISC analysis, Yes. D-I-S-C. Um, anyone listening can Google that. They have an, a neat website. Many vet schools offer personality testing during part of their curriculum, and that, that is something to take advantage of so that you can understand how you will interact with people. And what you'll find is that not that your personality test will tell you whether you can be a leader or not, because people from all different personality types or tendencies can be leaders, but each of them needs to understand themselves. What did you get on the disc? Gosh, I have to look back. I, I am a person who tends to be introverted and I tend to try to please people. Anyway, I think that to answer your question, one of the first things that you'd want to do is to, is to um, be introspective, mm -hmm. take one of those tests. Hopefully that'll be supported through your school. And then beyond that, what most of those organizations offer is, so this is, this is who you are. And now this is what you need to know about your leadership development. And these are the areas you need to work in. These are the areas you're already strong in. Uh, and af after that, then signing up for leadership opportunities. And there are some available here at UF. There's some available through IFAS. That's our agriculture and life sciences area. And uh, there are opportunities for undergraduate students. There's opportunities through the business school here. And I imagine that those would be similar at other universities. These are commitments like taking courses where you get graded, or there are online leadership training programs where you can, you know, do a couple of hours of continuing education and, and learn more. Okay, so step one, we're getting introspective. We're going to take some tests or quizzes. I know that there's some some things like DISC that are free that you can take. It's not gonna give you the full, like Dr. Aiden's talking about, like this is what you can do to develop these skills even further, but it will give you a good baseline. The Strengths Quest is another one. So start with introspection. 
Step two, we would say take some courses if they can. How do we feel about professional development books? Books are great. And now that I'm in a leadership role, I scarf these books up because what I've learned is that if somebody has personal experiences based on you know 20 or 30 years of working with people and they're known to be successful, what they have to say is probably worth listening to. Some books that I have read recently that I found to be interesting are one called First Break All the Rules. Ooh. That's a book that is based on data, and it talks a lot about how to help people to find their strengths and to grow, and it helps you to do the same. Cool. Um, and another, another good book would be Hostage at the Table. This is a book by a hostage negotiator who talks about how to get through conflicts. Whoa. Yeah, and they're both really easy to read. They're, it's not like reading a textbook when you're in school. These, these are page flippers. How would you approach as a leader, so for your personal growth, and also for leading others with weaknesses? How can we help ourselves once we've done our introspection and maybe we realize, okay, time management is a big weakness for me, or reaction to criticism might be a big weakness. How does a leader approach that? And how does a leader help lead others with their weaknesses? That's a great question, Alex. The, that book, First Break All the Rules, actually has an interesting approach to that. What I grew up with is that you identify your weaknesses and you try to work on those. This book blows that out of the water, and that's part of why the title is First Break All the Rules. And what it suggests is that you find the strengths in people, and as a leader, your job is to put them in a position where they can use their strengths, not put them in a position where they need to overcome their weaknesses. Yeah. And the key thing there is that if you do that, the people will be much happier than if they spend the rest of their life trying to overcome their weakness. Instead, you might say, gosh, this person is incredible at motivating people and at strategy, but they're horrible at details. Right. So let's put them in a position where they can do that and not be spending the rest of their life being sad about not being very good at what they're doing. That sounds a lot like the Strengths Quest test that we have our incoming students take. And it's all about your top five strengths, whatever they are, you focus on those. And yes. you don't you don't really I don't I don't feel like they're saying don't ever worry about your weaknesses, but they're saying focusing on their strengths will make them happier. And the other thing to do about yourself as a leader is to make a list of the things that you think are most important to you. Because right. you have to make hard decisions in life, whether you're in an official leadership position or not. And whenever you're having one of those times when it's hard to make a decision, you should step back and say, okay, what are those five things that I said are important to me? And then you can usually make the decision pretty easily. Do you feel like not only is it critical to know your own strengths, but also express your strengths as a leader to your team? so they can know expectations, boundaries, so there's that transparency going on? I think that's a great question. I, and, and in a way, I also think it's important to express your weaknesses to the team, you know, sure. that I'm, I'm good at this, but I'm not so good at this, and I'm gonna need your help. And that's how teams work, right? You have, usually you need a diverse team. That's why we talk about diversity. If everybody's exactly the same and has the same strengths, then, then you're not going to have a great team. And if you can, you can rely on other people uh, and be honest with them, that's helpful. So you're a veterinarian. Let's talk about surgery. So tell me what kind of surgeon you are. When, what kind of surgeries do you love performing? Or when was the last time you performed a surgery? Mm -hmm. Well, I am what's called a soft tissue surgeon in veterinary medicine, which is chest, abdominal, cancer surgery. My favorite kind of surgeries are delicate surgeries. Uh, I, I like doing microsurgery, uh, surgery that's performed under a microscope. As I've gone on in my career, I like to do things that only a few people can do because that makes me feel the most useful. And there aren't that many people that can do microsurgery. So you say you like delicate surgeries. Would you say that your fingers are very nimble? Are you really good at untying necklaces or getting knots out? How do those skills translate to anything else in daily life? You know, it's interesting. And surgery is something that it is helpful to be have some level of dexterity with your hands. And I think the thing that you'll find in most people that 
that enjoy surgery is that they're the kind of people that also are do-it-yourselfers at home. They're, they're people that like to, a lot of them do woodworking, other sorts of projects. They work on cars. Uh, they just like fixing stuff. You don't have to be amazing with your hands to become a surgeon. The hard thing about being a surgeon is that you have to know a lot of other stuff and do delicate things with your hands. And uh, if you like medicine and doing things with your hands, you're going to do the best. Talk to me about One Health versus One Medicine. So One Health is, is probably best known. People talk about that a lot. It is an initiative where there's interdisciplinary research that crosses lines between animals and people and tries to make health better for all of them at the same time. For example, the efforts towards diseases that both animals and people can get that are infectious diseases may be One Health. Food safety, other things are, are One Health initiatives uh, where the health of animals may impact the health of people because people eat those animals. One Medicine is a concept where uh, it's, it's related, but it's a subset of One Health. One medicine refers to there are diseases in animals that are nearly identical to diseases in people. And by helping, for example, animals that have diabetes, if we come up with treatments for animals with diabetes, we can help people with diabetes. And when you can use the same medicine for both and make advances in one that help the other, that's called one medicine. So you're chair of all of the small animal specialties like neurology, dermatology. What does that mean? What is your job for the pre-vet students who are listening and being like, ooh, I, I, I would love to be in a leadership position in a college of vet med. What is the job of the department chair? Well, the department chair is the person that supervises the faculty in that department. And the main thing that we are focused on is the careers of those people. We evaluate people each year, uh, their performance, and we try to help people to improve their performance. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder to our audience that during season three, we are recording these episodes during social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is Dr. Mike Walsh. He is a clinical associate professor of aquatic animal health at the UF Comparative Diagnostic and Population Medicine Department. Dr. Walsh, thanks for being on the podcast today. Sure, I'm glad to be here. The first thing I'd like to ask you, because students always want to know, where did you go to undergrad, vet school, and what continued education did you do to get the job you have today? Okay, I actually grew up in the Midwest, which is not exactly a great place for finding animals that are on Oceanside. Right. So I went to um, undergrad at the University of Missouri in Columbia, and then went into the vet school there. After vet school, I'd spent some time during my residency at SeaWorld, and I got to know the people. So when a job opened up at SeaWorld, a friend of mine that I was working with said, why don't you try for that? And he was actually working there part-time. And I said, okay. And that set me up after spending 20 years there of having enough background and credibility to then come to the University of Florida to teach the next generation of aquatic veterinarians. So will you talk to me about what your thoughts are for those students who think they wanna go into aquatic animal medicine? What opportunities do they have? What kind of attitude should they have? What should they be thinking about? And what have they maybe not thought about yet? From the standpoint of how to look at the field, it's not something that has a ton of jobs. And that's why I, I got delayed from nine, let's see, two years before I actually got a job that I really wanted to pursue. So you've got to be open to the possibility that there will be setbacks. So what we usually tell veterinary students that are interested in this is your first goal is the intense desire to be a veterinarian, just a veterinarian. And if you really wanna be a veterinarian, when you're starting off, it doesn't matter in those first four plus years, whether it's dog, cats, horses, or anything else, because the education that you receive opens the door to the other things. 
and with those doors open, now you can take a look and say, okay, I want to be a veterinarian, but I am really kind of interested in this aquatic area or zoo medicine. So, so now we recommend look at it from a zoo and aquatic perspective. Don't limit yourself so much. Widen out your capabilities and your opportunities so that you would be happy doing a zoo that has aquatics or aquatics that has zoo, but you should be prepared to do both. And that's really important because too many people want to pigeonhole themselves in the early stage and they miss things. But the whole goal is you need to get out there because even though some people get into this field because they're interested more in working with animals and people, people are still 50% of this. And if you don't get along with people, you will not do well in this. So you can't just say, I'm gonna go off and do this and I don't have to worry about people. Almost every animal has an owner, whether that's a corporation or whether that's a person. Well, I feel like we could, we could, you could tell them what you were telling me before we pushed record on our podcast about helping those manatees, and you were just listing all of the different people that also came out to collaborate with y'all to help those manatees. So, can you walk our audience through, you know, maybe this manatee doesn't have a physical owner that we would call by name, but all of these people got involved in this stranding case. So walk us through what a stranding case looks like and how you have to be able to work with people to do something like this. Okay. Well, this was a couple of weeks ago when we got a report, female man, I think it was a female manatee who was floating high out of the water on one side. So she was sitting at a, a strange angle in the water and she was not able to dive. She also had a small calf with her. So we went up to that area and followed through on that report, utilized the locals. We had to partner with FWC. We had five different people from our group. It was really this, well, it was a good word, village concept. And that's what we have to do. As a veterinarian, you often get into these positions in practice where you're the only one of authority. So you're, again, going back to this idea of being a people person. And if you don't get along with the people, you're not going to set up the proper relationship to make sure that that animal gets rescued and taken care of. So it's really, again, important that you realize you're not just an animal doctor. You're also a people person at the same time. What does an activity like you know, saving this manatee, what would that go under in one's job description? Is that rescue? Is that conservation efforts? Like what, what part of your job is addressing those calls? This goes back to something we were starting to maybe talk about was that there's opportunities depending on what you want to do. So we, we have a part of the stranding network. The stranding network in the United States for whales and dolphins and pinnipeds is set up along the full coastline, the entire United States, it's divided into regions. And it also includes Alaska and Hawaii. We're part of the Southeast Stranding Network. Part of that relationship too, because manatees are here, is that as the Stranding Network, we also get involved in rescues and recovery of manatees. And our job isn't just live animals. Our goal is to try to enhance the capability of recovery and research on all these animals in the coastline for a lot of different reasons. One is to help the individual animal. So that's when we're the doctor. The other is to work with all these other organizations and that's when we're part of the village. And then the other is to be able to utilize the information we get from these animals to know not only how is their population doing, what are their threats, what are they dying from? That's the conservationist side. So you can be a conservation-based veterinarian. So Dr. Walsh, if we're saying that students have all of these opportunities to get involved, why does a student need the DVM degree to do some of these things? So for these students who are listening and they're deciding if veterinary medicine is the right field for them, what would you tell them that if you want to do this, you need to have the DVM? Uh, maybe a good way of approaching that is realizing that the strategy for being good at this is having a number of things in your pocket. And one of those is a wide 
education that incorporates all species. What you're really looking at is the more you have under your timeline in terms of education on baseline information, you know, if we're talking toxicology, you need to be able to know something about what that's going to entail. Why is this uh, compound important and this one is not if it's in the water system? If you're looking at global warming and it's going to affect the plant aspects, which is going to affect their food, which means their nutrition is going to be compromised, which puts them at more risk, then you need to know about nutrition. Mm -hmm. If you're going to treat these animals, you're going to need to know about pharmacology. What do these drugs do? So what this is, is really tying about 30 different specialties and you become, and, and, okay, I'm gonna go against this old saying, jack of all trades and master of none, I think that's untrue. I think it's exposure to all trades to master one. And the, the reality is you have to have all of these different blocks to build the foundation to be the best you can be. Otherwise, you're not as useful and you won't be one of the pathfinders. You'll be one of the followers. A whole comprehensive experience for the students in those four years while they're getting that DVM to be exposed to all of the tools that they're going to need later, but also they're getting exposed to all of the career opportunities in veterinary medicine. So you're right that this that those three letters, DVM, really could stand for opportunity. They can do so much. And the fact that you're bringing that expertise into the field that other folks who are helping don't have, that will set students apart. So I like this idea that the DVM really prepares them for that future career, whatever it looks like, and whether there's delays or not. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, what were those 20 years at SeaWorld like? So my goals when I was at SeaWorld, I, I hired into that job partially because I was interested in the fact that SeaWorld does a lot of wildlife medicine. So my goal after I got to SeaWorld was I'm going to save the next bunch of baby manatees. Only one baby manatee had been saved in the years before I got there. And I'm going to do the first anesthetic procedure since none had been done in 20 years, never at SeaWorld. And I'm going to save more beached animals because only one beached animal had survived in the first 10 or 12 years. So, and a lot of that came down to taking that education I got and knowing critical care and how to support an animal through an illness. So all that was a challenge for me. And there weren't that as many people involved at the time. So manatee medicine was not up to speed yet. Nobody had ever sedated or anesthetized a manatee and we were the first ones to do it. That opened up doors for treatment for them from boats and injuries that wasn't there before. So I, I think what you're seeing is that my time at SeaWorld was at a time when the medicine was really moving forward and I got into a perfect fit related to that. But Dr. Walsh, it sounds like while you were at SeaWorld, you had a lot of initiative, drive, you were curious, and I always like to ask guests, what personality traits do you think are critical for a student who wants to get involved in, in your case, aquatic animal health? What do these students need to have to be successful in this field? Probably an important way to look at that, to answering the question of what they need is to realize you don't have to have it when you are interested. You can also realize you can develop it. And that's what I've realized over time. If you put your mind to it, let's say that you didn't have the exposure that led to the curiosity. You can develop that curiosity if you're around people that have that trait. Okay, so what I hear you saying is it's not necessarily these innate traits or characteristics that students need to have. They need to have the willingness to put themselves around strong role models, mentors, educators who can teach them high quality engagement with science and research and wanting to know more. And that agency mentality of, I can do this. I can figure it out. I'll get there if I put the work in. So that sounds very encouraging to, to all students that any personality can do well 
in aquatic animal health if they put themselves around others who can help them get stronger, get better, get wiser. What else does our pre-vet audience need to hear from you for advice for vet school or advice going into the aquatic animal health field? I think the hardest thing is still geared towards building your confidence to the point where you're willing to take a step further than the average person would. And maybe that is that you think, you know what? Um, and I see this because I've been on the admissions committee quite a bit. And when we're in there interviewing students and you're talking to them and asking them questions, most of them, I shouldn't say most, many of them are, are not used to meeting strangers. And they're not used to getting out of that, that shell that they're used to. So what you see from those that are used to being in group situations, that are used to working with other people and, and learning how to be that bit more extroverted, those people do better inside of that room than the ones who come in there with a quiet background. It's really helpful. And I know it's tough to do because you don't know how to set it up. If you could put yourself into these social situations and not necessarily just with friends, and get used to the idea of being asked questions by strangers. We're all there to help you. We're all there for your best interest, but it's still not something you understand yet because you haven't experienced it. And for me, and I guess I'll tell you, I guess I'll tell you this because it's important for you to understand, it took me three and a half years to get in vet school. And I was terrible at sitting in there with 12 faculty members grilling me about stuff. I had spent more time being around other people, learning how to deal with strangers. So it got two weeks before vet school and I got the big letter. Well, I am really excited that everyone got to hear the drive and the energy from Dr. Walsh that it takes to continue to open doors, to approach doors that maybe you wouldn't have approached but all the while knowing that each door can bring you to the next step of your education, the next step of your career. There are so many opportunities, so many options in this field. And right now, while you're listening, 10 years from now, it'll be totally different than what you think it's gonna be, and that's okay. And that's what's the most exciting part about this field of veterinary medicine. Dr. Walsh, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Well, you're quite welcome, anytime. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder to our audience that during season three, we are practicing social distancing, so our audio might sound a little bit different. Today, we have a very special student panel for you. Um, all of our students are coming from different animal backgrounds. We have a small animal, equine, food animal, and wildlife student with us today. So guys, welcome to the podcast. Hey. Hi, Great to be here. Hi, everybody. Uh, I wish you guys could see them. They all look great. They all look happy and healthy from wherever they are across the country right now. Three of our students are actually rising seniors. I can't believe you guys are rising seniors and they're doing externships this summer. And then we have a rising sophomore. So I would love for them to introduce themselves. We'll start with the youngest student first. So Taylor, go ahead and tell us where you did your undergrad and what does small animal mean to you? So I did my undergrad uh, two years at UCF and two years at FIU in Miami and um, kind of have always been into small animal medicine. I worked uh, GP and emergency and small, so small animal medicine to me is, you know, your average dog and cat that comes into the clinic, uh, whether on an emergency basis or just, um, you know, long-term care and treatment. And Taylor, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, where is that gorgeous accent coming from? 
So originally, um, my whole family is from Europe. My mum's English, so I sort of adopted her accent. But I was born and raised in France, so she taught me English and the accent sort of stuck. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and go over to our equine student, Miss Caroline. Let us know where you did your undergrad and what does equine medicine mean to you? Hey everybody, uh, so I'm Caroline. Um, I'm originally from the Chicago area and I did my undergrad at the University of Wisconsin in, in Madison, so go Badgers. Equine medicine to me is, it's really unique because you have this uh, kind of companion animal aspect that you see with it in the small animal medicine world, but you know, there's also so many other things you can do because these animals are athletes. And so a lot of times you are treating them like you would an athlete that goes out and competes and can be profitable and even like a superstar someday. So it's, it's really cool. And you get to meet a lot of really interesting people and horses through it. I love the analogy that you're treating athletes. You could be treating an athlete and it always, when I hear things like that from veterinarians and students, it reminds me, this is a profession and it needs to be taken seriously. And you're caring for some very expensive companion animals or athletes at some point. Now let's go on over to our food animal student. I don't know how often we consider food animals athletes, but Alejandra, go ahead and let us know uh, where you went to undergrad and what does food animal medicine mean to you? So I'm originally from Columbia, but I did my part of my undergrad at the University of Miami. And then I finished my, my undergrad here at UF. Um, and then food animal means to me pretty much, it's just a reminder of where I came from. I was raised in a cattle ranch in Columbia. And uh, I just want to continue on that. Speaking for the people that, that don't really have a, have a current voice within our particular our country, uh, there's a lot of um, politics and, uh, and things that are going on with regarding food animal right now. And uh, I think uh, food animal people and, and people in agriculture need a voice. So veterinarians in this field uh, need to speak out for them. Yes, I love this talking about being a voice for the voiceless, uh, you know, in vet med, that's what students and veterinarians do for all of their, all of the species, but specifically for maybe underrepresented parts of the field, like food animal medicine, rural parts of the country, that's a really um, important piece. So thank you for sharing that. And last but not least, let's hear from Miss Brittany, who's representing the wildlife zoo, but probably specifically birds. Brittany, tell us about your undergrad and what wildlife zoo med exotics means to you. So I did my undergrad at Florida Atlantic University in South Florida. Um, wildlife medicine and zoo medicine to me is just like the best of everything. You see just such a wide variety of species. You never know what's going to walk in the door. And it's just such a field that's like still advancing. Like there's so much that we don't know. So there's a lot of research that goes in, into it, which I really love. And just like being on that forefront of like advancing a field is like really inspiring to me. And just like a lot of the issues that we face with wildlife um, is just due to like a lack of education and like people just being able to be like a voice and be that resource that can educate people and like really make a difference is empowering to me. I think that something that potentially new students to the field who aren't in vet school yet, they really wanna get involved with wildlife and zoom and exotics because those animals are so cool and they grew up seeing them on Animal Planet, but they forget or maybe they just don't know that like you mentioned, research is so important because there's so much we don't know about these animals yet. So it's not, I'm gonna go out and play with an elephant. It's, I'm gonna do a lot of research. I'm gonna learn about these animals. What diseases exactly. do they have, conservation? And that's a huge piece. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Before we get started into each person's area, I think it's great that we have so many different types of guests on the podcast. And since we have four students, I would love to hear a little bit more about what lenses each person is putting on in their daily life. And that could be, do we have any non-traditional students with us? Like maybe somebody who didn't go right into vet school. Do we have a student who is a first generation student? Do we have any um, students on the podcast today who maybe speak other languages? So just have letting our audience know that y'all come from similar lived experiences. So like Taylor mentioned, you know, being from another country and, and so did Alejandra, so all of that. So um, who, who wants to speak to any other lenses that they're bringing to the table today? Alejandra, go ahead. So you actually mentioned a couple of uh, the things that I, that, uh, that I have in my past. Uh, I was, like I said, I was born in Colombia. 
I speak Spanish. I used to speak German, but when I moved to the States, I forgot. Um, but I'm also a first generation student here in the States. And uh, it's been rough uh, learning the, you know, how getting to vet school is. Um, my undergrad was in engineering. It took me seven years to finish engineering. Um, and it took me three, three tries to get into vet school. So it's definitely been an experience. Yeah, similar to um, Alejandra, I um, was a first gener. I am first generation student as well. So venturing through the American college system, uh, undergraduate all the way to vet school was something I sort of had to do on my own. Um, my parents supported me the whole way, but I sort of, you know, was blind to everything, and it was overwhelming at first. But it kind of just did show me that everyone does it differently and there is no right way to really do it. You just, you have to do it for your own reasons and you get there eventually. Uh, so I guess something that's a little bit different for me is that my undergraduate degree was in business. And so it's kind of given me a different perspective going into veterinary medicine. Um, I did obviously have to take the science classes to get the prereqs and I did end up being able to earn an animal science degree on top of it, but like really focusing on business in my undergrad has allowed me to go into veterinary medicine thinking about the idea of having to eventually run a business someday and how to make money because, you know, at the end of the day, it's great, you know, taking care of all these animals and helping people out, but you do have to be able to support yourself and support your job. So similar to Caroline, like I also had a different major before this. I was actually pursuing special education. And for me, like, I feel like that really helped play a role in just the kind of, just the way I like communicate with people. I, those classes that I took in that major, I actually completed about like half the major. And it just like showed me a different perspective of like talking to people and being able to relate to people even if they're not doing a great job at communicating with you and just using those like education classes to be able to uh, expand on the way that I want to someday educate a lot of people, especially going into conservation medicine. Let's get into vet school and your individual packs. So the first question I have for my panel is I want to know the favorite class you've taken so far in regard to your area of interest? Um, my favorite class has been uh, advanced theory. Uh, so theory of genealogies, all reproduction stuff. And that's pretty much everything that I've done for the past, I don't know, like six years with regarding cattle, um, teaching all about like all your, uh, your reproductive cycles um, and teaching you like all the different things that you see, that you can see with, with cattle with regards to reproduction, the importance of uh, reproduction within a dairy herd, um, and then everything that you need to know regarding like the medical, medical aspect of things like surgery stuff, uh, and, 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 and things that you will use on a daily basis as a, as a at least dairy veterinarian. So for me, um, the physiology classes, especially renal physiology, surprisingly, was one of my favorite classes in first year. Um, for me, it just really tied all the physiology classes together. In first year, you're very much learning like the basis of how like a, an animal systems work. So for renal physiology, it really just tied it all together, like the cardio, the respirations, and um, I really enjoyed that. It gets really complex, but that was my favorite class. So for me, one of my favorite classes that has to do like specifically with what, my, what I was interested in is the reptile medicine class. And this year was different actually because we did that class on a Zoom given the COVID situation. Um, and basically we watched all of the lectures beforehand from that were recorded last year. And then we used our Zoom meeting time to be able to discuss with the actual lecturers. So it was a really cool way of doing the class because we got to do like a more of a discussion based type of learning with the people that were actually giving the lectures and kind of network with a lot of people that were like experts in reptile medicine on all different zoos and wildlife centers. And it was just a really interesting way to take that class. Brittany, go ahead and talk to us about how there, there could be a lack of these types of courses that a wildlife or zoo med person could be interested in in vet school because we have 
you know, less information about it and it's such a niche profession. So what are your thoughts on getting an education on these animals while in vet school? So Florida, I feel like is actually unique because we do have, I mean, even though it is a small amount of classes compared to like what you would be taking for small animal, we still do have like a fair amount of classes and opportunities in this field. Um, but for me, a lot of it is getting experience outside of vet school and just especially beforehand was a big, big deal for me to try to like network with different wildlife centers and different zoos. And then during vet school, definitely getting to know your faculty because they are the most involved with the zoo and wildlife animals and getting involved in research is huge and just being able to network. That's like such a big thing in this field just networking and taking any opportunity that you can. Good attitude in life. Shoot your shot. You can't miss. Okay, Caroline, tell me your favorite equine class. So my favorite class was actually a brand new course that was just offered for the first time this past semester. Um, so in the whole class was on uh, equine lameness and diagnostic imaging, uh, because historically that um, lecture material had been taught with the equine surgery course, but they found out that things got really rushed. And so they gave us the opportunity this year to kind of break it up. And so it was a three week course and the course lasted all day long from eight o'clock till about five o'clock. And each day it was broken up by an anatomic region. So for one day we would talk about just the foot and you could probably talk about the equine foot for the whole three week course and still not cover everything. But, you know, we'd have a whole day to talk about uh, in the morning, you know, anatomically what's in the foot going over things that we had learned from first year, but you know, there's a lot of things down there and you can forget some things. So it was a nice little review in the morning to go over that. We would talk about just some common diseases that happened in that anatomical region. And then in the afternoon, we would do some cases, like we would look at old historical cases that they had had come through the hospital on those regions. And then we would get to practice um, on live horses, getting to look at that area. So doing a lameness exam that you're specifically looking at how to, you know, look at the foot, ultrasound, the pastern and different soft tissue regions that are in that area. And then we would get a cadaver leg where we could practice doing little nerve blocks and blocking out joints and things like that, you know, in a safe little environment. And so it was a really unique course. It was a lot of work, you know, it was, I learned so much in that course. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes the courses that are the most work really are the best, even though at the time they might seem a little taxing. Let's talk about clubs and activities within the vet school. So tell me, I'm assuming that y'all are in multiple clubs and uh, folks listening at home, we encourage students not to take on too much, but that's the nature of the vet student. They take on a lot. So tell me your favorite club that you're involved in or activity relating to your specialty. Uh, I do. Um, I am very partial to the uh, equine club that we have here. Being in Florida, there are a lot of horses down here. So with that, we get a really big opportunity to uh, put on a lot of wet labs and bring in a lot of speakers that can, you know, talk about their experience, talk about different you know, topics in equine medicine. And as far as the wet labs go, it's a really nice way to kind of stay motivated as an equine student um, because something that um, you kind of learn along the way as you're in vet school is that the majority of veterinary students are small animal focused and they end up going into small animal medicine, which is great. And you do have to know small animal things because it's going to be on your board, but it can be really hard when you're in these classes that they're just, you know, throwing all this dog and cat information at you. And you say, man, like I know so much dog and cat things. It'd be way easier if I just went into, you know, small animal med, but even though I really like the equine stuff, but back to being in the clubs, it's really nice to have these opportunities where on the weekends I can still do wet labs and, you know, doing ultrasounds on horses and passing a scope and even castrating and doing dentals and things that I get to do myself as a first or second year student. And it really just like kept me motivated and getting me into this point that I'm in now. And, you know, it's just kind of solidified, like, this is definitely what I want to do. So I have the two because they're just like both really special to me. Obviously the wildlife zoo and avian medicine club is like 
wonderful because it's like a similar to why care what caroline said about her equine club it's just like when you get overwhelmed with all of the small animal stuff and you're just like gosh i want to learn about birds they <laughs> that's like your time to learn about those things because you have guest speakers coming in, you have wet labs, just, and it just kind of reminds you like why you went to vet school in the first place. And then another big one for me is PAWS, which stands for Pets Are Wonderful Support. And I'm actually one of the presidents of that club. And we basically give like um, free veterinary care to residents of our Alachua County that are disabled or um, just, terminally ill and financially compromised in some way. And a lot of those clients, like that club for me, just allowed me to really use that education background and the communication aspect. And it was just like huge for me to see that like I could communicate with these people. And a lot of their issues with their pets was just like a lack of education. And it's kind of a similar thing for why I wanted to go into wildlife medicine um, and just that communication becomes so important on making sure that these animals get taken care of. Because if you know all the doctor stuff, but you can't communicate it properly, then it really doesn't matter. So even though uh, Britt and I were uh, members of the exec board for the, for WISAN, for the Wildlife uh, Club, my favorite club is actually a food animal club. Uh, so it's the student chapter, chapter for the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, um, even though it is for bovine practitioners. We actually do everything that has to do with food animals from sheep, goats, pigs. Uh, sometimes we do stuff with birds, like uh, chickens primarily. Um, but what I like to do is all, uh, all the cow stuff. Um, I was the secretary for that club during second year and it's just an amazing club. We get to do a ton of wet labs. We're actually the busiest club when it comes to wet labs. Uh, we do palpations pretty much every single weekend. We do um, castration labs. We do hoof trimming labs. We do ultrasound labs. Pretty much anything that you can think of that a bovine practitioner would do, we do during our labs. So uh, coming into first year, of course, like those first few weeks, you get bombarded by emails of all these different clubs holding their meetings and all the reasons why you should join every single one. Um, so it can get a little overwhelming and even just being interested in small animal medicine, there's so many different specialties and fields that, you know, within the small animal medicine um, world that are represented by clubs at UF. So, you know, being a unique student in that I actually work part time while I'm in school, I had to be really picky um, with what clubs I wanted to join because- I do part time, Taylor. I, am, I did not know any student who actually works like part time. What do you do? So again, I actually have a really unique opportunity that I came into vet school with um, a breadth of experience in emergency that I actually work part time in the UF um, Small Animal Emergency Hospital as a tech. Oh, very nice. Okay, so we're staying yeah. in the field. Okay, wonderful. All right, keep going. So um, as far as the clubs I chose, it kind of stemmed along those interests. I'm in the um, emergency and critical care club and have actually just taken a position on the executive board for you know my rising second year but one of the clubs that i really really appreciated was the radiology club because they had a lot of wet labs especially the ultrasound wet lab that i got to participate in that was wonderful and um that was something i appreciated about all the clubs really is that of course you get the benefits of the wet labs more so if you're involved in them heavily but even if you're not involved in them you can still apply to be in these opportunities in these wet labs and that's what i did and and just all the wet labs that they offered were pertinent to skills that you're going to need um, as a vet so it, it's awesome to be able to start practicing them and start practicing with these um, tools and uh, diagnostic tools Okay, so I'm really excited about doing the podcast virtually because this is the first time I've ever had to have students on their externships on the podcast. So let's, for my three students who are old enough to do official credit externships, um, tell me what's been the best externship so far in regards to your field and do you feel like you're making connections for your future career? Uh, so I have completed uh, two externships so far and I have two more this summer and I 
absolutely loved both of them. Um, so I've been in South Carolina uh, before this and then um, Virginia. Something that I want to do career-wise is um, after I graduate, I'd like to do a one-year internship at a private practice uh, that is in equine medicine. Um, it's so getting to do these um, um, externships at these two places has kind of given me the chance to look and see if these are places that I would want to potentially intern at. And it, with that, you know, they're allowing me to get hands-on experience. So I've been able to do joint blocks. I've been able to perform dentals by myself and even just, you know, working in the hospital and, you know, just doing nightly treatments and giving medications and doing physical exams. That's just time with me touching horses and just getting to, you know, build my experience as a doctor. So I'm currently at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, uh, which is basically a big uh, research and teaching hospital for Virginia wildlife. And it's been absolutely incredible. I've been here for four weeks already. I'm like so obsessed. I have gotten to do a ton of surgery, which I love. The doctors like are really great because they have a lot of confidence in me. And so they let me do surgical procedures by myself. They let me have a student help me. And like, I'm literally leading the OR, which is like so incredible. And um, it's just been so wonderful to kind of, I've made it a point to not ask the doctors for every little thing to, I've been trying to challenge myself to make up my own plans and then like, present it to them saying like this is what I want to do and then if they have suggestions like obviously they would tell me but like it's kind of been inspiring because like it shows me that I actually do know a lot of things so um it's just been such a great opportunity to kind of just get in the field and realize like this is gonna be you in like a year which is kind of terrifying but also really exciting because it like this process is working like i actually know things it's incredible <laughs> well i don't want to cry but i started crying because you know Brittany was one of my pre-vet students she used to call me miss avellino and we've been talking about these days for so long where she would get to do externships and start getting ready for her career so i'm so excited to hear that Alejandro, have you had externships this summer and what have they been like? So I've actually been quite unlucky because uh, I had a month long externship planned in Colorado at an organic dairy, but that got canceled. Um, and then my, I have another externship coming up at the end of the month, but that's looking like it's not going to go through uh, because of our current situation. So I'm actually right now working at, uh, at Alliance Dairies here in, in, uh, in uh, North Florida. And uh, it's been actually really fun. Um, it's hard work, it's outside. You know, I have to wake up at four in the morning and be at the dairy that's an hour away, um, which is, it's tough, but I mean, it's, it's, it's what I wanna do anyway. So it's, it's a good practice to get in the habit of waking up early. Um, but it, it allows me to just get my technical skills, um, doing physical exams, um, practicing or giving medications and just running through a dairy and how it works on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, Alejandro is getting hands-on experience, but getting paid with money. So it's, it's a great opportunity. Which is a rarity because not very many people get, to get paid. It, right. It's minimum wage still, but it's, it's still some money. Which a is little great something. Experience. Okay, I wish I had a great sound effect because we're about to go into a lightning round. So I will ask questions of the entire group. You can unmute yourself to answer, but these are short answer questions to think on your feet. So question number one, must have accessory for your patient field. Palpation sleeves. <laughs> Palpation sleeves, definitely. Okay, who else? Um, a change of place, change of scrubs. <laughs> yes, everyone needs to have a change of scrubs. You're gonna get messy. A teeny tiny stethoscope for listening to tiny little birds. Do they make teeny tiny stethoscopes? They do. They're actually for like little human babies. They're called pediatric stethoscopes or infant stethoscopes. They're like the size of a dime. So cute. Uh, like dry fitting polos and shirts that won't show how sweaty you are when you're outside all day. Yes, I love this question. So now students, if you're listening and you're like, I wanna do all the things, go buy all four of those items. Okay, next question. 
best activity in undergrad to prep for your area? Research. Working in an emergency animal hospital. Uh, my school's equestrian team. For me, definitely research and shadowing. Best resource. This could be plums. This could be Fowler's. What do you think is the best resource? So this is a, an app or a book or a website that your area must have. The exotic animal formulary. Vin, veterinary information network. The um, Haggard pharmacy app. Farad for it's it's for food animal drugs perfect okay um go to so this may or may not be related to your path or your field but your go-to wellness activity to stay well in vet school photography going on a walk with my dog scuba diving workout videos nice and finally what do you think is the best thing if you had to to get somebody to come over to your side of veterinary medicine, what is the best thing about it? What's the selling point? You just have such the power to make an impact on not only animals, but people. And like, that's a big deal for me because you're inspiring people through animals while also helping animals. The specialties in small animal medicine are just getting more and more complex. We have oncology, um, we have orthopedic surgery and more and more of these specialties are getting more advanced. So you can practice uh, really complex medicine for small, animal med uh, small animals. Food animals, it's pretty self-explanatory. People need, need to eat. Horses are great. You know, they, you can do so much with these animals and they just have the most like interesting personalities. Wow, you guys, great perspective, great insight, great resources. What do the pre-vet students need to hear from you to help encourage them? What advice do you have for them when they're approaching vet school? My biggest piece of advice is to get as much diverse experience as you possibly can. Even if you know like 100% you wanna do small animal or large animal, focus a lot of your experience on those things. But like I had food animal experience and the person that interviewed me happened to be a food animal vet. So you just never know. So just get as much experience as you can and really get to know the field because you're gonna see all sides of it in vet school. Um, I, I agree with Britt. Um, I would add to that to not worry too much about having a 4.0 in undergrad. Um, I got into vet school with a 3.3. Um, so grades don't matter. Um, just persevere and just make sure you're positive and have a very, very, very wide array of experiences. Um, to kind of add to that as well is um, do something that you are passionate about and that you can talk about, about what makes you, you and you different from all the other applicants. I think it's really important to even if you have some activity that you love, you know, maybe it's, you know, ice skating, or for me, I was a tour guide and it was great. And, you know, it didn't have really anything to do with animals, but I had so many awesome stories that I was able to tell, you know, in my interviews and in my papers that I had to write. And I think it gave me just a little bit of something else that I could talk about that really gave them an idea of who I am. Yeah, just touching on everyone. Those are great points. Um, diversify your experience. And, you know, getting into vet school, I remember always looking at those average statistics and everything, and you can't help but compare your journey with everyone else's, but there really is no comparison. And getting into vet school, like I said earlier, there's no right way to do it. Um, you just have to follow your heart, you know, be passionate about what you want to do with vet med, uh, find a way to, you know, really grasp that passion, whether it's, you know, in a work opportunity, volunteer opportunity, or, you know, anything like that. And also don't forget, you know, your roots, what you actually enjoy just for yourself. You know, vet med is your career. Um, a, lot, a lot of us, for us, it's our world, but, you know, you, you need to remember what you also enjoy on the side and remember that those make you a great candidate as well, like your sports that you're into, your hobbies and things like that. 
Wow, I think everybody at home is feeling the inspiration from these future veterinarians. Three out of the four of them will be veterinarians faster than a year from now, which is crazy. So I wanna thank you guys for being here, um, taking the time. I know y'all are very busy. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I am Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Just a reminder to our listeners that during season three, we are practicing social distancing so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today's podcast is a very exciting episode. It's our first call-in show ever. And tonight my guests are the University of Florida Pre-Veterinary Medicine Club. Tonight we have 156 members listening in. We're gonna be calling out some names to get their questions answered. And hopefully all of our listeners will benefit from the questions. So, here we go. Our first question is coming to us from Nora. Nora, go ahead and ask us your question. How and where can we get volunteer hours during COVID? Nora, so glad you asked this question because COVID is on everybody's mind. COVID is something that is weighing on everybody. Literally everybody in the world is experiencing it in some way. And you guys are experiencing it at a kind of sketchy time, right? Because you're trying to get your dream. You're trying to go to vet school. So how do we get volunteer hours during COVID? Here's the tricky part. You're applying while other students are reapplying. So you're competing with students who already have tons of hours. So we have to make sure we get something on your resume that looks like you did something during this time. So I would say, step one, make a list of all of the veterinary clinics in your area and start calling them to see who will take volunteers. And some of you may be thinking, no, no, Alex, no one is taking volunteers right now. And that's not true. People are still getting volunteer hours and some people are getting jobs. And now is the time to apply for jobs because all of your classes are online. So I would go beyond thinking about volunteer hours and start thinking about getting a paid tech or assistant job. And in the state of Florida, you don't have to be a certified vet tech to do that. So that's step one. Step two is if you truly exhaust your resources and can't find any volunteer opportunities or paid opportunities, or you just don't feel safe going out right now, which I totally understand, now you have to go to plan B and get creative. So maybe you volunteer virtually by reading to little kids on YouTube, or you donate supplies. Another great option is maybe you don't apply this cycle if you can't get those volunteer hours. I am totally okay with non-traditional students, students who take time off. So if this isn't the year for you to apply because you don't have that experience, that is totally fine. Thanks, Nora, for your question. Up next, let's have Natalie. Natalie, go ahead with your question. Um, what are some good resources to stay up to date with current information and is in the veterinary world? Thanks, Natalie. My first tip always is Google Alerts. So Google Alerts is you just go to Google, you type Google Alerts, and then you can put any keywords you want and Google will email you when those articles come up. So my Google Alerts are set for veterinary medicine, animal controversy, and you better believe that when Tiger King came out, that blew up my email feed. I also have animal ethics and I have FVMA, which is the Florida Veterinary Medical Association. So that would be step one. Step two is to talk to veterinarians. So you ask them, hey, what's going on in the field? What do you think I need to know? What questions are getting asked in interviews? Because if a question is getting asked in veterinary school interviews, it's clearly a hot topic. You also want to stay up to date with current events. So you just want to be plugged in. Uh, we had a student one time who we asked them, hey, what do you think we should do about the fires in Australia? And they did not know that in January, Australia was basically all on fire. And that was kind of scary because it told us that this student isn't plugged in. So you want to stay up to date with current events. So that might be having an app on your phone, like a news app. 
So the emails, news apps, and talking to other veterinarians are probably the three best ways to stay in touch. And you can also be reading articles in JAVMA, J-A-V-M-A, which is the Journal for Veterinary Medicine. Um, so I would, I would be keeping in touch with all of those types of subscriptions. And, and Facebook. So the APVMA, uh, the FVMA, there's a bunch of legit organizations you could be following that will be posting different articles. And our, our Facebook does that too on Fridays. We do a weekly roundup of good information and articles. So I'd be following things on social media. Thanks, Natalie. Great question. Okay, Haley. We have Haley calling in. Haley, what's your question? My question was, what is one thing that you cannot stress enough about the application that needs to be done right or advice, either one? Okay, so these can go hand in hand, right? So my biggest piece of advice slash what you should always do on your application. I probably have a lot of these, but the things that come to mind would one, be yourself. So that's being yourself in your essays pretty much because on your experiences, that's very black and white. It's gonna be lines, lines, lines. But in your essay, showing your personality. So I talked to a pre-vet student today and his essays are so fun to read because I, I already know him from pre-vet advising, but reading them, I know he's being himself. He showed his personality. He listed his experiences. It didn't sound like anybody else could write it except him. So be yourself. I would say, okay, this is another thing that I told him. So same situation, be yourself, but also don't say anything that could distract from the application. So things that could distract would be things like typos, or if you tell your story in not a clear and concise way. So you guys know your story the best. And if you are telling your story and you don't explain everything, you're gonna confuse the admissions committee members and they're gonna get sidetracked, they're gonna phase out, they're gonna miss some of the good stuff you're saying. So you wanna make sure you don't give them anything that's distracting. Another thing that could be distracting, anything that sounds immature. So if you make a comment that says something like, I wanna be a vet because I wanna save all of the animals. That's a big no, because that's not what being a veterinarian is. You can't save all the animals. And if you say things like, I don't like seeing blood, that's a red flag. So you want to avoid these red flags that can be distracting, that seem immature, that seem like you don't understand the field. And then finally, not so much the application, but just biggest piece of advice is plan on applying more than one time. Most of you know, veterinary medicine is very, very competitive. It's competitive because we only have 32 schools in the country and we have many, many more med schools. That's why people say it's harder to get into vet school than med school. It's, it's just fiercely competitive. You're up against superstars and there's not enough seats. So just plan on playing more than one time, prepare for that and it'll, be a, it'll still sting and it'll hurt, but at least you know that it's a serious possibility. Every year, more than 8,000 people apply to vet school and there's 4,000 seats in the country. So those are general piece of, pieces of advice and things to do on the application. Thanks, Haley. Great question. All right, let's hear from McKenna. McKenna, what question do you have for us tonight? Hey, Alex. So my question was, what are some standout qualities um, of many successful applicants? Great question, McKenna. So I have been working at the vet school for five years and I have seen nine classes. So when I think about the classes of successful students and who's really done well, first thing I would say, and you don't find this out until they get to vet school, but you can probably read it in an interview, is they are professional. So how they speak, how they write, so emails, they present themselves well. So they're friendly, they're not complaining, they keep things positive. So I would say just their professional demeanor is something that stands out and makes them successful and will also make them a successful veterinarian. Another thing that stands out if we're thinking about the application, I know this will upset some folks, but I would say that in general, they have something under every piece of the experience section. So the six experiences that you can log on the VEMCAS application, veterinary, which means you worked directly with a veterinarian, animal, 
which means you worked with animals who were not your own pets, but no veterinarian was present. Research, so you worked on a research project, whether it was your own or you worked for a PI, which means primary investigator. Even if animals are involved, that still counts as research. Extracurricular activities, so everybody listening to this call right now already has something to put on their experience section. So that's clubs, organizations that aren't volunteer organizations because you have a volunteer section. This is volunteering that has nothing to do with animals. So giving back to the community, either I would say nature or humans. That's how you can decide if it's volunteer or not. So no animals. And then the sixth experience section is employment. That's a job that has nothing to do with animals. So you worked at Starbucks or you're a camp counselor or we had a student get in from 2024 who was a clown for birthday parties. So I would say students stand out when they have at least one thing in every section. And I know that can sound daunting. However, it is doable and a lot of people end up doing it and that is your competition. So that stands out. So it shows that they're well-rounded. They were able to balance their time. They were able to network. And then if I was going to say one more thing that a lot of successful applicants have, uh, they have real world veterinary experience. They really get what the field is about. So they have worked in a clinic. Now I have some folks who have only volunteered, but they volunteered consistently and they were such stellar volunteers that they got that hands-on experience. They got close with the veterinarian. They learned this was really a profession that they love and can do long-term. The reason those folks are so successful is they're realistic. So they have realistic expectations. They're not shocked when they're stuck uh, working in the clinic after hours. They're not shocked if they have to put an animal down. They're not shocked if a client is super nasty to them and says they're only in it for the money uh, because everyone knows that's not true in vet med. Thanks, McKenna. Lisette's calling in. Hi, Alex. Okay, so I have a question for you. I know there are a lot of career paths to take as a veterinarian, and I really wish I had some kind of guidance on what field is best for me. So at UF College of Vet Med, I was wondering what resources you guys have available for us to help us solidify a veterinary career path. You know, Lisette, I'm glad you asked that because you're right. There are tons of opportunities in veterinary medicine. So, and that's a really great thing about getting your DVM is there's really no limit to the things you can try and things you can do within the field. So you can work on all different kinds of animals. You can work in different types of practices. You can work for the government. You could become a lawyer. There's so many things you can do, which can feel overwhelming because it's like, how do I know what is right for me? So I think your first resource, and these will be resources that maybe you can find through us or through the internet, but your first resource is to know yourself and to know what you enjoy the most. So I know that if I was gonna be a veterinarian, I would prefer emergency medicine because I don't really have a desire to get to know my clients. I have a desire to get things done quickly, efficiently, and move on to the next patient. Some people's personality is they really do wanna to get to know their clients. So they might like things like primary care or actually production animal medicine because you get really close with those, um, those folks who own the herds of animals. So that's so resource one is probably personality tests um, and maybe just journaling and getting to know yourself better. As for the careers in vet med, I would recommend our podcast because we do go over a lot of the different areas of veterinary medicine and you can start to listen to what the vets say and decide if that's something you would want to do. Um, other resources, at the University of Florida, we do offer a course called Careers in Veterinary Medicine where we go over different options. We go over assignments that will help you pick and choose what you like to do. I see a lot of faces on the call who have either taken the class or are in the class. So that is an option. I think attending conferences is a, and in the time of COVID conferences are going to look a little different, but attending conferences put on by professionals and students can expose you to a lot of other parts of the field. And then other than following Google Alerts and what we kind of talked about earlier with resources, I think the best thing a student can do is to be open-minded when they're in vet school and when they graduate and be willing to try and be open to each clinical rotation you're on and to be willing to leave a job that you don't love 
after a year or two. You don't have to stay. Um, get, you know, get what you wanted out of the position, but if it's not right, veterinarians move from practice to practice all the time. And then they find the place where they wanna stay and they love it. So I think having an open mind and being willing to do some research into all of our options are probably the best things you can do to find the career. So that's what I would do, but it is a little daunting because you do have a lot of options. And I will say, studies show having less options makes people happier. So if you go into the grocery store and you have 17 options for jam, one person has 17 options and another person has three options, the person with three options is actually happier because they're able to make their decision uh, more quickly and they don't have FOMO as much because what do the other 16 types of jam taste like? Um, so y'all are in a 17 jam situation, but it's wonderful because you do have options. So Lisette, thanks for that question. Uh, let's hear from Allie. Allie, what's your question? So I was wondering, um, when explaining our activities and hobbies outside of vet med, is anything too small to include? So we're talking about the application, right, Allie? Right. Yeah. So on the application, my opinion is going to be different than other pre-vet advisors at other vet schools. It could even be different than the admissions committee because our admissions committee is made up of a bunch of faculty members who have their own preferences. But if I'm going to give general advice on what to include on the application and what not to include, I would say it depends on the student and it depends on the day. Because just today I told a student that I was okay with them listing a high school sport because it was really relevant to their application. But on a different day for a different student, I might say that's not really relevant. So I think it depends on each person. However, in general, I would say if it's an experience from high school that is veterinary medicine related or employment related or FFA or 4-H, yes. If it's something like prom committee, I would say no, because it's not super relevant. Things like prom committee and student government in high school and National Honor Society is what got you all into college and now focus on what you did in college to get you into vet school. Now, when it comes to the word small, I usually say if an experience is 20 to 30 hours or less, I would probably avoid putting that on the application because those are stepping stones. And the best way it was explained to me was by Dr. Trevetti, who's up at NC State Vet School. She says the stepping stones get the students to the bigger experiences that they list on their application. If they have big experiences, we know they have all of the stepping stones. So we don't need to see the stepping stones. They can actually be distracting. So if you're listing, I took a wet lab here for one hour at APVMA, or I did um, two hour CE at you know, such and such webinar, those kinds of things get a little distracting. If you're gonna do that, I would clump all of them together and say continued education. And then in the description, I would list what they are. I would not list little experiences here and there because it will be distracting. Um, other than that, in general, advice for resumes is you go 10 years back. However, that's more for employment because they want to see how long you've stayed at locations. 10 years ago for you guys, for traditional students, is going to be like high school. And for some of you, potentially, it could even be middle school. So we're not going to go 10 years back, again, unless it's employment, veterinary. Really, it's really only those two things, in my opinion. OK, thanks, Allie, for your question. We get that question quite a bit. And again, you might want to brainstorm it out with a pre-vet advisor or a faculty member to see hey, is this relevant? Do I need to include this? And ask yourself, why am I including it? If you're including it because you have nothing else going on, then you need to get more stuff going on. If you're including it because you have so much happening and you're like, I'm amazing, look at all these things, you don't need to. We can see you're amazing from the college experiences. All right, I'd love to hear from uh, the president of the pre-vet club, Sam. Hi, I would just like to know a little bit more about what we should expect in the interview process and what kind of questions we should look out for. Wow, Sam, what a great question because we're approaching interviews in the time of COVID-19. So 
um, this podcast is going to end up dating itself because hopefully eventually we'll get back to regular interviews, but we're going virtual this year. So questions I would assume will be similar to previous years. And we don't know that for sure yet because we haven't done our admissions committee training, but in general, I don't see any reason why they should change very much. So it's going to be behavioral based. You need to be able to answer, tell me about a time question. So tell me about a time you face conflict. Tell me about a time that you were in a team. Tell me about a time where you knew veterinary medicine was right for you. Or tell me about yourself. So we want to make sure that we're able to tell our own story. The other thing that will come up in an interview could be current event questions. So historically veterinary medicine questions. Um, in the past, we've asked questions like, how do you feel about blackfish, especially if the student was an aquatic medicine interested student? Uh, we might have, I mean, Tiger King probably is gonna come up. I'll be shocked if it doesn't. So they might say, you know, what did you think about this and how should a veterinarian react to it? Other things that could come up, I mean, you wanna be plugged in, like I said, to current event issues. So everything that's going on in our country right now, COVID-19, race issues, um, vet med issues like student debt, mental health and wellness. You wanna know your opinion on all of these things. You wanna have solutions for them. How are you adjusting to it? How have you related to it? Um, honestly though, I think the, question, the two questions that mess students up the most are, tell me about yourself, which you might say, no, that should be super easy, but it's not, people panic about that one, and tell me about a time you made a mistake. And bottom line in an interview, especially for virtual interviews, you need to be engaged. You need to break that wall of virtualness because it's not the same as in person. So you're gonna wanna practice how you come across online. You wanna make sure you have a really strong internet connection because if it breaks up, that's gonna create a distraction. Just like we talked about with essays, you don't want any distractions in there. You wanna make sure that you don't have a distracting background. So I would have a, like a blank wall behind me. So all of these things you wanna think about that we didn't have to think about before. Um, and then I, I would just say practice, practice, practice. A lot of students think that that's not okay. They're like, I don't wanna sound rehearsed. You don't wanna sound like you have a script, but you do wanna sound like you know your stuff. Thanks, Sam, for your question. Let's shoot over to Daniel. Daniel, what question do you have for us tonight? Hi, Ms. Abellino. So talking to current veterinary students, they emphasized a lot with reference to the interview process to make sure you step in and act like you own the place in the interview or exude a lot of confidence. And my question is, how do you make sure you don't seem overconfident or almost arrogant in the interview and kind of strike that balance of not seeming like you're terrified, but also not like you already own the place? Oh, I love this question. Okay, so yes, I think what we're talking about is the difference between cocky and confident. When someone owns a room, it just, it truly looks like they feel confident in themselves and they aren't necessarily feeling like they have to prove something. I think that's where it gets to be a bit of a turnoff when people come in and they're just like listing all of their accolades and they're acting like they have to prove something. Your job is to be a human, to start a conversation, to honestly get them to like you a little bit and feel like the student would be successful in veterinary medicine. Um, you know, historically, we have two faculty members and a student interview you. So your goal is to market yourself to the faculty as this student will be successful, will do well, will be professional and polite when I am teaching them in the classroom. The student, you're marketing yourself to the student. This is a peer that I want to have in the hallways of the VAB. This is somebody who I want to be my little someday. This is somebody who will do our school proud and will make us feel like, yes, we're glad we accepted them. So I think the way to do that is to practice. So just like practicing your interview questions, but what you would do is you would ask the folks that you're practicing with, hey, would you say I came off as cocky or confident? and get their feedback because self-awareness is hard. And sometimes we need feedback from others to tell us what vibe we're putting off. And the other person's perception 
is everything. So we might not think we're cocky, but if everyone is telling us we come off as cocky, that means that we have to adjust. And that might be talking more about a team member than ourselves. That might be being humble and saying things like, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Sometimes people get cocky because they're so nervous and their default is to like brag on themselves. Instead of bragging, you just state the facts that they need to know. You be really objective. It sounds so much better to have the facts and be objective than subjective and bragging on yourself. I think when people tell you guys that you need to own the room, I think they're trying to help with your nerves. And they're trying to be like, don't be nervous. This is your time to shine. Go in there and own it. And what they, what they mean by that is feel confident in who you are and what you've done and feel like you can share your story. And it does take practice. And I think what also would help, think of somebody who you think does this really well. Who do you know who is confident and able to talk about their experiences without being obnoxious? Who is someone who knows their story and try to emulate their qualities and characteristics? And of course, you can always find resources like professional books on how to become a better interviewee. You can watch TED Talks. You can do Toastmasters, which is a professional organization that helps you with public speaking. You can take a public speaking class. So there are also resources out there to help. I want to thank the University of Florida Pre-Veterinary Medicine Club for having me tonight and putting their questions out there. We loved our call-in show. We'll probably do it again. So glad to have more than 150 future veterinarians on the call tonight and so many more listening to the podcast right now. I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder to our guests that during season three, we are recording these during social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is student Jeremiah Owens. He's here to talk to us about being a non-traditional student. Jeremiah, welcome to the podcast. And thanks for having me, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. We always like to highlight different student journeys. We've had a non-traditional student on before, Kim, who's actually in your class, and she talked to us about her journey. Today, we want to hear about you to give students an idea of what it's like to not do a traditional path, to feel encouraged that there's no one right way to get to vet school and to hear about your experiences because you have some unique experiences, wouldn't you say? I, I would say that, yes. And you're actually the president of your class. So we might be asking you a little bit about what that means. What is leadership like? How do you balance an exec board position while in vet school? So first, let's go ahead and start off with, because when I think non-traditional, I think things like age. I think non-traditional majors. I think previous careers, and you're kind of hitting on all of those. So if you don't mind, go ahead and tell us how old are you right now in the middle of second year? I am 32. 32 years old. And tell me, like average wise, how old are the students around you? For the most part, I think the average age of my class is going to be closer to about the mid-20s, probably a little bit, maybe closer to 23, 24. There are a few students in the class who are around my age, but um, we're definitely the minority. Okay, I love the word minority. So what is it like to be a minority when it comes to age in the classroom? How have you fit in, would you say? I honestly don't really think it's been a problem at all. Um, I have an absolutely amazing class. We interact very well with each other. We bonded very well with each other through our first year. And so even though I can be up to about 10 years older than some of my classmates, I still don't feel like I'm that different from them. Okay, so then what would you tell our listeners who are maybe in their 30s, maybe they're in their 40s, and they're like, oh... I shouldn't go to vet school because I hear it every day. I hear pre-vets calling mm. saying, you know, I'm in my 40s 
I feel weird. What would you tell those students? Uh, it's something you can absolutely do. Absolutely 100% doable. I don't think that you should let your age hold you back because uh, I have seen people come through that were at least in their 50s, I believe. And so I don't think that there's an upper age limit to going back to school if it's something you really want to do. 100% agree. And from an admission standpoint, honestly, I get a little excited when I see older students because my thought is life experience. My thought is they know this is what they want to do because they've tr probably tried other things. So I love an older student. Let's talk about majors because that's something else that I think of with non-traditional students. What was your undergrad major? My undergrad major was psychology. Let's talk about why, why was it psychology? How did we get to vet med from psychology? That's a little bit of a journey. Um, when I was going through undergrad at Florida State, I, vet med was nowhere on my horizon at that time. I wasn't you interested. Know, your father is a veterinarian. Yeah, and that's a little surprising, but I knew that life was leading me in a different path. And don't get me wrong, I grew up in that clinic. I, it was my first paid job was washing dogs and cleaning cages. I did homework in that clinic, but I just knew growing up that I didn't have the discipline and the drive necessary to make it through vet school at that time. And life was leading me in a different path. Oh, okay, okay. Well, that to me would speak to the students who maybe had a different mate. So, but are you saying it wasn't even on your radar? How did it get on your radar then? Mm. There were a lot of life events that happened. And I would say that it probably didn't even get on my radar until about, I think I was 28, when I really seriously considered, you know, vet med is something I could do. And I think that it was the fact that my father was a veterinarian that really led me to the world of vet med. Um, but it just... I don't know, something changed as I got older. It was just, all of a sudden it was there. Okay, now with the psychology major, speak to, if you agree with this, that having a non-science, original non-science major, how can that help a student going into veterinary medicine? I think it's interesting to have the perspective from the non-science major, because especially psychology deals with people. and. I know that a lot of people will say that they are interested in vet med because they don't like dealing with people. They love animals, but not people so much. However, you are going to be dealing with people. You're going to be dealing with owners and you're going to be dealing with owners in all different spectrums of emotion. And so having that degree in psychology or some kind of other social science can really help with that. I love the fact that you brought up different degrees of emotion. So I too have a psychology degree and we learned all about people, how they react. And of course, it's not the same as that formal training of becoming a psychologist, but you will see clients who are really excited because you just helped their pet learn to walk again or clients who are really sad because you might have to perform a euthanasia. So having that human degree, that human experience, knowing how to work with others' emotions is definitely gonna be helpful for that veterinarian. So you have a non-traditional degree from, what, what year did you graduate from Florida State? I graduated in 2011. 2000, okay, so that wasn't that long ago with your bachelor's, but then you went on to, to do the post back to get your prereqs completed, isn't that correct? That is correct. So the problem with deciding to go back to school to go to veterinary medicine was the fact that I had none of the prereqs that I needed, none of the sciences. and so. I searched for a way to get those prereqs. And there's actually a program at the University of Florida that's a pre-health post-baccalaureate degree program designed for people like me who want to make a career change and go into some kind of professional public health school. And how many years did it take you to complete that program? It is a two-year program. I it took me a little bit longer. I did it in about two and a half years because I also had to um, become a non-degree seeking student after that program to get one of the prereq classes. Um, but it was about a two year program. Okay, so students, if you have a non-traditional degree, so biology or animal science are the traditional degrees, you get something non-traditional, you realize, oh dear, I don't have these prereqs. You can choose to do them as a non-degree seeking student 
or you can find a degree program like Jeremiah did that's a post back program that builds them all in. So tell me about the post back program. What was it like having graduated years prior with your bachelor's degree and a non-science degree going to school again? What was that transition like? The transition itself was interesting, but it was actually, it, it was different from undergrad because I was older and because now I had the motivation and the drive necessary to start tackling these courses. And so there were people in the post back program from all different walks of life. There were people who were close to my age. There were people who had literally just graduated the University of Florida with a undergrad degree, but decided they wanted to go back and get into some kind of medical school. And so we had a, a nice age range, but it really gave me the experience into taking these courses. And I don't believe I would have actually been successful in vet school if I hadn't have gone through a program like this beforehand. So if your undergrad degree was in psychology, which is very much essay writing, thinking abstractly about human emotion, there might be a right answer, there might not be, then jumping into this post back program that is all science courses chemistries, physics, biologies. Did science come naturally to you or was it a tough transition? Some of the sciences came fairly easy to me because I will admit that when it comes to biological sciences, I generally enjoy them. I enjoy things that I can touch, that I can see, that I can feel, that I can say, look at this, this is real. And I struggled some with my psychology degree because some of the courses that you take in there deal with these kind of abstract concepts. And I liked more of the neuroscience where I could put my hands on it and this is a brain, this is an action potential. And so it was nice to start taking some of these science courses, except for math, didn't like math, never liked math. But when we started getting into the biology and the chemistry and the physics, I really started to enjoy it because it was real. Okay, so it seems like Vet Med has always been a good fit for you. You just found it a little bit later. Okay, so we talked about age. We talked about having a different major. Let's talk about career. You had a totally non-traditional career before coming mm -hmm. to school. What was your career? I was a deputy sheriff. So my career was actually in law enforcement. Did you go right from graduating in 2011 with a psychology degree into law enforcement? Uh, pretty much. I did have to attend an academy. So you have to, there are standards in the state that you have to get. So pretty much the entire year of, of um, 2012, I was in an academy part-time while I worked to put myself through it. And I became a deputy sheriff at the very beginning of 2013. And talk to me how we even got there. How did we go from psychology to deputy sheriff? Well, I think that, remember when I talked about earlier how life was leading me down a different path, that was the path that life was leading me down. I think I always knew that was something I wanted to do. Just like a lot of our listeners are probably going to know that vet med is something they've always wanted to do. It wasn't like that for me. For me, I was drawn to the world of law enforcement. And so I think probably since I was a young teenager, I knew this was what I wanted to do. And so you were a deputy sheriff for how many years? About three and a half. Three and a half years. Are you glad you did it? Are you, or do you wish you had stayed in there a little bit longer? How do you feel now that you're in vet school and that career is now behind you? I am absolutely glad that I had that career because it really taught me a lot of life lessons and it helped me grow as an individual and it helped me grow as a professional and it taught me lessons about professionalism and communication and ethics and integrity that you just can't get in a classroom. Do you feel like having that experience as a deputy sheriff helped you for your vet school interview? I think it did um, because one of the things you have to deal with as a cop is uh, nervous type situations, kind of awkward situations. And an interview can be a little awkward and you're nervous because it's, it's not that you're nervous about talking to people, but it's such a big event that everything is riding on. You have worked for years to get to this interview and you don't want to mess it up. And so you're, you're nervous, 
but having the experience I had helped me overcome that nervousness and just communicate with them and just kind of be myself. Compare vet school to being a police officer. What are the similarities? Oh, wow. Similarities. So it's, um, (laughs) it's different. It's, it's, there's probably more differences than similarities. Obviously you're sitting here and you're doing these tough courseworks. One of the surprising similarities that I have drawn is that law enforcement and vet med, when you really boil them down to their most like simplistic things that you could boil them down to, really have to deal with normalcy. And so when we're in vet school, we're learning about the normal animal. And then we're learning about what's abnormal about that animal. And then how do we bring it back to normal? One of my jobs as a cop, when I got on the scene and something was happening, something had deviated from normal, I had to figure out what that was and bring it back to normal. And so to me, as I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm going through these courses and I'm learning these things, to me, especially in the second year, where we start learning about clinical pathology and general pathology and all these, all these things, they're clues. It's like an investigation and you're kind of starting to pick up what's going on and start to piece together the, the scene that you have to try to figure out what that is. That is one of the deepest things I've ever ever heard on the show. I love this comparison because in the first year we really do teach and emphasize what is normal. So mm-hmm. everybody has that baseline. And then second year where you are right now, it's how, what is abnormal and how do we bring it back to normal? And like you said, if a police officer is called to something, something is not right. Something is not normal. And it's the officer's job to try to diffuse the situation. I would say that Another good comparison, one thing that's helped me a lot through the first year, through COVID, and also through the start of the second year, is flexibility. Because in my previous job, I had to be flexible, and I had to react to things that happened, and I had to deal with problems as they came up on the fly. And vet school is very much like that. You have to be flexible. You have to adapt to situations that come up. There's going to be technological problems. There's going to be issues with, you know, certain classes and you just kind of have to to roll with that. And so that helped me as well. Absolutely. I, you know, the students who are listening, I'm going to guess 99.9% of them have not been a police officer. However, the students who have had a different career, just go ahead and think about what strengths and life experiences you've gotten from that career and you can apply that to vet school. So let's say that mm-hmm. you are a server in a restaurant. You have to be able to handle stressful situations. You oh, have yeah. to be able to multitask. You have to be able to work with others. All things you'll have to do in vet school. A lot of our students come in with lifeguard or camp counseling experience. Same thing. You need to be able to work with others, communicate, keep everything moving at a normal pace like we talked about with normalcy. So mm-hmm. um, whether you're a police officer or not, You're getting good life experience if you're a non-traditional student. You absolutely are. So, Jeremiah, you're the class president for the class of 2023. I am. Talk to me about what it's like to balance vet school and being on the exec board, and how do you think being non-traditional helps you do that? I think that the life experiences that I've had as a non-traditional student have definitely helped me. Um, I have had leadership roles before in my career and uh, other activities that I did, you know, when I was younger growing up. And so stepping back into a role like that really wasn't that big of an issue for me. And the balance aspect of it is definitely a very real part of being a class president. You have to learn how to balance your duties and the coursework and not overextend yourself. But I have an amazing class and I have an amazing group of officers that do really well. So truthfully, there's not really a ton that I have to do all the time. Jeremiah, let's talk about the fact that you're a class president during COVID. So I feel like you're a diplomatic guy, so we're not gonna get the real good dirt or gossip out of you. But 
what has it been like transitioning from in-person learning back in February to then March of the end of first year going virtually? Now you're in the, everyone knows, second year at U UFCBM is the hardest year. So we're about three or four weeks into school at this point, not even. What is it like being a president, hearing everybody's concerns and thoughts during COVID, what is it like as a student? Paint us a picture. It is, a, it is definitely a time commitment. And so there are times that I miss out on lectures because I'm answering something or dealing with something, um, which is fine because we have the ability to go back and to re-listen to those. And so um, it really, like I said before, it's not that big of a time commitment, but you are, as a class president, the first point of contact for the faculty members, uh, for your instructors, and then also your class to reach out to. So whenever there's an issue, you're right there in the middle of it. And a lot of it is about learning how to handle those situations and then where to funnel the proper communication to. So like you said, you're the first point of contact for faculty and students. So you're hearing, let's, let's focus on students, you're hearing a lot of concern, thoughts. Can you tell us some general thoughts and concerns students are having right now and how they're overcoming them? There was a lot of concern when the official fall plan was released by the UFCDM about how we were gonna be doing this hybrid learning method where our lectures are going to be delivered live through Zoom. And we're still going to have some in-person labs, obviously, but there was a lot of concern because some people generally do not do well learning in an online environment. They prefer to be in the classroom and learning in person, which of course we can't do. However, I am very proud of my class because they have absolutely risen to the occasion and met the challenge head on and so far, the averages on our exams have been amazing. Um, very, very, very good averages. And so I feel like my class, yes, it's a struggle. And yes, it is definitely been something we've had to adjust to. And there's had to be a lot of encouragement and listening to concerns and trying to relay those concerns to the faculty and then back and forth. But all in all, I would say my class has absolutely done amazing through this COVID era. Shout out to the class of 2023. What would you say to the students who are listening, who are um, feeling some trepidation about applying in a pandemic, going to vet school in a pandemic? Some of them might want to defer, might not want to attend. What would you tell them? Because you're living it. I would say that it really is, what do you feel you need to do? Because for me, as a non-traditional student, I've already told you, that I'm, I'm a little bit older than the average student. And so for me, waiting another year doesn't seem like an option. I don't want to have to defer. So I'm going to plow through whatever comes my way and I'm just gonna deal with it. If you have the option to defer, there is nothing wrong with that decision if it fits you best. Because at the end of the day, you know yourself, you know how you learn. I believe that if students chose to go ahead and take the online learning approach through this pandemic, they can absolutely succeed. But if they want to wait a year, if they want to take that gap year to get more experience, or maybe you get accepted and you find out it's still going to be online and you're like, no, I don't like that. That is okay because it's what works best for you. Okay, so Jeremiah, um Let's just talk about advice for pre-vet students. We always wanna ask our guests, what advice do they have? And you have a great opportunity as a student guest because a lot of our guests are veterinarians. It's been a little bit since they've been in vet school, but you're in the thick of it right now. Mm -hmm. So what do our pre-vets need to hear from you about advice for them to be successful in this program? I think that one of the best pieces of advice that I can give is that you need, especially when applying, when you're, when you are writing out those essays and then you get to that interview and you're sitting there across from these people, be yourself, sell who you are as an individual. Don't try to be something else. 
And when you actually get here and when you are in school, if you get that acceptance, there is a reason why you are here. You earned that seat. Imposter syndrome in vet school is a very real thing. And there are times where you sit there and you wonder, like, I feel like someone better should have gotten this seat. I don't feel up to par. I'm, I'm here among the best of the best and everyone is out here and they're acing all these exams and here I am struggling with this concept. But at the same time, you deserve to be here. And so keep that in mind as you go through. Sell yourself, who you are as a person. And then once you get here and you're sitting in the same seat I am, remember you deserve to be there. Wow, so encouraging, so helpful. Would you say that being a non-traditional student is an asset and would you do it again the same way to get to that school now? It, well, absolutely is an asset. I would not trade in the life lessons that I learned or the experiences that I had because they truly made me the person that I am sitting here right now. Part of me does wish that now that I knew that this was something I wanted to do, that maybe I had done it earlier. So that way I could already be out practicing right now. Instead, I'm going back to school in my 30s and I'll be 35 when I graduate and start practicing. But at the same time, no, I wouldn't change what I did or the experiences that I got. All right, listeners, whether you're traditional or non-traditional, accept the experience as they come your way, see how they're going to help you tackle this beast that is vet school, and continue on the journey to where you can say that whatever age you end up practicing, you're glad you found your way here. Jeremiah, thanks so much for being on the show today. It's been my pleasure, Alex. Thank you. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder for our listeners that during season three, we are practicing social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is UFCVM alumni, Dr. Stephanie Jones, co-owner and medical director of the Animal Hospital of Fort Lauderdale and CEO and founder of Pets Help the Heart Heal. Dr. Jones, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to hear about your journey through veterinary medicine. So you're an alumni of UF. What year did you graduate? I graduated in 1999. What was it like in vet school in 1999, do you think, compared to vet school today? What do you think are some of the big differences? Oh, my gosh. So it's like, oh, that was such a long, long time ago. But I definitely think that things have changed as I listen to new grads come in and vet students that I talk with. Um, I, I find that for me in our school, and we were talking about this just recently, we were such a close knit family. Um, and I, I feel like that's been carried with me throughout my course in life. Um, I had a group of classmates that I am still currently friends with. So we, we took that journey and that struggle together. Um, we were constantly there. We were a close knit unit. We were supporting and encouraging of each other. And I'm not saying that's what, that's not going on now. I'm just speaking from when I was there. Um, I do feel like there are many benefits that have been added um, through the curriculum. Now I hear a lot of, um, more role playing, more business, more um, making sure your your mind is secure, well being. You know those things were are being focused on more. Whereas I don't feel that we had that part. I hope all vet students get to have the experience that you had with your cohort of being a family. Okay, so Dr. Jones, you work at the Animal Hospital of Fort Lauderdale. What kind of animals are you seeing there? Um, are you considered a small animal general practitioner? What is your day-to-day -day job like? So I am considered a small animal 
a general practitioner. We see primarily dogs and cats. But when I got there, which is quite interesting, the owner at the time and my mentor, she was, she showed dogs. So she was really big in the show circuit. And so she had a special interest in reproductive medicine. And I knew nothing about that. And I was like, okay, but it was, it was, it was her niche. It was part of um, her, her platform. And so she taught me about reproductive medicine. So ironically enough, we do, I do a lot of C-sections. Um, I do a lot of uh, insemination and I'm a fertility specialist at the end of the day. When, we, when I first started there, we were seeing some exotics. I remember getting out and we were, she, the skunk population was a big fad at that time um, in 99. And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't even understand what in the world is going on, but I learned. And so we, we saw that, but then that kind of trended out. And so now we're just dogs and cats. Uh, I'm not familiar with the skunk fad. So are you telling me that people were keeping skunks as pets? What the heck is going on there? Absolutely they were. And it, and it wasn't just one. And so th at that time, and once again, I don't know if things have changed, but they came for their skunk vaccines. And the skunk vaccine was you got a dog vaccine one, one time, then you came back and you got a cat vaccine. And it was those, it was the dog distemper, parvo, the cat feline distemper. And then, and we had to alternate. I remember that so clearly um, for a series protocol. And then after that, I really didn't see them after that. So it was just when they were getting these new baby skunks. And, th and then I was perfectly fine with it until I was doing my research about them. And they were, and what I read, and it, it sticks to me like it was yesterday. They were like, don't eat chicken or don't eat meat and have that smell or scent on your fingers because they could potentially take your fingers off. And I don't know where I found that resource, but it sticks to me like it was yesterday. So even though I did the work, I was a little scared. <laughs> <laughs> at the time fake news like do, were they being serious that the scent would take off with the chicken was that was that legit research I, it was it was one of the little handouts and and um <laughs> and it was crazy and um well you know the whole this whole idea of this skunk fad is really interesting did not see that coming i feel like veterinarians often have really unique stories funny stories, animals are funny, funny things happen. I'd also like to ask about the fertility piece. So what, let's, let's get ethical. If my thought is, so let's say someone is not an animal person and they think animals are supposed to be left to do their own thing, let nature take its course. If a dog let's go with dogs, can't get pregnant or have fertility issues. What are your thoughts on the difference between nature taking its course and a veterinarian stepping in to help make that pregnancy happen and come to term and be successful? So I love what you said about nature taking its course. And so ironically enough, that is who I am. I am willing to put in the work and do the work and come up with some ideas. And most of the times it's, it's a matter of either their dog has already gotten pregnant or there are some breeds that they just unfortunately can't do the work, do the action and they need assistance. And so when I communicate to those clients, I'm saying, I'm going to use my knowledge as a veterinarian to help guide this process. But at the end of the day, I say it's in God's hands, it's in nature's hands, you know, and, 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 and I don't waver on that at all. So we're going to work this thing, but if it happens, it happens. If it's not, we might need to spay that dog. And I do feel that clients respect that statement at the end. Some might, but that's who I am. And one of the things that I will say is that I am true all day, every day. Some clients like that, some don't, and you have to be okay with that for um, vet students. 
Oh, I feel like we could unpack this all day because students have to learn what their boundaries are in vet med, what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do, stick with their convictions, maybe make clients unhappy, but at the end of the day, you have to feel confident in who you are as a doctor. And like you mentioned earlier, we're trying to give students that more well-rounded education with mental health and wellness, but also that confidence piece of feeling comfortable with what they're gonna do. So I appreciate the belief that, okay, we have this medicine and these tools and techniques that we can use, but we're only gonna take it so far until it's time for this owner to make a decision. So I love that. Okay, let's talk about, you have stayed at your practice for 20 years. That is older than some of the folks listening to the podcast right now. So can you tell me why you think you've stayed in one location for so long when maybe the trend for this generation is to hop around from place to place? Talk to us about that staying power. The staying power, kind of came in the fact that when I first started there, so I had a um, employer who welcomed my help, my assistance. And I, at that time, looking back, I felt like she was actually grooming me for whatever to come, you know? And whether that was I was gonna move on or not, and she allowed me to help that practice grow. And, and then it's not just me, uh, the other two associates that are there, one of them is still there with me. So if I'm 21 years, she's 22, 24. And it's that same thing as vet school. We became family. I mean, I'm hearing a theme of, we've, I'm hearing two things. I'm hearing the theme of family because you talked about that for vet school. You had that family, that close-knit group, so you're also having that in your practice. And the fact that you got to grow, be innovative, now you're the co-owner and medical director, It's to me it sounds like it, it's not a stagnant 21 years. You've been doing so much innovating, growing, so students should recognize what values do they have and will that practice embrace those values. So if someone has the value of being a leader, being a teacher, getting innovative, growing, all of those things, and they recognize that in the practice owner, that's something they want to embrace. Are we telling our audience, find the place that's gonna allow you to grow and embrace your values, and that will help them see if they like where they're at? I think so, well, and I'm not saying that that's gonna happen at every place, and I, this was my second uh, place and I ended up, you know, the first one didn't work out so well. So I do, you you do have to figure out, you know, who you are, your foundation, your core values personally, and then find a place that, that taps into that and do Absolutely. a self, -check, a self check once a year. Oh, I love that. A self check once a year. That's a good idea. And that seems very manageable for people who are like, oh, I can't do this all the time. But once a year is totally manageable. What is what would a self check for you look like every year? So I guess the self check would be, am I still growing and learning? Are there opportunities for me to do that? Are they still willing to listen to me in terms of those things that I'm bringing to the table? Um, are they am I Am I still happy getting up, going to work every day? Um, am I providing outlets for myself? Are there opportunities to provide outlets for myself? If things are starting to stagnate out, what am I creating for myself to rejuvenate me? Okay, so audience, go ahead and make a checklist for your once a year check. Are you feeling fulfilled? Do you still like getting up and going to work in the morning? Do you have opportunities to create? If things are feeling stagnant, are you finding something outside of work that will give you joy, to give you energy? Maybe are you doing some continued education classes? All of that, put it in your calendar for once a year to do a self check. Dr. Jones, let's talk about pets helping the heart heal. What is it? I'm assuming it's a whole nother family that you have. So tell me about that organization and that movement. 
we created a whole event for foster care kids to come to the animal hospital and see the day in the life of a veterinarian. And our core values are educate, uplift, and inspire. So everything that we do is going to educate, uplift, and inspire you. So each exam room had an objective to educate from the pet exam to learning about toxic plants and animals in your, or um, things in your household to reviewing x-rays, trying to figure out what they, this particular animal ate to dressing up as a surgeon and assisting in a mock surgery. Um, and in between that are puppy love sessions. So you, those kids have an opportunity to sit in a corner, we have a romper room. And so we had clients, they were volunteering all over to share in this experience. So the clients brought in their pets and I loved, it was all different breeds, all different ages. So if that particular child needed to laugh their eyes out because this puppy was running around and licking them in the face or doing that, that's what they needed. If that, per, if that child was quiet and just needed to sit in the corner with an older dog and just pet him because we are, have that natural instinct for touch. And so that lowers their stress and their anxiety at that time. Um, and then the group leaders were responsible for capturing moments. And so we had Polaroids and they would take pictures of them with that smile and that interaction. They decorate and they take that home. So for a moment in time, they get to remember when things were good, when life was stress-free. And then we do um, reading with pets. So that is our newest thing virtually. We do reading with pets across the nation. So now we have kids and now I'm just wanting to promote literacy. So it's not specifically for foster kids because they can't get on social media, but now it's just kids in general. I just need you to read for 10 minutes a day. So if that means you get to read at your place to an animal in Hawaii, then do that. And we're gonna showcase that on Facebook Live or Instagram Live. So we're actually doing that this Saturday for our September event. And we do comfort packs. Um, that is our service project. So we know that foster care kids are just so quickly uprooted and they move from one place to the next. So we provide backpacks full of essential items and toiletries and things of that nature. And we distribute those out. So that's pretty much Pets Help the Heart Heal in a nutshell. Oh, there's so much good stuff going on here that I can't handle it. So, okay, students who are listening, what I really want you to take away from what Dr. Jones just said is you thinking about what can you do in your future practice to emulate a model like this. We can all be doing more for the community. We can all be doing more to expose students to veterinary medicine, particularly underrepresented students in the field. We have the opportunity to be leaders. I mean, encouraging literacy is so important that you could be helping so many kids in a practice is so encouraging. And the fact that COVID hit, you guys didn't stop innovating. You're like, okay, what can we do now? We're gonna do this virtually. Everybody can be getting this creative. So I appreciate the work you're doing and now the brainstorming that can happen for everybody who's listening for the opportunities that they can make in their own practice. Tell me why you think it's so important for veterinarians to continue to give back to communities. I think that we have been so fortunate and blessed to reap the benefits of our career paths and our human animal bond that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. So to give back, I, I don't, for me, it's just natural. I, I want to be able to take, the benefit for me is that I get to do the two things that I love. I get to work with kids and I get to do veterinary medicine. So yeah, I could have gone and just volunteered at Boys and Girls Club or, you know, I could have Jack and Jill or, you know, and just been just a, a mentor in another place, but I get to take something that I love to do and make it engaging and encouraging. And so that's a blessing to me. I just feel like it's so, so important. And however you can do that in your community, 
you know, whether it is just even, you know, animal welfare or, you know, it doesn't have to be with kids, whatever it is that you value, and then you can take it and make it work and just, and just give that, give, give of yourself, give of your gifts and talents back to the community. Yes. Know your strengths, know what you can give. Maybe you're really passionate about climate change or you're really passionate about end of life issues with humans and hospice. There's a lot of things that a veterinary can do with animals and their practice to help all kinds of issues. It just takes getting creative. And if you're sitting, listening to this and you're like, creativity is not my thing. Tell someone else who is creative what you're passionate about and let them brainstorm with you. You don't have to figure it out by yourself. Dr. Jones, we always ask our guests to talk about what personality traits do you think are important for a vet student, pre-vet, future veterinarian to have to be successful in the role that you're currently in, which would be small animal, general practitioner, entrepreneur, side hustle, extraordinaire. What kind of personality traits do you think are important for a pre-vet who wants to go into small animal GP? So personality traits, so I would say compassion, dedication, to be motivated, understanding, ironically enough, even a little bit of discipline in terms of just your life and discipline and okay with saying no, how, whatever trait we want to put personality into doing that. Um, and oh gosh, there's just so many components that are there. Um, ooh, forgiving, absolutely. Um, I, that's I'm learning that one myself moving forward, um, as far as that goes. So I think those are the main ones that I am um, that I think are very very important. Um, and then you know. I'm sure there's a word, you know, being able to have moments, put yourself in someone else's shoes, because that one I'm working on myself <laughs> um, to, to better understand where they're coming from and how to go from there. Wonderful. And what advice do you have for students who are listening, who are getting ready to apply in the application cycle? Maybe they're a few years out and they need to hear some strong advice. What would you tell them? So I would say, don't sweat the small stuff. I, I feel that what I'm seeing is a lot of students that come out, they want to take on the world and put the weight on the, of, the, of the world on their shoulders. And, you know, everyone says you just have to bite off one piece of the elephant at a time. And, and then at the end of the day, just breathe. Just breathe um, because there's always tomorrow. Uh, read everybody who's listening right now. Take a deep breath. Do a self check on how you're feeling with your current situation, whether you're in school, at work, maybe you're a veterinarian and you're wondering if it's if your job is fulfilling you in the places it needs to. I want to thank Dr. Jones for being on our podcast today. We're going to have to have her back so we can keep talking about family, skunks, and staying power. Thanks, Dr. Jones. Thank you so much. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder to our audience that in season three, we're practicing social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is Dr. Chelsea Rivera, the Fort Sam Houston Veterinary Treatment Facility Officer in Charge. Chelsea, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. 
So uh, audience, uh, Dr. Rivera is a class of 2019 alum. So I watched her journey through veterinary school and now she is a veterinarian in the military. And I'm so excited to have her because we get a lot of questions about what is it like to be a vet in the military? What is it like during vet school to know you're going in that direction? What are the scholarships like? So I'm really excited that Dr. Rivera can talk to us about that today. So my first question is, when did you know that you wanted to go into the military as a veterinarian? Uh, so it was pretty much um, as soon as I heard about it while I was in um, undergrad and I was part of the pre-vet club, because um, one of our you know, pre-vet meetings that we had, um, we had a recruiter come and talk to us. And so, um, you know, those recruiters, a recruiter assignment is, you know, just like anything else, like they switch out all the time. So the recruiter that I talked to that night at pre-vet, you know, they were long gone by the time I decided I wanted to do it, but I still had the contact for um, the recruiter, the medical recruiter in Gainesville. And so, um, you know, I just, I hit them up as soon as I got in or once I got my acceptance letter, because you can't actually apply for the scholarship until um, you uh, get into vet school. Um, so that's when I started it. But, you know, it took me a while to get into vet school. So I had that contact in the back of my mind for several years. So so the recruiter came and it was that talk that got you thinking, this is something I am interested in. What were some of the things that the recruiter said that made you think this is a good option for me? Oh gosh, you're asking me to go back like <laughs> probably like seven years. Um, let's see. I mean, I know like they just, they talked about the scholarship. They talked about travel opportunities. Um, they talked about, you know, working with um, like military working dogs and that like, you know, you're still pretty clinical for the most part while you're, um, while you're in, it's not like, you know, it's not like you're just doing military stuff all the time. Um, so, you know, it, it sounded like a fairly decent quality of life and, you know, with, along with the scholarship, it was great because they help you pay for vet school. So it was kind of perfect. Now, is there one scholarship, is there one type of scholarship or are there multiple scholarship opportunities? And do you know anything about how many students per year get them? I know we could Google this, but what do you know about it? <laughs> so from what I know and the last time that I looked at like the statistics, um, as far as how many people get the scholarship, it's usually around like 30 or so a year. Okay. Um, but it's, so it's called the Health Profession Scholarship Program or HPSP. Uh, at least that's the one that I did. Um, and there are, that's not just veterinarians. That's also like uh, dentists, nurses, med school, that type of thing. Uh, so in that entire applicant pool every year, like there's only about 30 or so vets that veterinarians that get it. Okay. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other health professions that apply for it and, and get it too. Sure. Um, and as far as like the different types of scholarship, I do know um, there are other like ROTC scholarships, mm -hmm. um, but I don't really know too much about that just because that's not really the route that I went. Sure. Okay. So students listening, if this if scholarships interest you and a military career interests you, which we'll dive deeper into what does that even look like, you should be looking up opportunities. So Dr. Rivera, can, do you know how much your scholarship was for? Uh, so the, the scholarship is for three years of tuition. And then they also, if you, you know, if you have the scholarship, um, it's, it gives you like, it changes every year just because of the, you know, typical cost of living and whatnot. But um, it's like a $2,200 a month stipend. Well, that's like wonderful. living and stuff too. Sure. So you said you can't even apply for the scholarship until you get into vet school. Correct. Do you remember what the application process was like and why do you think you earned the scholarship? Huh. Uh, the application process is very long because um, um, you have a background check too that goes along with it. So there is an application. Um, there are a couple letters of recommendation that you need for the application. And then there was a type of letter. Um, it wasn't quite, it was, I think it was called like a letter of intent of like why you want to serve sort of, but not really, it wasn't necessarily like vet related, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so then they, they paid for three years of vet school. And so what did they get in return from you? What is the, I assume you're, you're giving time. What's that look like? 
Right. So uh, the program is that you have to give one year of active duty service uh, for every year that you receive the scholarship. So essentially, it's three years of active duty. However, um, your first year out, uh, they are making all of the veterinarians go through a program. Um, we call it FIGV for short, but it stands for uh, First Year Graduate Veterinary Education. So it's F-Y-G-V-E. Uh, and it's kind of like an internship that like you're learning how to be an army veterinarian specifically. And that year actually doesn't count towards the time that you owe. So it's really four years essentially that you, that you have to pay back. When you say active duty, what does that mean? What does it look like? What could it look like? Well, so active duty is just, uh, it's really just the difference between, you know, like how the army classifies you. Like when you're active duty, basically your typical nine to five job day to day is something military related, like, you know, or army, but there's, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole lot of active duty people doing their job in the military. But then if you're reserves, then reserves is usually, um, you know, you have like a different non-military job, but you have an obligation, um, you know, it's like one week in a month, two weeks a year to, you know, go do military things, but then you go back to like your typical job. Yeah. Did you have to go through boot camp? Uh, no, not really. Um, it's, it is sort of a, it's, it's what they call basic officer leadership course. So there is a little bit of a physical aspect to it. Um, you know, we PT'd like every day um, or, you know, physical training. And uh, there was a lot of classroom stuff to it too. But um, yeah, it's, it's not like your typical boot camp that you think of when, you know, you see the military movies and people are screaming in your face and stuff like that's Okay, <laughs> so you can't like do an inordinate amount of push-ups or anything? Uh, me specifically, or like, you mean that they make you do? Like, I mean, I know you're pretty strong, because I know you do, you know, you do dance and everything, but yeah, yeah like how many push-ups can you do? Uh, so for my PT test, um, I usually max them out at 50. Not, but, wow, yikes. <laughs> so I know that I've had a lot of pre-vet students tell me that they were interested in going to the military, but their parents were worried that they were going to be on the front lines of duty. Can you speak to what does a veterinarian do in the military? What could that look like? Uh, so it depends on the type of unit that you're with. Um, Cause there are some units that are what they consider to be um, like an operational unit uh, where you kind of, you do, you do like your normal kind of day to day job and trainings and stuff, but then you can be uh, activated to go um, or you can get deployed essentially. Um, so I'm, I'm not in that type of unit. Uh, I'm in, essentially, I'm, I'm running a clinic um, in Texas. And so I'm basically not on the list to like get deployed. So that's just, that just is the characteristic of the type of unit that I'm with. Did you get to pick um, that unit or did you get assigned? Kind of both. Um, you can say that like, I, this is the one that I prefer. Um, doesn't mean you're going to get your preference. Never does. It's always needs in the military. Um, but you know, there is a need for veterinarians to run the clinics that are on bases and stuff. And then, you know, of course there's also a need for, um, veterinarians to be able to deploy if need be. So yes, we do get deployed. Um, we're not always necessarily on the front lines, but I mean, it absolutely is possible that, you know, you're in a, in a hostile area. Now you're talking, you said, you know, the clinics on bases. So what kinds of animals are we finding on bases that you could potentially be working with? Uh, I've only ever seen dogs and cats. Um, and they're, they're just, they're the animals of the people that, you know, have, uh, privileges at the clinic. So like active duty people, reservists, um, some of the people that just work on a base, some civilians that work there, they can, they can use our services. Um, so it's still like privately owned animals. Uh, oh, but then we also, if there's like, you know, if there's a military police unit and they have dogs, we'll see those dogs. We'll see, um, you know, other government agency dogs sometimes. And then sometimes for training purposes, like, you know, we might do some, some of the bases around have, um, 
have equines too. So actually um, where I'm at now has um, the, like the ceremonial horses and stuff that are in like funerals and whatnot. So I'm actually um, sort of in charge of their medical needs too. Um, that's not at every base though. It's actually pretty um, few and far between that we have the horses that do that. So a potential military vet needs to be like versed in a mixed practice kind of situation where they can do a little bit of everything. I mean, it sounds really cool. I, you know, you were explaining to me before we started the podcast, I was asking what branches of the military can vets work in. And you mentioned that army is the only one that has like the, the option to be a vet. Can you explain that, that situation? Yeah, so as far as I know, um, if you are trying to be a, like a normal veterinarian, um, they're, like, pretty much Army is the only branch that has a veterinary corps. And as such, we help out a lot of the other branches, um, you know, if they have, like, food that we need to inspect, or if they've got, um, you know, working dogs that need to be seen or whatever, then, you know, we... There's also clinics on those types of bases too. So we go and work at, you know, Air Force bases, Navy bases, Marine bases. So yes. your route was, you learned about the Army scholarship, you got into vet school, you got the scholarship. What about for students who go to vet school, don't get the scholarship, and then graduate and want to go into the military? That's an option, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, there are certain incentives for those people that want to do that. Um, it's a little bit different, but you definitely get some money towards your student loans. Um, and I mean, you can even specialize and decide to go into the military. You know, you can, you can do reserves that route. You can do active duty that route. Um, you know, it's just a matter of getting with, you know, your local medical recruiters and, and talking to them about their options. But yeah, that, that is absolutely a, a thing. You know, you, you don't have to get the scholarship to be, or, jo or, or have been an ROTC to, to join the Army. So were you the only person in the class of 2019 with the scholarship? I was, yep. Were, and I feel like we have one or two students every, like, you know, when there's a four years going on, one or two. Mm -hmm in a class and you know not in a class but in the four years um so that's a minority you were mm -hmm. the only one in the class of 2019 mm -hmm. how many vets do you know who are doing what you do like how does it feel to kind of be in a very small pool of this type of veterinarian you know 80 percent of our students go off to do small animal not in the military so what is that like uh I'm not gonna lie it's actually it's kind of weird sometimes um because I feel like since I'm not in the clinic all the time necessarily, or I, you know, I'm not working side by side with a vet that's been out for several years and I don't have that absolute direct mentorship that people would necessarily have in an internship or, um, you know, even just a private practice. Um, my clinical skills might not be as up to speed as some of my classmates after they've gotten out, um, just because just of the amount of caseload. Um, you know, they're obviously seeing a ton of appointments a day and, um, you know, we're busy, but I just, I also have other things that like I need to do. Like I might need to go do a sanitation inspection on some, some place on base. And, and like, there's other, there's a lot of other like admin type of duties that I have to do. Um, cause when you're, when you're in charge of a clinic, um, you're kind of like the practice manager at the same time too. So, um, I'm not in the clinic 24 seven and a lot of times, the clinics are actually pretty um, low tech, not really quite the right word, but um, we're, we're limited on what we can do just because of the equipment that we have. Um, so some places don't even have like an x-ray table. They have to like refer out essentially. And some places can't do surgery. And um, it just, it depends on their personnel. It depends on um, the equipment that they have. So, you know, it's just, it's kind of, it's dependent on where you are. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how, it, I don't know, I feel I'm a little bit behind, but at the same time, like I'm getting a lot of other really cool experience. So, um, what are some of the normal cases you do see? Uh, lots of just like wellness visits, um, with, you know, vaccines and stuff. Um, especially, especially with any of the pets that live on post, because you have to have your vaccines, um, for your animals when they live on post. So, um, we see a lot of wellness appointments. We see a lot of health certificates. Um, lots and lots and lots of health certificates because people are moving all the time. 
Um, sure. So, um, so we do a lot of that, uh, and still pretty much the same as most GPs. You know, a lot of skin stuff. Um, you know, the occasional eye stuff, but especially in Southeast United States, definitely a lot of a lot of skin. You've been through military leadership trainings. Mm -hmm. Tell me, now that you've been through a lot of these trainings, mm -hmm. what are like some big pieces of advice that you feel like pre-vet students could take away from military trainings? What are some things that are very relatable and transferable? You have to learn to be able to take care of yourself um, because the military is going to pu pull you in a whole bunch of different directions and you need to do a lot of different things. Uh, you definitely need to be flexible. Uh, and in order to do all of that, you need to make sure that, you know, you're eating right, you're sleeping well, um, you know, you're taking care of your fitness, um, you know, some, some way to de-stress, you absolutely need to be able to, to do that, whether you're military or civilian. Um, and just take care of the people around you. Um, some of the biggest things in uh, the military is like, as as a leader, like you you should be, like your top priority is taking care of the soldiers around you. Um, especially the lower enlisted um, that, you know, you, you're you the boss of, of those people. And, um, you know, it's, it's not gonna be a very good time for the rest of the people in your clinic if, you know, it's all about me, 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 me which I know getting into vet school, it kind of can be, um, and kind of going through vet school even, you know, it's, it's you know, my grades, my time, my, you know, whatever. It's, it's very self-focused. Um, so the sooner you can learn to like take care of the people around you, um, you know, of course you still have to take care of yourself, um, but you know, look out for them and, and try, to, try to help when you can. Um, you know, I think it speaks volumes for, for leaders that know how to do that. Okay, let's play a little game called fill in the blank. I'm going to make a statement and you fill it in for prospective students. Prospective students should consider a career in the military if they love... If they love serving people and animals just as much. Ooh, I love that. I love that. And I'd, I'd encourage all of you listening, no matter what type of veterinarian you want to be, please want to serve people. Okay. Prospective students should consider a career in the military if they enjoy. If they enjoy working out. Ooh, how, do you work out every day? I am trying to run like three days a week. Um, but like lifting has kind of fallen off a little bit just because gyms are icky <laughs> um, right now. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately I'm not working out as much, but um, you know, physical fitness is definitely a huge part of military um, career. <laughs> or prospective students should not consider a career in the military if they only want to do clinical stuff ever, <laughs> like for the rest of their career. Okay, so they need to be able to enjoy a variety of different yes. opportunities. Absolutely. And those could be anything that's needed in a military base? Um, I mean, not necessarily like military related, but just, you know, if people, if people don't want to like do a lot of paperwork or they don't want to do like public health stuff, if they don't want to do you know, if they just want to stay in the clinic and they, you know, they, they're not really interested in trying to like, you know, and they just want to do like medicine, 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 um, might not be the best option because like I said, uh, military pulls you in a lot of different directions. And so, you know, you, you're not always in the clinic. Like that's just a statement of fact. <laughs> the one thing I would want prospective students to know about a veterinary career in the military is... The quality of life is pretty great, not gonna lie. Um, we get a lot of four day weekends. Uh, for the most part, it's pretty nine to five. Um, there's infrequently on, on call. Um, and usually if you're on call, you're only on call for like the military working dogs um, and not privately owned animals. So it took you a couple times to get into vet school. How many times? Four total. Four total. 
What advice do you have for our listeners who are not in vet school yet? What do you got? I have a couple pieces of advice. One, don't give up. If this is truly what you want to do, then do not give up. Keep improving yourself um, for each application. Uh, and like, don't let that discourage you because, you know, the more discouraged you get, the less likely you're going to try and improve yourself. Um, you know, so, so don't give up. Um, two, again, like I kind of just mentioned, constantly improve yourself, like get more experience. Um, you know, if you need more experience or varied experience, like keep getting it, keep seeking out, um, those people that will help you. Um, and then another one is definitely, uh, form good relationships with people that might, um, write you recommendation letters. Um, you know, you want people to get to know you, um, you want people to get to know your work ethic, uh, work really hard, um, at the clinics that you're trying to either work at or volunteer at or, or anything like that, but just make sure that it is a veterinarian and make sure that, you know, you leave a good impression because those people, will, if you have a strong letter of recommendation, or a couple from a couple of veterinarians, that's going to help you for sure. For sure. Yes. Um, and then if people want to follow my Instagram, they absolutely can. If you want me to put that plug in here, but yeah, go ahead. What's your Instagram so they can learn more about military life. Uh, my Instagram is at that army vet chick. Well, Dr. Rivera, thank you for your service, protecting our country and our animals. And thank you for being on the podcast today. I'm really glad you got to explain to me and to our audience what it actually looks like to be a veterinarian in the military. I think a lot of students will be looking into those scholarships. We're going to have a major Google uptick today, I think. <laughs> I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder to our audience that season three is filmed during social distancing, so the audio might sound a little different. Today, my guest is Dr. Monsell. She is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Florida Large Animal Clinical Sciences. Dr. Monsell, welcome to your first podcast. Thanks, Alex. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you because we have only had one other full-time real food animal veterinarian on the podcast, and that was Dr. Ray. He came on season one, so it's great to have somebody else who can talk to us about ruminants, and I know cows count as ruminants, so I'm really glad that you can uh, talk to us about that today. First, I'd love to ask you, where are you from? Because you have a fabulous accent. <laughs> I'm from Australia. I grew up there, and I went to vet school there. And, and which, which university is in Australia that, that you went to? University of Melbourne. University in, of Melbourne. in Victoria. Okay, and um, was that a program where you could go right out of high school, or did you do, need to do some college first? That was a program that you could go right out of high school when I went in. It's not anymore. So now it's set up the same as our programs are in the US. Okay. So you were a really young vet when you first got out of school. So, so I wonder if part of the reason why potentially you have a lot of degrees maybe could be because of that journey. So can we break down some of these degrees here? I see sure. that yep. you have your... BVS, so the Bachelor of Veterinary Science from University of Melbourne. Then how did you end up at University of Illinois for your internship? How did that happen? So really that happened because I got married to an American. Oh, and fun. he wanted to come back. He was from um, Arkansas, but he wanted to come back to a job in Illinois. And we, we moved there and there was an internship opened in production animal medicine right about the time that we moved. And that all worked out really nicely. That is really, yeah. Now, Illinois versus Australia, which do you prefer? Ah, uh, <laughs> Illinois versus Australia. I have to say Australia, that's where my heart is. But I've really, I really enjoyed everywhere we've lived in America. Okay. Yep. Uh, so a one year internship in production animals. Yeah, it was in um, production animal medicine and surgery. So it's okay. a 
at both of those. How did you get started? Because so most of the kids in the States go into small animal medicine. So tell me how you even found production animal medicine. How was that even on your radar? So I, d I grew up in a country town and I had horses on my childhood and was really into those. So I was a bit of a, a pony club nerd in Australia. Um, and I actually, when I went to vet school, I thought I probably wanted to be an equine veterinarian. Um, but I had always, I, I had a little bit of experience with cows. I kept my horses on a dairy farm and had some experience there. And I had always really enjoyed cows as well. And when I got into vet school, I discovered that cows were so awesome that I just wanted to keep working with them. Um, but I did go into mixed practice when I first graduated from vet school. And I was in that in Australia for two years um, before I came here. Can you, so mixed animal practice, can you give that definition to our listeners? When we say mixed animal, what do we mean? So that can encompass a variety of different practice types, um, but it, it basically, usually when people say mixed animal, they mean that there's a mixture of large and small animal species that are seen by that practice. Um, the practice that I was in was really a pretty true mixed animal practice. So we, a, probably on an income level, we had about 70% of our income was small animal and 30 was large, but probably on a time allocation basis, it was more like 50, 50. Um, and we saw, yeah, saw a variety of large animal species and, and all the regular small animal species as well. Can you talk about the benefits of being a part of a mixed animal practice versus one that focuses solely on equine or production animals or small animals? Why would a student maybe love being a part of a mixed animal practice? I guess the things that are really um, awesome about being in a mixed animal practice is that you get to, um, I guess, you, you get to a lot of variety in your day. So you, you're not doing the same thing every single day or seeing the same types of cases every single day. You get lots and lots of variety. You get to be in the office um, or in the, in the practice um, some parts of the day or some days of the week. And then you get to be out on the road um, in the fresh air seeing clients out on their farms for some of the week. So you get kind of the best of both worlds. Oh, that does sound real. I do like that idea of you kind of, you're not stuck in one location. You're not stuck in the office. You do get to go out and get to be outside, um, you know, with those herd animals. So that sounds, that sounds wonderful. So you went from vet school to some mixed animal practice, then the internship, then your residency was also at the University of Illinois. So tell me what made you decide I want to go for the residency. So I, I really loved my internship, um, had a great time and I just, I felt like that was what I wanted to do with my career. And I also found that I really loved teaching during my internship. And I thought that I wasn't sure at that time, but I thought maybe I wanted an academic career. Um, and certainly I needed a residency to do that. So. We went from there. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. And then, so you passed your boards. So yep. now what is your diplomat title? So I'm a, I'm a diplomat of the um, College of Veterinary Internal Medicine and in large animal. Okay, so you're a large animal internist, but yep. would you say that you feel just as comfortable with horses as you do with cows? So I would say when I finished my boards in my residency that I felt um, fairly equally comfortable with both species types, but I have been doing ruminant exclusive practice for a long time now. And I, I um, probably wouldn't be the veterinarian that I would call to see my horse, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. And then tell me what, it seems like you got your master's at the same time that you did your residency, is that right? I did. So some, some universities offer a dual residency master's program. So there's even a couple that do dual residency PhD programs. And I did a dual residency master's. And what was your research focus on? So it was focused on factors that um, affect colostrum quality in dairy cattle. 
Remind me what the colostrum is. The colostrum is the very first milk or secretion from the udder at birth, and it has really high levels of antibodies in it that protect the newborn baby from infection. Okay, this is gonna sound really millennial of me, and I don't really associate <laughs> it with the millennial, but do people use the colostrum for skin products? Because that to me sounds like something, if it's full of antioxidants, I feel like people would wanna be rubbing that all over themselves. People use it for all sorts of weird things. <laughs> like there's, they put it in eye, like for eye treatments, people put it on their skin, people put it in like high protein bodybuilding milkshakes and things like that. So, so this is in the 90s that you were getting all of these degrees done, but then fast forward almost 10 years later and you do a PhD. So talk us through how we got to the PhD portion. So after I finished my residency in Illinois, I stayed there as a clinical instructor for a little while. And then I um, was still thinking I wanted a career in academia and that probably a PhD was also something that I should undertake to, to um, be productive in that career. And I was really interested in mycoplasma mastitis, which was a problem that was just becoming really prevalent in the US right then in dairy cows. And so there was um, a professor here at UF that was working on mycoplasma and I came here to work with her and did my PhD with her. That was Dr. Mary Brown. Oh, Dr. Brown, who's still here for yep. sure. Okay, so then can you just, like what is mastitis? Cause that's something that I feel like the vet students learn a lot about. So can we go over what is it? Because I, well, and then I would say too, like, I feel, isn't mass, would you say mastitis is as common as colic in horses and parvo and dogs? Like, are those things that we can relate to each other? Yeah. So that's a, that's a good analogy. It's a, it's a pretty common disease, probably more common than colic in horses is, for example. Um, so it's, it's more of a problem in dairy cattle than it is in beef cattle, but it's um, inflammation caused by an infection in the, in the udder. So in the mammary gland and okay. um, then the, the gland gets all swollen and painful. Um, and yeah, it needs to be treated usually with antibiotics, but not always. Is it something that a veterinarian could tell just by looking at the udder? A lot of the time. Yeah. But, but certainly we can tell it by looking at the milk coming from the udder. So the milk starts to look abnormal. Okay, so you mentioned antibiotics. Mm -hmm. and you, might, you know, you're going to treat mastitis with antibiotics. And all the time, you know, we hear about milk, you know, without hormones or antibiotics and, mm -hmm. and beef. So, and I've had Dr. Ray explain this, but I think it's worth explaining again. Can you talk about how animals sometimes need antibiotics? They sure do. You know, just like you and me, we get diseases caused by bacteria sometimes and um, that if we're not able to treat those with antibiotics, sometimes the only other choice is to, to put the animal to sleep, you know, if, if we can't fix the disease. Um, so, or to, or to, you know, if she's a adult cow, sometimes that animal will end up being sold for meat instead of staying in the dairy herd because we can't fix the disease. So, um, though, you know, if we have a disease like mastitis is a good example, it's usually caused by bacteria that we can treat really effectively with antibiotics. And so um, even if we're doing everything that we can to prevent it from happening, um, we sometimes still get it and, and you know, we infuse antibiotics into the mammary gland of the cow. And then that cow stays in a special isolated hospital environment and she lives there for the time that she's been treated and she lives there for a period after the treatment's finished, which is called the withdrawal period for the antibiotics. Um, and then her milk gets tested at the end of that to make sure that there's no antibiotic residues left in her milk. And if she's clear of antibiotic residues, then she can go back to the main dairy. Okay, so folks at home don't need to be worried that their milk has antibiotics in it because the cows have to go through a certain process to make sure it's all out. They absolutely do. And yeah, it's not legal for dairy farmers to have 
you know, to treat a cow without removing her from the, the string of cows that are being used to make milk for human consumption. Um, and actually every single tanker of milk that gets picked up from every single dairy gets tested for antibiotics, just, just in case somebody made a mistake, but it gets tested anyway. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can feel really comfortable that there's not going to be antibiotics in your milk when you drink it. Um, this is different than say an organic herd where antibiotics are completely prohibited for, for use on organic farms. So they can't treat cows for any diseases that, that you would normally use antibiotics for on organic farms. Okay, I might, be, I might be jumping to conclusions here, but then are we potentially saying at an organic farm, if a cow gets mastitis, that cow is just getting put down? So that sometimes happens. A lot, of, a lot of the times we can try and treat them without antibiotics. So we can do things like put, you know, warm compresses on the udder. We can give the cow pain medicine because some pain medicines we're allowed to use on organic farms um, and just wait and see what happens with the mastitis. And sometimes that works fine. Um, but, but we do sometimes have cows that we can't recover with that sort of treatment. and. Um, Usually they don't end up being put down. Usually what happens is they end up being sold okay. uh, for, for meat or some organic dairies will have um, a, a companion farm that, that is not organic and they'll send those cows to that farm that they work with. Oh, that's so, fun. So that okay. works. That works pretty well. Um, and, you know, they, they focus really heavily on those organic dairies on, on doing everything that they can to stop. Yeah. Stop the infections from happening so that they don't have to deal with that sort of scenario. Sure, sure. I, they yeah. sound like they definitely need to be more proactive because they can't be reactive with antibiotics if something goes wrong. Okay, let's talk about day in the life of you as a production animal veterinarian. I know that you do have teaching responsibilities, but if we can talk about for students who might be interested in as in a career as a production animal vet what can they expect what is it like so it, that varies a lot on what part of the country you're in and what sort of production animal practice you do but what i do is i'm a dairy veterinarian so i'm working with dairy cows and especially with dairy calves and the calf rearing programs that different farmers have um, and my day will vary from anything that, that, that might be um, a scheduled visit that we're going to go and do some um, routine evaluation of animal health on that farm or maybe some preventive health procedures like um, taking horns off, so disbudding. Um, we might be doing vaccinations or checking animals for parasites or things like that and treating them. Um, to, you know, all sorts of emergency visits, depending on, on uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm scheduled for that day. Yeah. Talk to me about dairy cattle personalities. Like, yeah, what are cows like? How would you describe them? So they are really inquisitive and you probably, everybody's heard about the curious cow. Well, that's true. They are really curious. I have never heard of the curious yeah. cow. I've heard about yeah. the curious it's cow. It's a children's book. It, you should oh. look it up. Yeah. The curious cow. Got it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, um, they are really curious. They love to investigate new things. Um, they are herd animals. So if, if somebody gets frightened or panics about something, everyone tends to panic first and then stop and think later. So you can have everybody go running away from you you know, if they get scared or something like that. Um, but yeah, they do, they have quite, they have very individual personalities. So some, you know, just like a lot of our other animal species, some of them will be uh, much bolder and more adventurous than others. And some are really quiet and timid and love to have their head scratched and just, just like to, yeah, just be calm and chill out. Um, so that, yeah, they're quite, they're, they're Quite, it varies a lot on um, just like most of our other species. Sure. Yeah. So dairy cattle would be all lady cows. Do you ever work with the, the bull side of it of making sure that we continue to have 
cows and the calves and the repro side? So most of the dairies that I work with use artificial insemination. So they buy semen from, from bull studs that raise the bulls and collect the semen from them. And, and that way we can use um, semen in our breeding programs that, that help us select for very specific traits that we're looking for in the breeding program. Um, and we can use an animal of better genetics and we'd be able to actually afford to buy if we wanted to buy that bull. So speaking of gender and lady cows, mm -hmm. I know that uh, female veterinarians on the food animal production animal side might be a little bit less. You, might, you potentially might be in a minority. That, that, that could be changing with how veterinary medicine is moving um, right now. Can you speak to that at all? Is that what it's like in Australia as well as the United States? What is it like to be a female food animal, production animal veterinarian? I would say that that has changed completely in my lifetime. So both in Australia and here, when I graduated from vet school, um, female production animal vets would have been in the um, vast minority. And that has been gradually changing this whole time. And there's tons and tons of, um, of female food, food animal vets now. Um, probably more in the, in the dairy and mixed large animal practice, beef, beef kind of mixed practice and a little bit, there still seems to be more gender inequality in the kind of feedlot, pure beef cattle practice through the the Great Plains and West and sort of inner mountain regions of the US, when I look at those practices, there's less, there's less females practicing out in that area, but certainly there's getting to be more and more. So it's changing all over the country. You know, if you talk to female veterinarians that have been out in food animal practice for a long time, they will all tell you of instances that they've faced where people have um, perhaps been less welcoming or said, no, I want, I want a guy and not, can, can I have Dr. Martin come out instead of you or um, something like that. But I think that is also really changing and becoming less and less of an issue. And um, certainly I, from what I've observed at my own experience, I think um, as soon as farmers realize that you know what you're doing and you can get the job done, that they're, they're um, more than happy to have you as your vet veterinarian and, and um, sort of that suddenly decide that, that gender really doesn't matter. Can you talk about the shortage of rural veterinarians? So that's a big ticket item right now, um, especially just in the news and folks putting out studies that there's not enough rural vets and folks don't want to go out and live in rural areas. And potentially you might have an opinion on that as a production animal veterinarian but also for my students who are getting ready to have interviews for vet school, this is something that could come up. So what is, what's your take on the lack of rural veterinarians? So you're right, there is a lack of veterinarians in some areas of the country, in some uh, rural areas. And, and those, they'll, they'll often be veterinary practices in those areas. They just, um, there's not enough veterinarians to serve and they often have trouble attracting um, attracting new graduates to come to those areas of the country and then keeping them long term and actually retention of female rural veterinarians is worse than it is of males and I, I it seems like a lot of that when my one of my organizations that I'm in is um, AABP which is the American Association of Bovine Practitioners and they've been digging into that a little bit and they think it, it seems to mainly be for lifestyle reasons that people decide after four or five years of living in a, you know, a 2000 person town in, out in the boonies that they don't, that's just not for them long-term or not where they want to bring up their kids or that those sorts of things. I, I would, I would say that that can be a, wonderful, fantastic life. And I, I have lots of friends that live in small rural towns and wouldn't change it for a world, the world. And they're quite happy to live there and bring their families up there and, and um, make a life there. But it's not for everybody. Um, and it 
it does become a decision for students when they're graduating from vet school, if they thought that they were going to be food animal practitioners and all of a sudden they've got a spouse that wants to be a cardiologist in Chicago or something like that, it, it suddenly becomes like a, a, they, they have to reevaluate and decide where they're going to go and how they can accommodate both, both sort of lifestyles. So, so it's definitely a real thing that there is a shortage and students yep. need to be considering what kind of lifestyle are they looking for? Yep. What kind of lifestyle is their potential partner or current partner looking for? Yep. And then maybe the AVMA or folks who are hiring out there have to think of other incentives to have folks want to go out and, and live in a rural environment. Or maybe it's a program where you do it for four years. I know that we have some of those loan repayment mm -hmm. programs where if you're a rural vet for a little bit, you, you get your student loans paid off. Yep. But that'd and be the, a problem because then they don't stay. They might not stay. Yeah. But I mean, I think some people do stay, right? They, they move out there and they, they think I might do this for four years and then see how I'm going. And they just love it. They fit right into the practice. I, w I would say that going to a practice where you have really good mentorship, um, and you can see things in that community that that feel right to you. So you would fit as a person in that community, that there's the sort of lifestyle there and there's the sort of um, potential to make friends there that you you can, yeah, that you would fit in there. And that, that seems to, if people can find that community, then they tend to stay. But if they go to a community that they just don't have what they need to be happy in life in, then, you know, three or four years later, they're going to be looking for somewhere else. Yeah. And that would be the case with anybody, you know, whether it's rural yeah. city, it does it depends to me. It, it does sound quite romantic to move out to a rural area, small town. You're probably a staple of the community if you are that veterinarian. So it does sound like there can be, there are, of course would be challenges if you're the only vet, you know, within mm -hmm. miles, but it also sounds like it could be quite lovely to disconnect. So if you're a student who's listening and you're ready to go out into a nice open area and be a, a leader in a small community, a rural veterinarian might be the perfect job for you. Okay, Dr. Monsell, I always like to ask our guests, what personality type of a student do you think, or what personality traits does a student need to be successful in your line of work? Certainly, the, the students that do the best in my area are students that are not afraid to get dirty. Um, that's really important. So if you can't deal with getting cow poo on your arm, don't, you probably just, just hate it. Just, just cross food animal veterinarian off your, <laughs> off your list. Um, but I think like in any probably avenue of of veterinary medicine that um, that somebody who it, who's willing to go out and get the clinical skills that they um, that they really need and work hard at it are, are the ones that are, end up being really successful and get the good jobs after graduation um, and that that encompasses not just what you get out of classes in vet school so that means doing um, picking externships where you get some really good practice um, outside of vet school with practicing veterinarians and um, even we encourage a lot of our students that are interested in production animal medicine to go and work on farms for for um, part of that first summer of vet school if they haven't done that before because it gives them a really good insight into that industry um, so so having being willing to go out and sort of get that extra experience so that you're really comfortable with the industry is is important. I would think not only would you become more comfortable, but when you work with those clients in the future, they'll be more comfortable with you if you can say, I have done this. I've worked on a farm. I understand where you're coming from. It makes them more empathetic and relatable, I would assume. Yeah, that's that's really um, for sure. And, and another thing that I think there's are actually really great opportunity for veterinarians to be involved in more is on the um, the business side of 
large farms. So a lot of large farms are starting to employ veterinarians as part of their management teams. And they, there's a lot of positions out there. And if you have something like an MBA as well as your vet degree, or even just some, you know, some basic business experience, um, that would that really really makes you more competitive for those sorts of jobs. So um, that, that's a an area that we don't really necessarily think of as being you know this sort of tra traditional veterinary area, but there's more and more positions like that becoming available. Oh, I love that. So students be on the radar and um, the lookout for non-traditional veterinary jobs in each field and also be in tune with maybe staying on job job boards to see what's getting posted, talking to your veterinarians to find out what options are available. Dr. Monsell, finally, what advice do you have for pre-vet students who are maybe in an application cycle or getting ready to apply, or maybe they just found this as an option for a career, what advice do you have before they arrive at vet school? So I would say if, if, you're, if you're applying here at University of Florida and you're in Gainesville already, so you're undergrad here, come and meet the faculty in the area that you're interested in. So um, see if there's something that you can do to, to you know, volunteer on a project or something like that, that you actually get to, to sort of get those contacts and get your foot in the door a little bit. Would you recommend them keeping, you know, Australia and the European schools as options? That's a good question. And, and absolutely, if, it, if it's financially feasible for you to, to do that, um, I think you get a great education in the, the accredited so that if you look at the AVMA accredited um, schools in Australia and in the UK and in Europe, um, that they, you get an awesome education and all of those and you get a really great life experience at the same time. So if that's on the cards for you, then absolutely. Yep. That would be a cool experience. And Australia is such an awesome place. You, you know, I would never discourage anybody from going there. <laughs> and before I let you go, can you teach us um, maybe a cool Australian slang phrase that maybe we're not aware of? Uh, have you ever have you ever heard? Have, have you got a bee in your bonnet about that? Uh, does that mean are you upset? Yeah. Okay. Have you? They say that in Australia. Yeah, they do. So you got a bee in your, in your bonnet. bonnet. Yeah. Okay. So students don't have a bee in your bonnet about production animal medicine. It sounds like a wonderful career, lots of opportunities, plenty to do, and lots of variety. Dr. Monsell, thanks for being on the podcast today. You're welcome, Alex. Thank you. And I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. Quick reminder to our guests that during season three, we are recording during social distancing, so the audio might sound a little bit different. Today, my guest is Dr. Liz Steele, and she's going to talk to us all about equine medicine. Dr. Steele, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. I'm really excited to have you because I feel like I don't do equine medicine justice on the show. So I'm glad that we'll be able to talk about lots of different parts of equine med because your clinic does a lot of the things. But before we dive in, can we talk about where did you do your undergrad and where did you go to vet school? Sure. No, I love telling this story. So I, mine was a little bit unique in that my father is a veterinarian and he graduated from the second class ever at the University of Florida. So I, I know I was born while he was still in vet school. Can you imagine that? I oh, love that. <laughs> so I was born when he was a senior and um, so it's only natural that he only gave me two choices of schools that I was allowed to choose 
to go to, and that was um, the University of Florida or Sunday School. <laughs> so anyways, I, um, so yeah, I grew up as a veterinarian's daughter, and that's all I ever wanted to do. So I, I was fortunate enough to get my undergrad um, at the University of Florida Animal Science um, program. I chose animal biology as a major. Um, and then I was accepted into the class of 2006 um, at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. So super lucky to have been the first of the second generation to come through the University of Florida. So they call it like a legacy graduate. So my, oh. my dad went through the vet school and then I was the first of like a child of a graduate to come through. So oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. So you're a double gator, born a gator, did everything at UF. Uh, did you know you wanted to do equine medicine while you were in vet school? Have you always been a horse girl? I have, you know, I mean, I, I, my father had a mixed practice and he did large animal work like a couple days a week. And I would absolutely beg, borrow and plead for him to take me along. And, you know, I've always loved horses. I, I finally talked my parents into letting me get um, a pony when I was really young. And, and I've basically never not had a horse now ever since then. So I was that girl that just kind of lived in the barn and, and that's where you could find me and just very, very passionate about it. I really don't get to ride horses much anymore, but I love living vicariously through, you know, my clients and my patients. So. Yeah, I, I, it ran through my blood from a very, very young age. Let's talk about the practice. So I am on the practice website right now. And at the top, we have four options. I'm sure you do more than just these four, but we have performance horse, reproductive, chiropractic, and dentistry. So I'm hoping we can break down each section so students can know as they're starting to think about what career they want in veterinary medicine by hearing what each of these sections are and what you see uh, they might start to think oh that sounds like something that's really up my alley so let's start with performance talk to me about what performance medicine is for horses all right so that's a great question and actually i've given a few presentations to kind of our local community that that's not real familiar with that um, so I'm going to explain it really basic, even though I know most of the people listening to this is going to already understand what it means. But basically, performance horse or sports, sports medicine in the equine side is basically any competing athlete um, that is not competing up to its potential or maybe has developed some type of a lameness um, problem obviously needs to go and see a performance horse or sports medicine veterinarian. Um, and our job is to take an animal that walks into the clinic just fine, appearing to be very normal, and perform an evaluation with our five senses and maybe some diagnostic equipment to be able to figure out from this animal that cannot speak and can hardly communicate with us what hurts. And that's kind of a fun, thrilling mystery to have to solve. And it's really neat to, to use, um, like I said, our five senses. My mentor taught me that before I even watch a horse move, I should be able to perform an examination with my eyes and my hands and my sense of, of touch and my sense of feel in palpating every single muscle, ligament, tendon, joint space of that horse and get a pretty good idea of what I'm gonna see before I even watch that horse go. And so this is a skill that I feel like you could spend your entire veterinary career trying to master and still be learning things by the time you retire. And for some people that's terrifying and for some people that's, that's thrilling, um, but it's, it's certainly a very, very fun and challenging component of our practice and one that I love. I don't, I don't feel like there's a whole lot more rewarding than for someone to walk into the clinic with a horse and say, 
we used to compete at this level. Now we've fallen back a couple of levels. Can you help us figure out what's going on? And then after we pull all that information from the horse and implement some type of a treatment plan for what we find, and they call back in a couple of weeks and say, we're back where we were before. Like, we can't thank you enough. That's, that's incredibly rewarding to me. So that's kind of sports medicine. And we, we incorporate all of the diagnostics. So we've got um, digital radiography. We've got really nice ultrasound units. We, we use um, thermography. We use fluoroscopy. We use a lot of different diagnostic modalities to help us narrow down and diagnose where the problem is. Um, and, then, and then all kinds of treatment options you know, that are out there today incorporating now our fitness and rehab program um, to be able to strength build and go back to the basics of some of these athletes just aren't in the fit athletic shape that they should be in. So everybody's wanting to come in for a quick fix or a quick injection of a joint and whatever else, but it may be that you're asking an out of shape horse to do, you know, a, a, an athletic move that they just physically can't do. And so Anyways, that, that part of it's uh, fun and exciting too. Do you feel like with folks who own horses, there's just like that deeper connection that not, not necessarily deeper than a companion animal that's like a small animal, but there's a huge connection that someone has with their horse. There is, you know, and there's various levels of this. And this is, this is something that I guess I probably wasn't quite prepared for um, but we almost have to be a psychologist <laughs> and, and, you know, so you have, you have people who, um, their horse is the only component of their life that is important. Um, and then you have people who have horses that are, um, their partner in business. So like every single day that horse helps them complete their job on a ranch. Um, their horse is actually a working member of the team. And then you have horses who are, um, you know, basically are um, retired and um, they want to keep them as comfortable as possible, but economically can't, can, you know, do, do absolutely everything for them. And then you have horses who um, are basically just a, a piece of a business um, and there's not a whole lot of emotional attachment to them. And so um, it's, it's, it's hard to differentiate what group um, the, the owner you know, falls into. And so I learned a long time ago that no matter what type of group I want to put them into, it doesn't really matter. I just lay out every single option for every single animal and then I allow them to choose and we talk through the pros and cons of it. So, um, so yes, I mean, there's, there's some people who I really feel like if their horse doesn't make it, they could potentially commit suicide. <laughs> and then there's people who say, you know, that this, from an economical standpoint, I can replace this animal for $2,000. And so that's what you have to spend on him, you know? And so we have to kind of put our, you know, any, any bit of judgment or put our emotions aside and just you know, basically treat every single horse and every single client the same and offer every single option to them and then talk through and, and help and let them choose, you know, which one um, is best in their situation. I love this idea of being objective and really taking our own opinions or biases out of the way. And just like you said, delivering the best care and what's best for that client and that animal without our own opinion. So I think that's wise for all of our listeners to think about whether they work with horses or not. That's what they need to be doing. Let's talk about repro. So what kinds of um, repro, we've had a, a doc on before about Therio in general. So what types of repro cases do y'all see at your clinic? Yeah, so our repro is very seasonal in horses. Um, so it runs from February first to June 30th um, and we see we basically do artificial insemination um, both frozen frozen and fresh um, and we do a decent amount of embryo transfer work 
Uh, when I first got out of veterinary school, repro was just the only thing I ever wanted to do. And I still am very passionate about it, but we breed about 70 mares a year, artificial insemination, and do about 25 embryo transfers. Um, I used to run my own uh, surrogate or recipient mare herd, but I don't anymore. I had about 35 mares. Um, and it was neat for learning experiences too. We got to, you know, we, we, we got, students got to practice all kinds of things, um, you know, and techniques and, and whatnot on them. But anyways, now I send all of my embryos up to Ocala and they, they um, go into a recipient mare up, up there. So um, we also foal uh, mares here at the facility with 24 hour watch and surveillance. Um, and now with our surgery center, we're set up to do an emergency C-section if we have to. Let's say this mare has had a tough pregnancy and now she needs some work done on her. Let's break down the chiropractic side of your <laughs> clinic. Uh, so tell me, what does equine chiropractic medicine look like? What are we talking about here? Yeah, so um, chiropractics is something that I went and um, chose a school in Texas to go to um, only about five, five, six years ago. There's four, four veterinary chiropractic schools, I believe, in the United States. You legally have to be a veterinarian to attend one of the schools. It's something you do post-veterinary graduation. Um, and it's just a really neat tool to have in your tool bag. Um, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm a very see it to believe it type person. And so um, before I do an adjustment on a horse, I will show an owner, or I might even let the owner take a, like for example, a treat um, for a horse and ask him to take the treat from um, their chest or around on their rib cage and bend around. And the horse may not be able to make that motion and they can physically see that. Um, and then I'll adjust, um, usually it's a cervical or pole adjustment. And then I hand them another treat and, and they see that that horse can now make that normal range of motion. And they're like, wow, that's what I was feeling when I was riding and then it's fixed. So that's, that's pretty, pretty neat, rewarding um, type of thing. It, Eastern medicine in general and Western medicine have never really meshed well. Um, and I think that's starting to change as a little bit of research work is coming out to prove some of the very science-minded Western medicine uh, practitioners that there, there's a place and a, and a need for Eastern medicine as well. Um, and so that's exciting to see. Uh, I think it's being incorporated into veterinary programs now as, a, as an option that, that's not looked at and considered as taboo or, or more of a joke or, or whatnot. And, and that's great too, because I tell you, it's definitely, um, like I said, a really neat tool to have in your, in your tool bag. And it's becoming more popular and more demanded by clients as well, chiropractics and acupuncture. I, if I had the time to now break away and go learn um, acupuncture, I sure would as well. That, I love that you were a, you're able to show clients, you know, with that adjustment, like, hey, this, this really can help. Do they, is it like human chiropractic medicine where you're going, you know, for six months to do your adjustments or are these horses potentially coming in one time, getting something looked at? What is that timeline like? Yeah, so it's a case by case basis, just like us. If we go in because we're hurting, then we probably need to have a few visits before we get all those muscles retrained and loosened up to where your adjustment holds. Um, our athletes, we work on a lot of athletes and they, they just need to be adjusted on a regular basis, period. Um, you know, I get adjusted once a month and I, I would love to get adjusted every, every week or every two weeks, you know, it's just, it depends on how hard we use our body. Horses are not made perfectly confirmation wise. And so that, that makes them, you know, use their bodies in ways that um, is not natural. And so honestly, my athletes, I usually adjust at least once a month. Um, but if the rider is noticing, most of my riders are pretty astute and they'll call me as soon as they feel like something is off. 
and then they they usually call back the next day and say yep that that fixed it i'm we're all good we're now holding our lead how do you even adjust a horse like i know you can, there's are you like cracking its back like how are you adjusting it so i have a funny story about this you know, um, physics was my least favorite subject, but when I went to chiropractic school, they reminded us that force equals mass times acceleration. And I don't have mass, you don't have mass. Most of us humans don't have mass when we're standing next to a horse. So we have to utilize acceleration. Um, and so that's literally like a very, very, very fast move. So when I went to um, chiropractic school, they gave us this special little little block that we could practice our adjustment move on. And it was like, it looks like, it basically has a, a this wooden plank and it has a pad on the top of it with a little peg underneath. And that peg is spring loaded and you can basically get, you know, find the peg through the little mat, through the little pad and then you get into the position that you're gonna make your really fast move and you make that move and, and it pops the peg down. And then you can, you can turn the, the um, resistance up on that peg until it gets to the maximum amount of force needed. And that would be like adjusting a 20 year old horse that's been out for 10 years. You know, that vertebra is not going to want to move from where it's been. So when you get good enough at practicing your move you, and you have it at the highest resistance level, you should be able to pop that peg down. And my husband is like this ex-Marine bodybuilder, okay? So he's very, very strong. And I was practicing one day back at our house and I had it at the highest power and I was able to pop the peg down. And so he walks in the room behind me and I heard something going on. And so I walk back into the room and he's on top of that pad and that peg. And with all of his strength, he's pushing and pushing and pushing on the peg and it won't go down. And he said, did you lock this peg in place? And I said, no. And I walked right over there and pop, popped it right into place. <laughs> well, why could you do it and he couldn't? I know, and he goes, there's no way, there's no way you just did that, and I didn't. I said, well, try it again, and, and he couldn't do it. So it just shows you that um, force equals mass times acceleration, and if you're fast, you can be, you know, just as, just as effective as somebody that's super strong. And so then it goes back to anatomy. So if I, um, if I know I want to adjust a vertebra a certain way, then I've got to find a certain point on that vertebra that I direct all of my force towards and make that fast move. So it's not like this giant, big legs going everywhere, my adjustments, and that's what some people, you know, say, you, you know, your adjustment looks so small and minute, you know, and there's a couple different ways to adjust a horse. You can use their legs and pull and yank and do all kinds of things. That's called long lever moves or you can do these short lever moves. And if you know your anatomy and you're quick, <laughs> then you can make the, those, those adjustments. I'm having a very existential moment as you're talking about this, because it sounds to me like we can relate it to life where if you know exactly what you need to do and you can execute the one move you need to make, you're gonna save so much time and effort than putting towards a lot of work and force and energy towards something that's the wrong move. So it feels like do good work that needs doing. Don't provide attention to something that maybe looks really big and flashy, but isn't going to give you the results that you want. And that to me is what chiropractic medicine sounds like. Can we please talk about dentistry? Why the heck is it called floating teeth? What is up with that term? Yeah, I don't know where that came from. And really, equine dentists and denti dental technicians, they hate the term floating teeth. <laughs> Tell us what it means, because this is something you would see a lot, right? That's a really common thing, to float teeth. It is. And, and the proper way to describe it would be called a dental equilibration. So here's the difference. I, I think way back when, when people realized that horses developed sharp points in their mouth, they would take just like a little file and go in and take that, that sharp point and make it a blunt point so that it no longer caused pain. Um, it, 
dentistry in horses is it needs to be such a balancing act because if we just go in there and and don't um, basically equilibrate or balance that mouth correctly while we're taking down those sharp points and different things if we leave that amount of pressure just on one or two teeth um, we'll, we'll end up fracturing those teeth so if you think about it, when you get a cavity filled and the dentist has you bite down on that paper that, that then shows him where your teeth are touching, horses, we can't really do that with a horse. So we, we have to make sure that we put them in the best occlusion that they possibly can. So I really feel like there's more of an art to it than, than, than the term of floating teeth, you know, has. But our practice is made up of um, two equine dental technicians and one veterinarian that performs dentistry. And we, we don't really leave veterinary school, in my opinion, qualified to perform dentistry, period. Um, and so our dental technicians and our veterinarian that does dentistry, they all went out and completed a course with the Academy of Equine Dentistry in Glens Ferry, Idaho. And I'm telling you what, they have learned that anatomy and those processes and how to do that inside and out. I mean, that school is teaching filling cavities, doing root canals, I mean, all kinds of stuff in these horses now. And, um, and they just do a really, really good job. We're talking about all these different areas of veterinary medicine, super, super busy. You also have a family. So go ahead and talk to me, and I'd love this to be, you know, some of the advice that you have for our students. How do you balance all of this, being a practice owner, having your family, like how are we doing that? Talk to us about some strategies. So strategy, it's all gonna boil down to, um, to one main point. You know, everything that I do in this whole platform of veterinary, veterinary medicine that I stand on, um, is basically that, that I work for God. Um, and he's what holds me together because there's no human being on this earth that can, that can be a good mom and be a good wife and be a good veterinarian and be a good team leader um, and, and just have all that perfect. It's just not humanly possible. And so for me, my faith is what holds me together. So I, I have to give that credit there. Um, and if I don't start my day that way and I don't, um, you know, pray for the day and basically say, what opportunities are you going to send my way and make sure that I'm, my heart is ready and responsive to handle that. If I don't have him basically holding the wheel for me, then it all falls apart, the whole, the whole train. And so I'll just start off by saying that, um, when I first, um, became a mom, it was so exciting. I loved being pregnant and um, everybody prepared me for childbirth and they prepared me for how to take care of this new baby and things like that. But no one prepared me for what my mind was going to go through. Um, and what I mean by that is basically um, as a large animal practitioner, you basically your whole life and, and everything inside of you is dedicated towards your career and what you do. And so I went through this mental battle um, where when I was home with my baby, my mind was telling me that I needed to be out working with my clients. And when I was out with my clients, my motherly instinct was saying, you need to be home with your baby. And so I had this constant mental war going on. And again, I had to give it up to God. And I had to say, if I'm supposed to do both these things, you've got to show me how, because I'm losing my sanity. But no, I mean, I think you just, you make it work. You know, you, you, um, somebody told me one day, and this was great advice. They said, um, some days I feel like a good mom and some days I feel like a good wife and some days I feel like a really good vet, but they're never on the same day. <laughs> and you have to kind of just mentally prepare yourself to say, all right, I am doing the very, very best that I can. Um, as far as my husband and my children goes, um, I have a few rules that I have for myself, um, and that's some very specific time of the day that I dedicate myself to them. And I cannot give them quantity of time, but I can give them quality time when I'm with them. 
So I used to, my, I was going through a time period where I didn't know if I wanted to expand the practice. And I called up my dad and I said, you know, what am I doing? Am I, what, is this the way I should take? I mean, my boys are in, you know, they're eight and 10 now and, and they're in just critical stages of their life. I don't want to miss anything. And, and he said, Liz, tell me what you remember of me when you were their age. And so I thought for a minute and I said, all right, so I remember when you would, um, take me to the barn and, and help me saddle my pony. And then you would, you would make him trot because I couldn't make him trot. You'd make him trot. And every time he trotted up to you, I had to give you a kiss. And then I said, I remember, you know, you would, you would take me to the woods and we would look at the deer and the turkeys. And then we would go to the lake and we'd play on the boat. Um, we would go snow skiing and all these things I named off. And he goes, all right, so you never once said just then, you never once remembered that I, there were way more days of the week that I left before you woke up and got home after you were asleep. He said, you don't remember the birthdays I missed. You don't remember the emergencies that I had to leave for when we had plans. You never once mentioned any one of those things. And I said, you know what, you're right. And he said, Liz, you'll never be able to give them as much time as you think you should give them, but just make darn sure that it's quality time when you do. And that's what they'll remember. And so I, that's kind of been a, a secret with me. Um, and I've tried to incorporate it. And, uh, and, and like I said, we just do the very, very best um, that we can. But you've definitely got to... Um, make up specific rules and goals for yourself, limits, um, limitations. Uh, you have to learn how to say no. Um, you have to learn that you're not going to make every single person happy every single day and be okay with that. Um, you just got to do the very, very best you can and, and, and smile and, and don't get to laugh through the process. Wow, I could just cry. I love that story so much about focusing on the quality moments. It doesn't have to be quantity. Thank you for sharing your faith. I appreciate learning all about how you are, you know, balancing everything you're doing. And it sounds like you're balancing it, like you said, with your faith, with a good attitude, and then setting up those boundaries. And that's something all of us can be employing. Um, in whatever ways we choose to do it. So thank you so much for teaching us a little bit more about equine medicine today and those different aspects and for showing us what it means to be made of steel. <laughs> thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Sure. Thank you for having me. Good luck to you all listening. And I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino. Today we have a very special Pre-Vet Podcast episode. We have a bunch of folks from different vet schools here to talk to you about admissions and to talk to you about their school and what their school is about. So if you're not sure what vet school you want to go to, today is a great day to listen. Hey everybody, I am Dr. Gretchen Delcom. I'm the Director of Admissions for Colorado State. Um, I uh, love Colorado because it has a little bit of something for everybody. Uh, we've got the mountains, we've got the plains, we've got a little bit of everything. There's even water here too, believe it or not. Not quite like the coast, but there's some water activities here as well. So. Living in the state of Colorado gives you lots of options. Yeah, so I'm Deanna from Iowa State's College Vet Med. Um, I'm the coordinator of recruitment. Um, and what I love about Iowa, um, Alex and I talk about this all the time, but I love the seasons. We have all four seasons. Um, it's a little bit chilly today here, um, not too bad, um, but we will see snow and all of that. So I really love the seasons in Iowa. My name is Kathy C. I am the admissions manager for the vet school here in Columbia, Missouri. I love that my grandchildren are here in Missouri. 
I have a two hour drive to see just one and the rest are right here in Columbia. We have all seasons, we go snow uh, blading and they do their sleds and we do skiing at the Lake of the Ozarks. We can go to the Arch in St. Louis and we can eat barbecue in Kansas City. You know, guys, picking a vet school based on where your family lives is a wonderful idea. You want to make sure you have some support for sure. Hi, I'm Jenna Henshu, um, representing the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. And what do I love about Wisconsin? Um, similar to many of the other admissions representatives, uh, I love that Wisconsin offers a little bit of everything. So you have the chance to do things like ski or hike um, in really green remote areas, or you can take part in um, plays or musical events in larger and fest festivals such as Summerfest in larger cities. So um, a little bit of everything in Wisconsin and um, as a foodie, um, there's great food in Wisconsin. I'm thinking a lot of cheese curds for sure. Cheese curds, any way you can make them, we have them. Love it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tuan Sellers, and I currently serve as the coordinator of admissions for our DVM program here at Auburn University. Um, so I guess the thing that I appreciate and enjoy about Alabama, um, I'm originally from North Carolina. Um, I like that there's so much history um, tied to the Black community and the, the challenges that the Black and African American community um, has and continue to face that it, a lot of it has started here in in um, Alabama. So we have Montgomery um, about 45 minutes up the road. Birmingham is about two hours away. And if you really need something fun to do or need a more urban um, experience, you can go to Atlanta, which is like an hour and a half away. And of course, you're going to always fly in and out of Atlanta and, and not at any of the airports here in Alabama. Choosing a vet school near airports is quite wise, especially if you're going to an out of state school. So that is good to know. Hi, I am Dr. Callie Rost. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions at Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine. I would have to say what I love about Kansas, and I grew up in Kansas, so um, I do love it. Um, what I love most is the people. Uh, the people here in Kansas are some of the friendliest people you will ever meet, so um, it's a great place. Love that. Definitely want our veterinarians to be nice people. That's how you guys are going to get your clients to keep coming back um, with their patients, their furry family. So how we're going to do this today, podcast listeners and my undergrad class, we are going to go through a couple of areas of vet med that every student should be aware of when choosing a vet school. Some of those things will be culture, some of those things will be climate, which our guests alluded to a little bit already, and then we'll also go over different parts of the admissions process. So I would love to just go ahead and start off with culture. So I'm gonna ask my guests to tell me if you could describe your school's culture in a few words or a sentence, what would it be? Okay, I'll go ahead and start. Um, one thing um, that I think you'll see in a culture at Wisconsin is something that we really strive for is a culture of collaboration. So collaboration between veterinary medical students, uh, collaboration between students and faculty and staff, and collaboration between students within our professional school and the other professional schools that you see on the UW-Madison campus. Wonderful. Let's hear from Gretchen at Colorado State. So if I had to describe CSU's culture in a few words, it would probably be genuine self. Here, people are pretty laid back. I think it's something to do with the environment, being able to get out into kind of the wilderness of Colorado. People have a pretty good work-life balance, um, try to wrap up things at four o'clock so they get their hike in for the day, those kind of things. Love that, go on a hike. You know, we say that we go on hikes in Florida, but we're just walking on a trail. There are no <laughs> implies. I would say really we have a culture of wellness, whether it's the, the um, counselor that you can see here um, on site or whether it's just kind of that encouragement to, hey, do some studying, but also take some time off. Love that. We just went over the eight dimensions of wellness last week. So you guys would be totally ready and excited to get involved in that culture. Um, 
so Deanna, I hate to sound like I'm, I'm copying you, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about was um, the culture of self-care. Um, it's one of the things that we really promote from the very beginning. Um, I know even here in my office, when I'm meeting with prospective students and their families, we always talk about the importance of that work-life balance. Um, I, I would echo a lot of what's already been said. I wrote down supportive uh, when you asked that question. And I know a lot of undergraduate uh, pre-vet students, it's a very competitive, you're all competing for, for those few seats uh, that exist at every college. But once you are into the program, it becomes a very supportive environment. Uh, but that support, uh, I think, is what really resonates with me here at K-State. Uh, I believe we're all on the same train here. We're going down the tracks trying to help and support and be there when our students are needing us. Well, students, I hope what you really heard there was if you choose any of these vet schools, you are going to get a collaborative, a, a program that really cares about your well-being. You're going to get a program that wants you to do the best that you can. We're going to stop being competitive when we get into the program and we're going to start being a family. So what that tells me is there is no wrong choice when choosing a vet school. So let's dive into what could differentiate, differentiate these vet schools. And one of those biggest things would be weather and location. So we talked about that a little bit in the beginning when y'all introduced yourselves, but I would love to hear what type of student would love living in your area. So for Gainesville, it's folks who love the heat, they love the humidity, they're not obsessed with seeing seasons. Um, they like living in a college town where they have all their amenities nearby. So it's more of like a small city, um, not a big city, not huge rolling fields nearby. They kind of have everything they need. So what kind of personality and what kind of weather lover would do well in your location? So tell us about the town. We tell you, if you don't like the weather in Missouri, just wait till tomorrow and it will change. We were at 85, 87 degrees yesterday morning and by five o'clock it was at 63. Um, when we went to bed it was at 50 and woke up at 50. Uh, when we interviewed, now we'll be doing Zoom interviews, but when we interview and bring so many people in from across the country, there are many that are from the east coast and west coast that that just aren't able to slide in from the airport and, and make it through our slick days of uh, January, February weather. Uh, but we have all four seasons here at Missouri, and many people can then have a little bit of every season they love while here learning. Here in Colorado, it's very dry, and so uh, you do have to adapt to the dryness, but the snow is actually very mild. It'll come through, it'll be beautiful like a postcard, and then it melts in like two days. It's the cr craziest thing. Um, so mild winters, actually, we actually have more sunny days here in Colorado than even the great sunshine state of Florida, which is surprising too. So that keeps me really, really happy here. Um, it is is dry, uh, but the there's, um, it's kind of a, crazy ecosystem here. So we've got the plains that go up into the mountains. And so there's like a wide range for whatever anyone's looking for, whether they're looking for a little more rural, they're looking for some even like farmland property, those kind of things. We've got uh, like, it's, I don't know, it's like over 40 miles of like hiking, biking, horseback riding trail in here. So people take advantage of that in the city. For those who are from the South, it's a very adaptable winter. We have all four seasons here, uh, which a lot of students enjoy. You know, when it, the first time when it snows every winter, half of our students are outside because they've never really been around snow uh, and it's fun for them. Uh, the other great thing about Manhattan, um, you know, a lot of people say Kansas is in, is in the middle of nowhere, but really we're in the middle of everywhere. Uh, so it's pretty easy to get here. Uh, there are direct flights right into Manhattan out of Chicago and Dallas. Um, and then once you're in Manhattan, it's about a city of about 50,000 people. Uh, it doesn't take much longer than 10 minutes to really get anywhere you want to go. Um, it's, it's really a beautiful place. Uh, Manhattan also has a lake here really close. So a lot of students, beautiful days like today, it's 70 degrees and absolutely gorgeous. Um, they'll get out to the lake when they can, uh, get out by the water and uh, have a little fun out there. A lot of people paddleboard, things like that in the fall and the spring. Uh, a good variety and most of our students really enjoy it. 
so if you love college football, especially SEC football, then I think you would really, really enjoy being Auburn. If you're looking for strong winners, um, you're not going to get that here either. Um, but it does get really hot. We don't really see a huge distinction in the in the seasons. Um, I wear suits generally every day, and so it gets quite uncomfortable. Um, but a lot of people love the heat. As I mentioned earlier, there are... Um, you do have Atlanta, which is about an hour and a half away. Birmingham, which is about two hours away. I think the closest beach is three, um, like Destin, Florida, um, uh, Panama City Beach, um, Mobile, about three and a half to four hours away. Um, so there's a lot of geographic change um, in the area. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting place. It's definitely a college town, um, but you can access large cities, like I said, within a couple hours drive. Um, so Madison is our state capital. Um, the School of Veterinary Medicine is located right on the main campus and the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus sits on an isthmus between two of three of Wis um, Madison's large lakes, um, providing us with what I of course feel is the best college union um, <laughs> uh, with a beautiful lakefront view. Um, all four seasons present in Wisconsin uh, if you are somebody who is opposed to cold or snow, um, you'll learn to love it. <laughs> Come to Wisconsin. Um, we, do, we do have um, plenty of cold and snow days, um, but something to know, um, Madison is a super bike friendly city and students, faculty, and staff manage to bike year round. If you're looking for a little bit of everything, you'll find it at Wisconsin. So we're in our, so I'm in Ames, Iowa. Um, if you think of Iowa and you kind of put your finger right in the middle of the state, that's where Ames is. Um, and we do really have a lot um, for everybody. Um, so there are a ton of biking, um, walking trails, um, you know, hiking is what we, you know, call walking on really nice paved trails, sometimes through woods. Um, but we are about 40 minutes north of the biggest city in Iowa, so that's where you would fly in. Um, but we're a college town, so although there's only about 50 or 60,000 residents, um, we do have, you know, a Target, a couple of Walmarts, grocery stores to choose from. Um, it's really easy to get around town too um, because of our bus system. So you can, since it is such a small town, in about 10 minutes, you can be in the middle of a cornfield if that's more your style um, as well. So we kind of have something for everybody. But. Okay, let's do some rapid fire questions. And I think what is most important, and a lot of you guys hear me say Google something. So we're gonna try to ask our admissions panelists things that you couldn't Google. We're gonna get their opinions on some things. We're gonna do it rapid fire so we can hear from everybody. But if you have specific questions about things like tuition for these locations, we can easily Google that. So we won't be asking them about those types of items. We're not gonna be asking each person, um, do you have an interview or do you do essays? Because we could look into that ourselves. So let's do some rapid fire. Panelists, one to three items that you think is a reason someone might come to your school. So for UF, I might say certificate programs, location, and culture of fun might be the three things that I say. So one, two, three things that you're like, a student comes here because of this. Um, one would be uh, our clinical skills program. Uh, so students begin clinical skills like many other programs in the very first year, the very first week. By the end of the first week, they do have a live animal lab doing physical exams. Uh, the second would be our um, mobile surgery unit. So we have a, a trailer that has two surgery suites within it, uh, travels around to animal shelters and um, the community shelters, humane societies. They spay and neuter dogs and cats. Uh, fourth year students are on a two week rotation there. They will each do at least 50, five zero, five zero <laughs> uh, surgeries uh, in that two weeks. So surgery skills, um, stellar by the time they graduate. Um, and the third thing I think I would say, and I already mentioned it once, but that is our faculty. Uh, the faculty are very dedicated to the students. Um, pretty unique experiences sometimes here at, at Kansas State, really producing those 
uh, practice ready veterinarians. Um, so I pulled our students coming here for interviews and asked them, which we're not doing anymore, but uh, why are you applying here? And number one is location. Everybody wants a reason to move to Colorado. So that's number one. Uh, number two is probably our combined degree programs and the rigor of our academic program. So uh, we have the highest, probably one of the highest numbers of different combined degree programs, which you can definitely Google and 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 dive into later, but uh, we've got some unique programming here. And so I think that's what attracts a lot of students. And number three is the people. So again, when students come and visit campus, they meet the people here, fall in love, want to be part of this environment, and also the people out in practice. I hear so many advisees coming to me and say, I know this alumni, they talk about how awesome CSU was, and I can't wait to like find out more. So um, location, degree programs, and uh, people. So I think one of the first things that people would say about um, the College of Veterinary Medicine here at Auburn University is we have really, really nice facilities. So we have uh, a really, really new, uh, relatively new and modern small animal teaching hospital. But we also have a very um, nice large animal teaching hospital that's about 25 years old. We would say that our food animal and our companion animal programs are really good as well. Um, and then this sounds corny, and I don't know if you guys remember the commercial from the 80s, um, Advanced Auto Part. They say uh, the best part. Um, is our people. Um, and I can personally attest to that because I've been working in higher education now for about, professionally for about eight or nine years. Um, and one of the reasons I chose this job over some of the other um, jobs that I was offered was because of my interaction with the people during the interview process. So it's going to be our facilities, um, our food animal, companion animal programs, in my opinion, and then the, the people here at the, the college. Our students um, don't track um, they essentially pick an area of focus in their third year to help us schedule rotations, um, but we don't have kind of a formal tracking program. So you really learn it all um, so that you could potentially go out in your career and, and do it all or do anything. Um, so that would be my first thing. Um, faculty mentorship is huge here. So like Mr. Sellers was saying, you know, um, that really good support from faculty members who will, yes, find whatever time works in their schedule to uh, meet and, and really kind of give, um, you know, whether it's more information about the class or their chosen, you know, expertise, that sort of stuff. And then the last thing is um, we really have a club culture here um, at Iowa State. So there's over 900 clubs on uh, campus, but 42 of those um, are devoted specifically to vet students. Um, so everything from, you know, a, a SAVMA chapter um, to a voice chapter to um, an AABP um, to a zoo exotic wildlife club. There's a ton of different clubs. Um, it's also pretty easy for students to start up their own club. So if there's something that you're interested in um, that you can't find at Iowa State, uh, you can always kind of create your own club and find um, your people that way too, so. Uh, first and foremost is our curriculum is a two and two program, quite different than most all the others. We cover the lecture lab sections of education in the first two years. And then we have two years of clinical experiences where they're actually rotating in clinics with patients and clients. We have um, then a higher than pass, higher than average pass rate on the boards. Many of our class years, 100% pass the first time. And then that leads to uh, research opportunities. We have uh, the best researchers, some of them working on things right now for the government and for the COVID and helping right here at the building next door to us. Um, and then, as I, you know, I, I have to say, it's the same from school to school I'm, I'm hearing here. Uh, our faculty are the best. Our faculty are there for you. They're um, family people, of course, too. We have tailgates right here in our front yard when our football season's going up, because our dean is very active. Uh, but I believe you'll find the, the first and foremost would be our two and two curriculum. Something, and I'll probably echo much of what was said by others, um, but kind of thinking of top three, I would say one, the ability to really prepare you for whatever aspect of veterinary medicine you're excited about. So students can come in 
knowing exactly what they want to do and we can prepare you for that. Um, or there's a lot of flexibility within our curriculum um, through elective courses and one week intensive selective courses to explore different options um, before deciding in your third year an area of emphasis for your clinical training. So knowing that there's um, really lots of opportunities at Wisconsin to kind of really focus on whatever aspect of veterinary medicine you are excited about. Um, second, I'm gonna re repeat what others have said, um, fantastic faculty. So fantastic faculty, and I've really seen that as we've transitioned to um, online programming through the um, COVID pandemic, really the commitment um, to engaging, um, engaging coursework. Uh, that's just been super exciting to see. Um, and then last, I would say um, for students who have an interest in research or students who have an interest in a dual degree program, um, we're very fortunate enough to have other strong professional schools on our campus. So students who have an uh, interest in uh, dual DVM MPH or perhaps um, students who are interested in pursuing additional training but not through a full dual degree program, uh, through the School of Medicine and Public Health, we offer a certificate in global health, um, which students can complete during their four years of DVM programming without adding on any extra time towards graduation. So um, lots of things that draw students to Wisconsin. Wow, good luck choosing vet schools, everyone, because everyone has so much to offer. The last question I have for our panel is kind of a two-part question and it's what everybody wants to know. So we can frame it in what's a big red flag that you might see often on the application or in the interview process if you have one. And then based on that red flag, what's your general advice for students to maybe avoid those things or something that the school is really looking for on that application? Okay, uh, so I think for us, um, one of the red flags is not having kind of a mature view of veterinary medicine. So a mature and professional view of veterinary medicine. And I think that translates into a little bit of uh, the kind of career goals. So if your career goals are to give back to your community and provide like free um, clinics and all of that, fantastic. But as a mature you know, a member of the profession, you also have to pay back your student loans, right? And pay rent and all of those sorts of things. So I think that translates into, especially those essays where you can, um, you know, kind of show that maturity, um, that understanding of the profession um, in what you write. Um, but it also might be a way to try and kind of brainstorm, you know, how you, um, describe those experiences, those veterinary experiences that you've gotten. Um, and also, you know, maybe it's a letter of recommendation that can, t that can speak to um, your kind of work in that profession or in the profession so far, um, or your maturity um, and what aspects you have there. So at Wisconsin, um, one thing that I would say we see as a red flag um, would be when applicants speak negatively um, of other programs, practicing veterinarians, um, former faculty members within their undergraduate career. Um, so we really expect our students to ask to um, act in a professional collegial manner at all times. Um, and that extends to the students that we would see as prospective students that are entering our program. Um, so, we just encourage you, we know not every experience in your life or undergraduate career or pre-veterinary preparation is going to have been positive or wonderful, um, but you need to find the professional um, and polished way to bring that into your, into your application. Um, one, I mentioned earlier that we don't require students to have perfect grades to be admitted into the program. So let's say, for instance, we see an applicant that has a 3.96 because they earned one B. 
one of the first questions that that committee is going to ask that student is what happened. And it's not because they want to know why, why do you not have a 4.0? They want to hear how that student explains that 4.0 and how, or not having that 4.0 and how they reacted to not making perfect grades. Because oftentimes what we'll hear is the student will say, well, the professor or the teacher or the instructor. And that is a huge red flag to our committee members because they're going to be the ones that are teaching you. And listen, vet school, again, I'm not a veterinarian. My degrees are in education. I have I know nothing about veterinary medicine, but from my understanding, it's very hard. So you can't necessarily come in and expect that you're going to have a perfect 4.0 the entire four years you're in the program. So they want to see that you can take ownership if you earn a B. Hey, even if it was the professor's fault, you need to figure out a way to kind of spin it and say, I did this. They don't want to hear you blaming the professor um, or the instructor on why you didn't earn a, a 4.0, which also goes into attitude. So one of the things they're going to try to assess during that interview and in your essays is they're going to try to uh, understand whether you have a positive attitude, um, whether you're mature and wh whether you're ready for the professional DBM program. Uh, these have all been great so far. Uh, same red flags here. One that I will add is um, an unpolished application and an unpolished interview. Uh, so you are on campus, you have career centers, you have professors um, that you know, you need to learn how to use those resources. As a veterinarian, you're never going to get through a day without using the resources that you have. So um, prepare for your interview. Go to a mock interview. Uh, and now that most schools are going to be doing Zoom, your career centers are probably offering mock Zoom interviews. And it's an unusual type of interview to have. So it's a very important that you prepare. Um, it's very obvious to interview teams when a student walks in and they've not prepared at all um, versus someone who's had a few mock interviews. So the very first question that most interview teams are going to ask, tell us about yourself. And so there, it's amazing how many times a student does not have a response prepared for that question. It's probably going to be the one that you get asked at every single interview that you go to. So interview pre preparation is very important. And then just application wise, uh, typos, misspelling, grammatical errors, please uh, have somebody look at your essay responses. Uh, they still need to be your own, so it should be your words, but someone else can catch some of those errors for you and uh, give you a recommendation. And then the other thing I would say is we also ask for a resume or a CV on to, for applicants to upload. And well, a lot of times we look at that as a quick reference, but we read very detailed on the VIMCAS. So many times that students have not completed their VIMCAS application. They have all this information on their resume, but it's not on their VIMCAS application. So spend the time, make it detailed. We want to know about you. Uh, and the only way that we will is if you, if you fill out that application correctly with very few errors and just prepare. Sorry to say I am such a mom when it comes to the applications. And um, we have a, a policy. We do not give extensions for the deadline. So I would encourage any pre-vet to start working in the spring on the application and submit it early. Um, we recommend that you get more than just three letters of rec. You have to have three, one from a vet to complete an application. You can have four, five, and up to six, so that if at that deadline, one who is swore they would send it in for you and then it didn't get sent, they're on the phone calling us saying, well, will you take it if I run it up to the office? Will you take it? We have a no policy. We have a policy on nothing comes that is not submitted through VIMCAS. I cannot encourage enough submit everything. Second, just real quick, I know that VIMCAS application says uh, focus more on college. We're very nosy here at Missouri. We want to know everything from a young adult on. So ninth grade maybe? Start telling us. A flag would be someone who has an application one submitted right at the deadline because we do look at that. And two, one extracurricular activity. One. That's all they've done. Uh, complete the application, fill it out, tell us everything, hold nothing back, spend time on the essays, and don't do a one paragraph essay. We share with us. We expect three, four paragraphs on the essays, and we're switching essays with Vimcast this next year. It'll give you topics to discuss. That will be more, I hope, to your benefit. That's the mom in me coming out, so just wanted to share a moment with you. 
Yeah, so this is less of a red flag, but more of general advice. Um, I think my colleagues all are probably experiencing the same thing. We've had a huge national increase in the number of applications again this year, and um, we're dealing with just a large load of applications here at CSU, and we, we traditionally have. Um, and so for us, it's really important to not just check the boxes. And what I mean by that is just, you know, plainly state, you know, I answered this VenCast question and not here, I did these hours. The more you can, like Miss Kathy said, talk about who you are and your personality, your, your personal interests, the things you do outside of veterinary me medicine, the things that we can read and see to get to know who you are, you can stand out from the crowd of thousands of applications that we're reading. So at CSU, we do a holistic review. We really dive into your story. And so uh, candidates think that we don't want those stories, but we do. We want to know who you are, not just have you checked the boxes of being, you know, meeting the requirements to apply. It's, it's more than that. So uh, yeah, try to think about how do you convey your personality over to the admissions committee through your, your um, application. Wow, what great advice. I'm so happy that when all of our listeners and everyone in this undergraduate class right now prepares to apply to these schools, I hope what you're hearing is the enthusiasm and the support that each office has for your application, that they want you to do well, they're giving you the tools to succeed. Go Rams! Go Cyclones! Go Tigers! M-I-Z! Go Badgers! War Eagle! Go Wildcats! And I'm Alex Avellino. Go Gators, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino. This is our second part episode on admissions from across the country. We have more vet schools represented today to talk to you about their admissions process. So I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves, starting with Tufts. Hello and welcome. Thanks for having me today. My name is Ford Barnett. I am representing the Cumming School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University, where I am the Associate Director of Admissions, and I've been there for, I think, nine years now. Favorite thing about the school for me, by being a campus of really only 450 students, it means you know everyone and everyone knows you. Climate-wise, today is about 80 and very humid. Um, Massachusetts has hot, hot days and cold, cold days, depending on the time of year. So. People expect that aspect. The one that you don't really hear too much about, about being in New England, and so I myself am from Vero Beach, Florida, so I expected cold and I was kind of ready for that. I didn't expect um, in the winter when it's 4 p.m. and suddenly it's pitch dark out. So that was the, the biggest uh, climate adjust adjustment for me and driving in snow. Good afternoon, my name is Nikia White. I'm the admissions coordinator for the DVM program at NC State, and I've been there for almost five years. It'll be five years on October 1st, so that's exciting. Um, Climate-wise in North Carolina, it can range because it can be 70 degrees in December. It can be hot on Christmas day. You just never know what you're gonna get um, with the North Carolina weather. Right now, I think we're in about the 60s, so it's not too bad, it's pretty mild. Um, but, de but decent weather. You have mountains and you have the beaches, so it's a really great location. And we're in the capital of Raleigh, so we're right in the middle of it all. Um, what I love about the vet school is we have um, a great sense of community, um, a big focus on diversity and inclusion, and also wellness. So we have um, an on site counselor, we have wellness programs, we have diversity and inclusion programs, and it really does feel like home. Um, our goal is to make every student feel welcome from the time they step on campus. Um, and that's something that we really strive to do. So that's something that I really enjoy and really, like, what I really love about NC State. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to join you all today. I am Dr. Brittany Moore Henderson. I am the Director of Admissions and Clinical Instructor at Mississippi State. Uh, just a little bit about me. I am a graduate of Mississippi State. I graduated in 2016. 
um, and I have just completed a residency through the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. Um, so I have been a director of admissions uh, for two years now. So I've been doing, having some double duties with director of admissions as well as being down in the clinic. Um, so a little bit about Mississippi State as far as climate. Of course, Mississippi is very hot. It can change. I say that we do not get all four seasons. Um, in the winter, it's really not the winter. It can vary. Like, it's been a very long time since it has snowed here in Mississippi. So as far as Mississippi State, as far as the other, uh, talking about climate, I say we have a very welcoming uh, atmosphere, uh, very family oriented. I always tell people that Mississippi State is the well-kept secret because a lot of people do, do not know about us. Um, and it takes them to get to come to um, Mississippi State to actually get a whole feel of our hospitality because we are the hospitality state and you truly feel it once you come through the doors. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Alberto Nunez. I am with Western University of Health Sciences. Um, I am the university recruiter there for Western U um, and also serve as the advisor for all pre-vet students looking to to come to Western U um, and just in general to, um, to to get you started for your journey to get into a DVM program, right? Um, so that's, that's my main role there. Now, climate wise, we're located in Southern California. I, I think that really says says it all right it's it's pretty true what they say in, in the movies um and that, that you see sunny southern california you know it's it's hard to beat it's 82 degrees out and it's fall right now so um it's it's absolutely perfect weather pretty much all through the year except when we're on fire that tends to happen quite a bit um but for the most part it's um it's a really really great place um the thing that i love about our campus is Western U itself is fully a graduate institution. So um, all in the health profession. So you have uh, future doctors, dentists, um, vets, all everything regarding the health professions on campus and you're all collaborating and you're all working with these different types of doctors. Um, so I really think that that is, is really great. And then in terms of our location, we're pretty centrally located. Number one, we're the only vet school in Southern California, only one of two in the state of California. Um, and then two, we're pretty centrally located next to everything. So we're close to the mountains, we're close to the beach. Uh, we're about 30 minutes away from Disneyland, which is pretty awesome. So, um, so there's a lot of things that you can do around here. And like I said, it's Southern California. So weather's always, always pretty great and, and nice to be around. Hey everyone, my name is Jennifer Maley. I'm Director of Admissions at Cornell's Vet School. We are um, a small class of 120 in the center part of New York State. Um, climate wise, there's two kinds of climates. So climate um, as far as weather, if that's something you're all interested in. For full seasons, we have beautiful, wonderful, white, lovely winters summer, winter, spring, fall, full out seasons and gorgeous. Very sustainable community, um, kind of grassroots. We're one of the um, trade best college, small college town with um, Ann Arbor, any given year, Michigan. So a uh, really great place to live and work and study. Um, about four hours from New York City and we have campuses in New York City. So we do run, um, there are campus to campus buses that go to New York City often. So a nice opportunity to get to a bigger town, um, but nice to study in a small safe town. As far as climate, we are an inclusive um, community. We have a wellness program, lots of initiatives to make sure everyone is comfortable. Um, everyone feels included. Because of the size of our class and we're rooted in problem-based learning, um, it's a very non-competitive uh, community. So often Ivy League is thought of as E or B eaten, um, which might be with some of the colleges at Cornell, but not at the vet school. So because of that kind of inclusivity, that kind of small climate, um, you get to know each other and everyone is valued in the classroom and outside. Wow, wonderful. It's, I love that everybody touched a little bit on not only the location, but also what the vibe is like at their school. And it sounds like all of the schools have wonderful environments. So let's find out what are some 
different programs or claims to fame that each school has. So representatives, I'd love to hear one to three things that your program has that you think this is why students come here. So we'll go ahead and let uh, Dr. Brittany, if you feel comfortable starting us off with a few things you think our students should know about what Mississippi State has to offer. Sure, so I guess I already somewhat mentioned about our um, how our curriculum is set up. Um, of course, like I said, two years within the classroom and the last two years are within the clinics, um, but during our students' sophomore year, they began sophomore surgery. So we have uh, shelters uh, around uh, our area in which bring their animals to uh, be spayed and neutered um, because that increases their chances of being um, adopted. Uh, so our students get the opportunity to perform those spays and neuters and take the, um, pretty much have uh, groups of three in which they go from being the anesthetist to being the assistant surgeon to being the surgeon. Uh, and by the end of their second year, they would have completed about four surgeries. We also have a shelter medicine program, which is big, pretty huge. Um, our students get the opportunity um, to go around on our uh, spay and neuter bus. Uh, where they um, do a two week electives and majority of our students about the time they have graduated have completed up to 50 uh, spades and neuters on average. Um, so a lot of hands on ability. But another thing about our uh, university is just all the different outreach programs that we have. Um, we know that our students, we want them to, of course, have all the medical knowledge, but we also want them to be able to interact with the community. So we have various programs such as uh, Vetispire, Veterinary Camp. Now we have Vet Chat. They are all programs for our students. Um, so other things in which we have, like I mentioned, was just that hospitality. We have an open door policy. We interact with our students quite a bit. They can come anytime to us when they have questions. Um, we provide them with advisors, with mentors. We have a tutoring program, a peer tutoring program where our students can tutor um, their peers um, if they're having issues. Um, so we pretty much try our best to make sure that our students um, have that anything they need to be successful within our program as well as once they uh, graduate with our program. It doesn't end and once they graduate, it continues on throughout their time because we want them to still be with us as alumni and come back and help us as much as possible. All right, so for my three, I am going to choose our wildlife and conservation opportunities. I think that that has been a longstanding um, draw to Tufts. So wildlife and conservation being part of a, a One Health mentality that gets incorporated throughout the general curriculum um, through courses, but also uh, in having on our campus a wildlife clinic that sees over 4,000 cases a year. Um, number two for me, I'm gonna kind of piggyback off that idea, which potentially includes wildlife and conservation, but a lot more, which is a strong international research um, track. So we probably, on a non-COVID year, would probably have about 30 or so students that are working internationally during their summer, some of which are doing so for um, research projects attached to additional credentials where they might be earning their master's in public health along with their DVM or earning a international veterinary um, medicine certificate that our program offers. And for my third one, I'm just going to choose some of the small animal opportunities and numbers. New England is fairly small animal centric. Um, so Tufts will find itself usually with the busiest small animal emergency room out of all the veterinary schools, um, often number one with small animal caseload in general. So if you're interested in small animal, you'll get a lot of opportunity within our program. And then that trickles into other opportunities um, like community medicine, for example, where we have a spay neuter clinic on campus that students can get involved in or a community outreach opportunity where um, we have a partnership with a local high school. Um, the high school has a clinic that serves low income families in the Worcester area. So Worcester is the second largest city in New England. And so it's a way to see a different demographic to give back to also help high school students that are training to become um, veterinary technicians. And so are working as your vet assistants while you're there. So it's been a really good partnership for our students. Yeah, so I was trying to think of the three things that I think helps us stand out. No matter where you go, you're going to get a great education. 
Um, and so I think that's something that's, uh, that's always important to keep in mind. Like you're going to graduate, you're going to be a DVM, and you're going to be able to, to grab, get a job. Um, but what do we do at NC State to help support you outside of that? Um, so one of the things is financially. So we are one of the least expensive of all the vet schools, and we do allow non-residents to apply for residency after the first year. We do, a, and we have an on-campus attorney who works with admitted students um, from the time they're admitted through that throughout that first year to make sure they're doing everything they need to do to get residency. And this past year, we had 25 out of 25 that applied for residency and got residency. So it's a lot that you have to do and things you have to stay on top of, but it is a possibility and that saves you even more money because you do get to pay that in-state tuition rate after year one. Um, secondly is support. So I mentioned that before um, about the focus on wellness and that's something that's really important to us. Um, in 2016, we established a house system. So if you guys are Harry Potter fans, I am not, not a big Harry Potter person. Um, but we were the first school to establish a house system. And so our students are sorted into houses on campus, not actual houses that they live in, but their own little communities. And throughout the year, they have different events, different wellness events. They'll have a plant night. They'll have, um, this was all pre-COVID. Now, now COVID things are a little bit different. Um, they'll have plant nights and painting nights and game nights, just different things to help them to, to build that sense of community um, outside of the classroom. Um, and in addition to that level of support, we also have our on-site counselor. We have our own director of career services that works just, just with DVM students and alumni. And then we have a director of personal finance. So a lot of, a lot of on-campus support for students. Um, and then the program itself is set up as three years preclinical, one year clinical. Um, we have 10 different focus areas that students can choose from. And of course, the focus area is what your clinical year is based on. You don't have to declare your focus area until the end of your second year. So that gives you two full years to really explore and determine what you want to do. Um, we were built on a dairy farm. So right out back is our farm. And then we have our Terry Center, which is our hospital. Um, all under the same roof. So it really allows students to um, determine what they want to do um, before, before going into their clinical rotations and determining what their clinical blocks are. So um, I think what we're probably best known for at this point is the problem-based learning, um, small group learning, using animal cases to learn the information. You kind of sort of act like a veterinarian from the very first day of classes. So hands-on animals for throughout the four years, but in those classes, not all of our classes are case-based, but m many are in the foundations. Really a great opportunity to learn to think through a case, but also have that experience where you're not in the lecture hall all day long, that you're moving around the college, going to gross labs, sitting in small groups, parring it out with your classmates. So in the, in the world of having lots of different learning styles, um, this really does agree with a lot of people. Um, we have a, a pretty gl uh, global presence in the world. So we have lots of opportunities if they're interested in studying, students are interested in um, doing an out of the US experience in normal world. Um, we have bar vets at two weeks bay neuter in underdeveloped nations. Um, faculty member and another partner takes students on these um, opportunities. We have a unique program called Expanding Horizons with Cornell. It's a grant funded program. Students write a grant. How much is it going to cost to get to this experience? Live there, do the experience. The caveat is you will go to an, a developing nation and work with animals hands on or in research. And um, if you put Expanding Horizons in the search bar at the vet school website, um, you'll get a map of where people have gone. And there's some really, really great experiences students have done and other students have decided they want to do or uh, students come up with their whole unique experience. Um, and research, I think a lot of students might have an interest in research. They might want to dabble in it or they might want to go all in. So we have a combined DVM PhD program, fairly competitive, but a really Great way to get both degrees within seven years with funding. And um, for those that just want to try a little research, we have some stipend based summer research programs, opportunities to get into the um, labs if you want to uh, work with a faculty member. We're the medical school on campus, our human medicine college is in Manhattan. 
So there's a fair amount of human research happening as well as um, research for animals. Um, so a great opportunity to test the waters or go all out if you want some research opportunities. And of course, then our alumni base is worldwide. So we have great opportunities and a great network of alumni to help students as they navigate, not only going through vet school externships in their summers, but also as they get jobs. I think uh, a lot of our claims to fame, well, number one, like I mentioned before, um, we're the only DVM program in Southern California and one of two in California. So we're very rare out in the West Coast. Um, so number one, just starting off there. Um, but we also are on a PBL curriculum, um, which which means that you're in, in your first two years, your lecture time is very limited. You're in groups of about seven to eight students with one faculty member. You're getting a new case every week. And within your first two years, you will be going through 64 cases on top of that, you are also starting your clinical training from year one. Um, so, well, your clinical rotations don't start until year three and year four, your clinical training also starts in year one and clinical training is surrounded um, by what we like to call a reverence for life, right? So um, no animals are harmed for the purposes of, of teaching um, and, and you're learning how to how to treat animals and, and move forward with this type of reverence for life um, using non-invasive procedures, using um, non-harmful procedures, things like that, right? It's a very big philosophy um, within Western U. And then I think the last thing that I wanna to touch on is our interprofessional education. So like I mentioned before, Western U is solely a health sciences graduate institution. So everyone on campus is gonna be a healthcare provider um, in some way, shape or form, whether it be a PA, um, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, a dentist. What we like to do is we like to bring all these students together to work together because healthcare in and of itself is a group effort. Wow, again, wonderful opportunities. I love this idea that students get put into small groups, they have their faculty member, case, 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 really learning how to become more curious and figure out what each patient needs. So we have about 10 minutes left and I'd love to hear from each representative, our favorite part, um, red flags and advice. So what are some red flags that you see either in the application or in the interview if your school has an interview? And then what advice do you have to counteract that red flag? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think one of the biggest um, red flags that we see is, um, is students don't do their research, right? So a lot of the questions in the interview or um, in a secondary application are based on the university, right? And um, one thing I always like to tell my students that, that I'm advising is if you can take an essay and just replace the name of the school and it still makes 100% 100, 100% complete sense, you left it way too general and you need to get a little bit more specific about this, uh, about this school, right? Schools want to know that you're applying with a purpose. Schools wants to know that you're applying with the intention of fulfilling your dream of becoming a, a DVM at their institution. Um, and then I think another thing that I like to see is usually comes with the with the interview, right? Um, and, and students sometimes take it, um, I see students becoming a little too formal um, coming from it, right? So the interview stage is where you kind of get to let your personality out. It's a place to tell us what your GPA, um, your vet experience hours, your animal experience hours can't tell us, right? So let your personally come, personality come out a little bit, right? Let your, make sure that you're, you're still being professional about it. And number one, if you're on campus, make sure you're professional the entire day. You don't know who's watching. You don't know who you're talking to. Um, so be respectful, always be um, and professional the entire day. So at the same time, you're interviewing us, find out about us. Are, are we the perfect fit for you? If we're not, that's perfectly fine. We're not going to be the perfect fit for everyone. So one of the biggest things that we, so we do have a GPA requirement. We have a minimum of a 3.4 for non-residents, 3.0 for residents. Um, it's on our website. 
um, and we get questions every year because that's one of the biggest things that we disqualify applicants for is not meeting the GPA requirement. And we'll get um, emails, follow-up emails once an applicant has been disqualified that says, you know, will you make an exception? Um, these are the reasons why my GPA is low. And that's fine. And we're understanding of that. But we have a GPA requirement. So the biggest thing, if you don't meet the GPA requirement, don't apply to NC State. Because ultimately, you're spending the VIMCAS application money, you're spending the supplemental application money only to get disqualified. So making sure that you are aware of the GPA requirements and then don't argue with us because that's what they want to do too. They want to argue with us about why we, why we should consider their application. So that's something that's really important. Um, as far as what makes your application stand out, we like to see well-rounded students. So most of the time students have done well academically. They'll have mostly A's and B's. You'll see a sprinkle of C's in there sometimes. But we wanna see that you've done extracurricular activities, that you were involved outside of just the classroom, that you have worked, um, that you maybe have volunteered, um, just so we can see that you can balance your education with an outside life. We don't want veterinary medicine to just be your sole focus for four years. We wanna see that you do have other outlets and other things that you're interested in and that you can do all of those things while maintaining success academically. Um, personal statement is really important. Don't just focus on what you think we want to hear, but really let your, like, like uh, was mentioned before, let your personality shine, see who you are and get a feel for who you are as a person. We don't do interviews, so we don't meet you prior to admitting you. Our, our decision is solely based on your application. So you really want to let your personality shine, who you are as a person. We want to see that. Um, we want to see that you put some thought and some effort into your, uh, your personal statement and the essays on our supplemental application and that you're not just trying to say the right things because you think that's what we want to hear. We've said quite a bit of them, but I want to add some things to it. Hopefully it's not too long. Um, for us, red flags, of course, that occur is um, the main thing, saying that you're going into veterinary medicine because you don't like people. That is a major red flag for us. It's like, don't you know that the animal is attached to a human and that human has to bring that animal in? That you cannot say that. I mean, I know that um, veterinarians, they are majority of the time are, um, what you call them, uh, introverts. Uh, so, and that's, I mean, I'm an introvert. I can be an extrovert when I want to, but majority of the time I'm an introvert. Um, but I still like people. I did not choose, you know, human medicine because I did not want to work, you know, just work with humans, just didn't want to work with all their other things that they have. I can deal with animal poop, <laughs> but I probably can't do, deal with human poop, you know, something like that. But anyway, but you can't say those things. Um, so try your best to um, make sure that you remember why you want to become a veterinarian and be able to articulate that um, like you would like. Also, another thing for us is students use the explanation statement. Um, a lot of times we understand that you can't gain the experiences in which you want. For instance, if you're interested in marine mammal science, you may not be able to find that experience. And, but throughout all your essays, you have mentioned that that's what you want to do. So we're expecting you to have that experience. If you don't, you don't have it, you need to let us know why you don't have that experience. That's very important because that raises a flag for us because we're like, hold up, you want to do that, but you haven't gained any experience in it. So anything that you say that you want to do, try your best to gain that experience. If you cannot, give an explanation to why you could not have get, get that experience and what have you done to research to learn more about that particular area. And the last thing for me is making sure that you dot every I cross every T on your application. It's many times we have a lot of grammatical area, er, uh, errors, punctuation errors, and it's very common, veterinary versus veterinarian, things like that. That is something that could be easily uh, picked up if you had someone to review your application. I always tell applicants to have someone to review for those type of areas for grammar and punctuation, but also have someone to uh, review it for content. Uh, so maybe you want to get another veterinarian that can review it for content, whereas you get your, your professional, someone that's good at spelling and grammar to look at it for that particular area. So try your best to not 
wait to the last minute to get these things done, but start it off in advance, doing those essays and different things like that so that you'll be able to have people to check over those things for you. So that is not one of the things in which can harm your application. You want to put your best foot forward and you're selling yourself in that application. You can't get to an interview if you have not sold yourself within that application. I can't imagine that the three pages of all these pictures are all applicants. So I have an, a pre-vet um, red flag and then I have an applicant red flag. So with pre-vets, I think I, I do a lot of appointments. So anyone that wants to meet with me, I'm happy to meet with you. Zoom wise is great. But I also find that students say, what should I do for my application? Should I do this this summer? And I want to make sure you know it's your life. Do what you want to do. It's really important. The application is to tell us about you and your life. So if you have an experience you want to do, do it and then tell us about it. So don't feel so wedded to the application that you don't live this well-rounded, healthy life that makes you happy. So that's my pre-vet. For those applying, we're actually a holistic admissions process. So we don't have a cutoff. We are, you know, we'll read your application. We're delighted. You might be a diamond in the rough and that some a couple of semesters tanked you and we want to see if we can bring you forward. So um, our formula is actually, we're transparent. It's on our website. 55% of our application um, is holistic. We will read your essays. We will read your letters of reference. You have to have a minimum of three letters. We will take up to six. So if you have some folks that will say really, don't get six just to get six, but get some really good letters um, that say some really great things, at least one vet and one um, faculty member. And um, they're absolutely right, write a good essay. So I do applicant round tables in the spring for those that are applying. And I have a couple of vet students with me. And we just talk about how do you write an essay? What kinds of things should you talk about? How do you write a good application? Um, but your application is you on paper and you should be so proud of all the things that you've done. Um, so it's a great chance for you to all come, you know, sort of start thinking now and keeping track of that. So when you apply and just a sort of a commercial, <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I um, designed with our IT folks at the vet school, uh, an app. It's called the Cornell Pre-Vet Tracker. It's a way to keep track of all your animal and your veterinary experiences. And I designed it based on the VimCast application. So it's free in the Apple Store and in Google Play called the Cornell Prevet Tracker, whether you apply to Cornell or not, and I hope you do. Um, but it's yours and it's based on the VimCast. So I think that'll help you. And it calculates your hours, which is really fun because anytime you can watch numbers go up, it's fun. So end of commercial and my advice. <laughs> So ultimately, I think what you're hearing from everyone is there are primary questions that people are going to ask when looking over your application. One of the early questions is, academically, can you handle vet school? Do we feel that you've given us confidence that you're going to make it through? Because no matter how great your experience is or your extracurriculars, all this stuff, if you're not going to become that veterinarian, you're going to be worse off a year into a veterinary program and academically struggling. Um, as well the school. So number one, can you do it? And then once we say yes to that, number two is should you do it? You know, do you have enough veterinary experience and exposure to have a sense of what are some of the challenges? Um, what can you expect? You don't necessarily have to know here's exactly what I want to do within the profession, but you need to have had the conversations and exposure with those that are veterinarians and those that aren't veterinarians to understand but here's why I need this credential to make that impact because you can work with animals and not be a vet and if you could be equally happy then work with animals and don't be a vet but if you get enough exposure to say this is why I need the DVM to make this kind of impact then that's what we're looking for so one of the biggest challenges or, or red flags is just overall being naive um, and I think the biggest way to help yourself in that sense is your essays, which people are talking about now. And, and again, let me provide an explanation. You're either going to have a scenario like Tufts where we do have an interview and your interviewers will have read your application, or you're going to have a scenario like NC State or Cornell where they don't interview. And so your essay should not be a reiteration of your experience page. If you put yourself in, in our, the panelist position, at that point, we know where you were, how long you were there, what your responsibilities were, because you've written them, potentially in a great app. Um, but use your essays then to say, 
And because of these experiences, here's the problem I see, here's a trend I've noticed, here's the contribution I wanna make. This was a really influential conversation for me because, going back to the um, GPA thing, so Tufts doesn't have any sort of minimum, but you know it's not fun to talk about GPA all that much because it's daunting and you know at some point there's not a ton you can do about it. Um, so our average GPA coming in is around a 3.7, you do not need to be a 3.7. And again, we don't have any cutoff, but for those of you that aren't the 3.7, what you need to do is make me feel as confident in you as I do that traditional 3.7, 3.8, 3.9. And the way you do that is trending your grades or retaking classes. Um, and it's not the same for everyone, but ultimately you need me to understand, here's what was going on then, and to now have evidence of without that going on, now, Here's why I can do well in your program. Wow, wow, wow. You guys are very lucky to hear all of this wonderful, wonderful advice. So thank you panelists so much. Go Western U. Go Pack. Go Big Red Bear. Go Bulldogs. Go Jumbos. And I'm Alex Avellino. Go Gators. And we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. This episode is a special episode to finish off season three. We've taken little excerpts from all of our episodes to provide you with a fun Pre-Vet Podcast wrap up. Enjoy. Well, I'm so glad to have three current veterinary students from the University of Florida here with me. We have a first year, a second year, and a third year. Like my friends and I joke, kind of like, once you're done with the school day, it's like, all right, now our second shift is starting. So you have your day shift and your night shift. The analogy that a lot of the professors use is that it's like you're drinking from a fire hose. The doctors really allow you to um, be the doctor and formulate plans and treatments and making decisions whether, and, and learning if those decisions are something that's you know the right one or the wrong one. I am so excited to have Dr. Jaron Jones with us today. He is our Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion as well as our Learning and Organizational Development Specialist. Diversity is not a melting pot. You usually hear that a lot where they say you know everybody gets in and makes this one like I don't even know cheese spread no it, it is more like a fruit salad every piece oh, makes something delicious yes. but each has its own flavor and nutrition that it brings to the overall experience to the palate i am so happy to have a senior student with us today miss katie cardenas she is a fourth year at ufcvm truly like i want to be known as a veterinarian that um will treat like their pets as my own. Today I have two wonderful members of the UFCVM community and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves right now. My name is Camden Rubin and I am a veterinary cardiology resident. And my name is Alex Fox Alvarez and I am a soft tissue surgeon. I did some very similar things, just trying to get as much exposure to the field as possible. But did you do as much? I sure did not. Uh, nor did I do it as diverse. I mean, he said he did some aquatic stuff, which I don't know if that's like strictly seahorses, like equine aquatic <laughs> or what. It but is. A lot of shoeing. A lot yeah, of horse shoeing. Horse, seahorse shoeing, yeah. <laughs> Today, my guest is Bryce Talsma, one of our second year students. You just form such an intimate connection with people when you have to sit down and you're not distracted by a cell phone or saying, oh, I'm busy doing this or I'm busy doing this. We had this intentional time together and we had chores together and we had small group time together and we garden together and you just you just form a really unique connection that I think is a lot harder to find today. I'm with Arizona Spencer, one of our new class of 2023 members. You do learn to really appreciate the opportunities that you are given, um, <laughs> <laughs> even if it is dancing in the blazing hot sun or in the rain. Today our guest is Dr. Crawford. She is one of our clinical professors at the UFCVM and she is a shelter medicine veterinarian as well as the director of Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program. They get so proficient in um, the high quality 
spay neuter techniques that it just takes them minutes to do each animal. Wow. We have Dr. Martha Malicote. She is one of our clinical assistant professors at UF. She is also the Veterinary Practice Management Certificate Director. If you are someone who's more introverted, you're a little bit more shy, you just need to be prepared for the fact that, hey, networking is going to be a little tough, but then I can refill my tank by spending a little time by myself after this networking opportunity is complete. Today, my guest is Dr. Larkin. She is going to help us understand the Aquatic Animal Health Certificate that we have at UF, which is part of our certificate series. Oh, yeah, it all ends up in the ocean. Right. <laughs> Whether it's big or small, um, there's a lot of issues with that because it just doesn't degrade. So picking something that, that can be sustainably used and, you know, degrade to the point where it's not harmful to the next smallest organism. And today we have Dr. Ray, who is a full professor and service chief for the Food Animal Reproduction Medicine Service. For clients, we have very few clients, but lots of animals that we work with. So the numbers of animals, uh, so we'll frequently be at a farm doing different things with different groups of animals, but we're still working with that same client. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we have a good relationship with the client, that we have regular communication with them, uh, that they feel comfortable with what we're doing, and that we feel some, some sense of comfort at going to their farm and, and working freely with the animals that they have there. With me is Ms. Caitlin Geralds, Assistant Director for Career Services at our college. There are so many cool jobs, and I think what's most exciting about my role is that I can get excited for each student that gets their dream job. And today our guest is Dr. Graham. He is the Dermatology Service Chief and Clinical Associate Professor of Dermatology at UF. So I have allergy tested literally everything from bats to giraffes. I, oh, neat. I've cleaned out the ears of everything from guinea pigs to elephants. So the diversity of what yes. you get to do, I guess it, it, I started off, I wanted to be a mixed animal practitioner in the Southeast. And I, you are. I guess I am. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. Yeah, Thank you, Alex. Of course. <laughs> hey, we have two clinical assistant professors of clinical pathology, Dr. Mary Lessinger, and Dr. Sarah Beatty. One of my favorite cells actually is the horse eosinophil. And so when I'm looking at horse blood, the eosinophils are one of the white blood cells that have very large red granules. And they you basically can see them from space. They're absolutely beautiful, beautiful cells. My favorite cell is a cell called the Mott cell. And so it's, and Dr. Beatty shaking her head to say, <laughs> yes, this is a, this is also a beautiful cell. So she agrees that second to the horse eosinophil, I think. I have Dr. Lindsay Hockman, who is a clinical lecturer of integrative medicine at the UF Small Animal Hospital. Like a pug with um, goggles on because they're yeah. getting, what's going on with the goggles? What the is that? Goggles. It's actually really cute. They're called doggles. Doggles. I guess you can't call them that if it's on a cat, but. Coggles. Um, That's the, not the same. No, it's no. not as cute. Mm -mm. And today our guest is Dr. Fox Alvarez, one of our veterinary medical oncology residents. Uh, the, the most important thing about this job is actually taking care of yourself. Only you can know yourself. And so knowing yourself and learning about yourself and what works for you in terms of what makes you feel good and what helps you relieve stress and, and all of those things is really important. And today we have Dr. Plummer, who is an associate professor of comparative ophthalmology. So I asked what comparative ophthalmology means and you said that it was all the species. All the species. Because every species has eyes. Every, most. Oh. What animals don't have eyes? Well, there are a few there are a few animals that have kind of rudimentary eyes. Can we have an example? Um, moles. Um, well, if they if their eyes were causing them pain, if they had a source of, of pain, sure. Then sure. Then I would I would be the mole doctor. <laughs> and today our guest is Dr. Alexander, who is a clinical assistant professor of zoological medicine at the University of Florida. I love what I do, and I am very grateful that I made it where I have and that I'm able to be in this wonderful field. And what I always tell students that are asking me is when they're applying for vet school is yes, it's extremely competitive, it's a long haul, it's, um, there's not a large salary when you're done. You spend five years at minimum in specialty training making an intern salary to make less than a general practitioner as a boarded veterinarian often. So you're in it because you love it. But what I always say is, if this is what you absolutely, absolutely want to do, you'll find your way. 
And today we have Dr. Gatson, who is a clinical assistant professor in anesthesia and pain management. You know, you have to be able to handle acutely stressful situations because in anesthesia, these animals are already kind of pushed to the brink of... Um, I call it just, they're just close to death, but not quite there. Today we have Dr. Stone, who's a clinical assistant professor in small animal clinical science, as well as the service chief of primary care and dentistry. Animals have the right to a non-painful, so a comfortable and functional mouth. So that they, they have the right to that. They do not have the right to a pretty mouth. Mm -hmm. So we all get braces and things like that, not often because it's that we can't function. It's because we want to look good, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I which, have braces for sure. <laughs> which is fair. Um, but dogs and cats don't actually need the teeth they have. Today my guest is Miss Brandy Phillips, the Animal Technical Rescue Branch Director for the UF Vet Emergency Treatment Service for UFCBM. It's really important to be able to stay calm under pressure. Um, remembering that somebody else's emergency is not your emergency you need to stay calm, you need to stay focused, you need to be able to know this is your job, this is what you need to do, even though it's somebody else's worst day, you're there to help. Right. Right? Yeah. So you've got to stay calm, you've got to stay level-headed, um, you've got to keep your head in the game. You have to know how to take care of yourself okay. because it's so important. And what we stress particularly in animal technical rescue, um, but it also applies to the disaster response side, human safety comes first. Mm -hmm. We all are so committed to animal welfare, and that is really a core piece of what we do, but we can't promote or support animal welfare if we aren't taking care of our people first. Right. Today I have a very special guest, Miss Lynette Chaparro, who is here to talk to us about admissions. Don't give up. Remember, if this is your dream, you just have to be a little bit patient. Um, reapply again. Sometimes taking a whole year off, it's it's a good it's a good thing. Today our guest is Miss Lana from our office. She is the financial aid coordinator for the College of Veterinary Medicine. The best way to manage your debt even after graduation or while in school is um, the first thing is when you can send voluntary payments. And today we have one of my, I can't say favorite because I'm not supposed to have favorites, but one of my favorite veterinary students. She is a second year, just finishing up her second year first semester. Uh, and her name is Lindsay. One of my role models is Buddy the Elf. And he always says, I just like smiling. Smiling's my favorite. Today we have Dr. Julie Wurz, who is a clinical assistant professor in the Small Animal Hospital. Using that communication training to gauge where my owner's at, make sure that they're hearing what I'm saying, not just listening. Oh, um, whoa. Can we need to say <laughs> that again. Say it again. So just making sure that they're that the owner's actually getting and, and hearing mm. and internalizing what I'm telling them and what I'm asking them to do yes. or telling them is going on with their animal and not just listening and glossing over because they're trying to figure out what's for dinner that night. And today my guest is Miss Amy Imler. She is a lecturer over at the Department of Animal Sciences. Um, sometimes work cannot be fun, but sometimes it's about who you work with. Mm. And so um, I encourage students to develop a really strong peer group that can support you through some hard classes. Yes. And today my guest is Dr. James Gillen. He is a <laughs> he's a graduate of the class of 2019. Yep. I I would hide it when people would come by. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want people knowing that I'm studying for the NAVLE because yeah. I didn't pass. Yeah. Get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I had to learn. I was like, what 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 is what is the benefit of them? The benefit or the what are the negatives of them knowing that I passed or didn't pass? Yeah. Uh, yeah, get over yourself and just study. Yeah. Yeah. The, you're not doing it to impress them. You're doing it for yourself. Ugh. And today our topic is on what is an offshore student? There's different ways to get a DVM degree, and one of them might be doing your degree outside of the United States and then coming to the U United States to do your clinical rotation. And today I have a student who did that at Ross University and then did their clinical year at the University of Florida. Isn't that right, Blake? That's right, Alex. It was the fastest year of my life. Huh. So I like to also say that I came in in the best and the worst of time. Danielle is a certified veterinary technician and she's the veterinary tech manager at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine's let the techs do the teching, and the doctors do the doctoring. And today my guest is Dr. Juan Samper. He is not only our Associate Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, but he is a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenologists, and he's a clinical professor 
of theriogenology. Yeah, so so a theriogenologist really, if you wanted to put it in in terms of human medicine, would be an OBGYN for females, and uh, also it would be, you know, a urologist, if you will, for for males. Three admissions committee members live at the College of Vet Med right now. So and it's yes. a great profession. I do it yeah. all over again. Yeah, yeah. we do. Without a doubt. Absolutely. Good. My guest is Dr. Cynthia Kathir, a graduate from the class of 2018. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not supposed to have favorite classes, but the class of 2018 <laughs> is definitely a favorite. I was doing surgeries. Um, I did multiple externships. And by the time I graduated, I kept track as a student. And this was something that I bragged about in my resumes. And it was a really good selling point. So you should do this as a vet student, too. Um, but I had done 662 spays and neuters. And then I had done quite a few other elective procedures like enucleations a cystotomy, several tail amputations, you know, just a variety of other soft tissue things. Today my guest is Dr. Richard Hill. He is an associate professor at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine, and he is board certified in both internal med and nutrition. And it all sort of tied in together because the g intestine is very much involved in um, transferring food yes, into the body. Yes, And nutrition also involves what happens inside the body and the metabolism of that food mm -hmm. once it gets inside the body. So they're, they're very much related. Today we have a veterinary student on board with us, first year Stephanie Duno. Hello. One thing I did for my manifestation board for vet school, um, I cut out a little like vet with a dog and I cut out the face and put mine and I had it in my room. I, and yeah. you saw it every day and it, it happens. And it happened. It yeah. happened. Today our guest has three special titles. She is a clinical assistant professor, a small animal hospital medical director, and the UFCBM neurology service chief, Dr. Sheila. La carrera justice. The dachshund usually represents over 50% of dogs in any study when you're looking at disc problems. Yes. But the other things, to, the other dogs that go into that category, frankly, anybody who has short, stumpy legs or a smushy face. And today my guest is Dr. Porter, who is a clinical assistant professor of diagnostic imaging at UF. Radiology and diagnostic imaging, it's anatomy. It's essentially anatomy in a different way. Yeah. And I loved anatomy, and I think a lot of people who are radiologists feel that way. And my guest is Dr. Stern, who is an associate professor for forensic pathology at UF College of Veterinary Medicine. I had a theory when I was looking at my patient, uh -huh. and I, I said something to law enforcement, and they were like, that's interesting. Can you tell us what your theory was? Uh, my theory was I was looking at a really big dog. Okay. And the dog had a lot of injuries to it that were supportive of this person being really close to the dog. And I said, Think about that person being bit by the dog, um, and, and the suspect was. And so that was really helpful. Yeah. Today my guest is Dr. McCarroll, who is an assistant professor of large animal surgery. So being a surgeon, you do have to be a very confident yes. person. And there's a healthy level of confidence and an unhealthy mm -hmm. level, right? So to be a surgeon, you need to be confident. As one, as one of the surgeons said to me when we were talking about this one day when we were looking at candidates, he said, you know, when you're in surgery and something goes wrong or you find something unexpected, you need to believe in that moment that you can fix it. Yikes. Today my guest is a first year veterinary student, Miss Kim McFarland. That kind of got me re-interested in uh, becoming a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I got into the military, I actively sought out um, uh, experiences with army veterinarians. The army is the only branch of the military that has veterinarians. Um, and then those veterinarians can be sent out to any other branch. So army veterinarians can be working with the Navy, with their marine mammal, um, cool. their marine mammal, uh, unit. Uh, they can be sent out to any other unit as well to, with all the, the animals that are deployed, um, or for food safety, whatever is necessary. And today my guest is Dr. Jamie Stahl, DVM, but listen up, something new and fun on the podcast. She is a registered mental health counselor. So wherever you are, just take a few moments to feel your, the weight of your body on your seat. And then taking a few moments to imagine yourself at five years old. Seeing if that he or she, that little one, has anything to offer you, anything that he or she wants to tell you. 
Today, my guest is me. I am sheltering in place at my home and I'm happy to do a special edition podcast episode all about the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and how it will affect your application to veterinary school. Today, our guest is Dr. Kyle Donnelly, staff veterinarian at Brevard Zoo. What comes to mind when I say coolest animal you've ever worked with? Penguin. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why were they the coolest? Well, they're kind of just like the holy grail of wild animals. Yeah. They're, they're so absurd on face value. <laughs> and they're also have all this mystique about them because they're the most highly trafficked animal in the world and they're you know, under heavy threat from traditional medicine uses and all kinds of illegal hunting practices so um yeah and they're just like a crazy awesome animal today's guest is dr heather walden who's an assistant professor in parasitology at the uscvm looking through feces blood urine vomitus for signs of parasitism whether it's an egg coming out of a parasite a larva um, assist or something like that. Today, I have four student guests to talk about diversity, inclusion, and leadership. The first time I ever met a Latinx veterinarian, I was in my late 20s. So I think it's so important to have that representation and to um, show the community that there's people like them um, in powers or in, in leadership positions. I also come from a working class family. Um, my parents run a small business, so a lot of times in different situations, I notice that I can recognize how financial circumstances come into play. Um, and so coming from working class and having that, um, that view um, has definitely been um, helpful, I would say. My dad and I got into a huge argument about this essay. I actually had done a lot of work um, in undergrad with our like LGBTQ club and things like that. And um, so I had some like leadership experience. I had done some diversity work. I wanted to share that in my essay, but my dad kind of being from a more old school perspective, didn't want me to share that information because he thought that it would influence my application. Be confident in who you are, realize what makes you who you are and how it makes you stronger and just an awesome person and kind of go off of that, you know, just nothing's off limits as long as you're okay with it not being off limits. Today my guest is Dr. Carl Southern. He is a resident in emergency and critical care at the University of Florida College of Vet Med. I like, I love being in the ICU, but when I'm on ER, I like to keep things moving. I don't like doing long workups and diagnostics and drawing things. I like to keep, keep the pace moving, treat yeah. what they're there for. Yes. We get them out. I'd like to welcome to our podcast, Dr. Andrea Gentry Apple, who is the coordinator for veterinary education and a clinical associate veterinarian at North Carolina A&T University. I enjoy the challenge. Um, I'm also, my head is about as hard as concrete. So being told that I can't do something tells me that I can do something. I hear, I, I hear the opposite in my head. So having the challenge of an animal that is larger than me really just, you know, challenged me to want to learn how to be able to safely manipulate these animals for their overall health and my overall well-being. Today, my guest is Dr. Kelly Harrison. She is a clinical assistant professor of shelter med and surgery, and she works in VCOP. If they haven't stepped foot in a shelter before, they don't know a lot about shelter medicine, the one thing that can kind of hit you right when you walk in the door is the sheer number of animals that are in shelters, right? So we have, as a country, significant issue with overpopulation. So there's too many animals and not enough homes. My guest is a dear friend, Morgan Papworth. This experience only happens once. Um, you know, the it, it's going to go by so fast. So building in time to really celebrate those successes and make memories. Um, school is obviously a huge component of this, but this is really the start of your career. And a career isn't just about the knowledge you have, but the people you know and the experiences you've had. So try and make the most of that time, even though this is a your time to do it. Today, our guest is Dr. Chris Aiden, who is the chair of the Department for the Small Animal Clinical Sciences at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. And he asked me what I thought about leadership training. 
And I told him my naive answer, which is that I think that some people have leadership qualities and others uh, struggle with that. And that, that I hope that I, you know, had some of those qualities and I didn't get that job. Um, and I look back at that as a really big learning experience. Today, my guest is Dr. Mike Walsh. He is a clinical associate professor of aquatic animal health at the UF Comparative Diagnostic and Population Medicine Department. So my goal after I got to SeaWorld was I'm going to save the next bunch of baby manatees. Only one baby manatee had been saved in the years before I got there. And I'm going to do the first anesthetic procedure since none had been done in 20 years. Today we have a very special student panel for you. Um, all of our students are coming from different animal backgrounds. You just have such the power to make an impact on not only animals, but people. And like, that's a big deal for me because you're inspiring people through animals while also helping animals. The specialties in small animal medicine are just getting more and more complex. We have oncology, um, we have orthopedic surgery, and more and more of these specialties are getting more advanced. So you can practice uh, really complex medicine. For Food animals, it's pretty self-explanatory. People need me to eat. Horses are great, you know, they, you can do so much with these animals and they just have the most like interesting personalities. Today's podcast is a very exciting episode. It's our first call-in show ever. And tonight my guests are the University of Florida Pre-Veterinary Medicine Club. Tonight we have 156 members listening in. We're gonna be calling out some names to get their questions answered. Today my guest is student Jeremiah Owens. He's here to talk to us about being a non-traditional student. Law enforcement and vet med, when you really boil them down to their most like simplistic things that you could boil them down to, really have to deal with normalcy. And so when we're in vet school, we're learning about the normal animal. And then we're learning about what's abnormal about that animal. And then how do we bring it back to normal? One of my jobs as a cop, when I got on the scene and something was happening, something had deviated from normal, I had to figure out what that was and bring it back to normal. Today, my guest is UFCVM alumni, Dr. Stephanie Jones, co-owner and medical director of the Animal Hospital of Fort Lauderdale and CEO and founder of Pets Help the Heart Heal. Don't sweat the small stuff. I, I feel that what I'm seeing is a, a lot of students that come out they want to take on the world and put the weight on those of the sh of the world on their shoulders and you know everyone says you just have to bite off one piece of the elephant at a time and and then at the end of the day just breathe just breathe um, because there's always tomorrow my guest is dr chelsea rivera the fort sam houston veterinary treatment facility officer in charge just take care of the people around you. Um, some of the biggest things in uh, the military is like, as as a leader, like you you should be like your top priority is taking care of the soldiers around you. Today, my guest is Dr. Monsell. She is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Florida Large Animal Clinical Sciences. And then that cow stays in a special isolated hospital environment, and she lives there. For the time that she's been treated and she lives there for a period after the treatment's finished which is called the withdrawal period for the antibiotics um, and then her milk gets tested at the end of that to make sure that there's no antibiotic residues left in her milk and if she's clear of antibiotic residues then she can go back to the main dairy hey my guest is dr liz Steele, and she's going to talk to us all about equine medicine i tell you it's definitely um like I said, a really neat tool to have in your in your tool bag. And it's becoming more popular and more demanded by clients as well, chiropractics and acupuncture. So today we have a very special pre-vet podcast episode. We have a bunch of folks from different vet schools here to talk to you about admissions. Go Rams! Go Cyclones! Go Tigers! M-I-Z! Go Badgers! War Eagle! Go Wildcats! Go Western U. Go Pack. Go Big Red Bear. Go Bulldogs. Go Jumbos. And I'm Alex Avellino. Go Gators. And we'll talk to you soon.